this nice conference. Let me first say that this video is pre-recorded because of the time zone difference between Japan and Brazil. Now, right now, my small children are asleep, not very far from me, so I don't want to make any noise and wake them up. That would cause a lot of trouble for me. That said, I'm still on the other side of the Zoom, so you can ask me questions afterwards, but I'm going to answer you very quietly. Um, so let me start with a kind of introduction. String theorists often say that string theory is miraculously free of inconsistency, and when they feel particularly arrogant, uh, we sometimes say, well, string theory is or seems to be the only consistent theory of quantum gravity. My main question today is whether we are really sure about consistency. That, for example, uh, in fourth dimensions, as you know, there is a non-trivial large gauge transformation associated to pi 4 of SU2, which happens to be Z2. So if you have this discrete gauge transformation, and that produces a phase which is minus 1 to the power n. So the theory is inconsistent if the number is odd. Let us now ask the following question. Is Witten's SU2 anomaly absent in 4D heterotic compactifications? Well, somewhat surprisingly, this rather fundamental question is still open in 2021. I learned this question uh, from my colleagues in IPMU during the tea time slightly before the pandemic. Uh, they st studied this question assuming that there are four dimensional n equals two supersymmetry. And they showed that the anomaly vanishes in many cases, but they didn't find a universal proof either. So the analysis was presented in a paper here, Enoki Sato Watari, uh, from May last year. Um, today, I'm not going to discuss this Witten's anomaly due to technical reasons. Instead, I'm going to discuss a related but slightly different global anomaly, which is a Z24 global anomaly in 2D heterotic compactifications. And the aim of this talk is to show that it vanishes. Um, for this purpose, I'm going to use the mathematical theory of topological modular forms and the associated segal stoltz teichner conjecture. So let me start. Let's first remind ourselves the perturbative heterotic strings construction. So let's consider heterotic compactification to space-time dimensions d. The world seat theory of the string is for the uncompactified space-time. They are fermionic partners. Together, they contribute d to left-moving central charge and three-halves d to the right-moving central charge. Therefore, in order to balance, you need to have an internal CFT, uh, which has CL equal to 2D and given by 15 minus uh, 3 halves D. Typical case. The internal CFT should have the well known. value of CL being 60 and CR needs to vanish. As you know, there are only two possible choices. Uh, one is SO32, current perturbative anomaly miraculously cancels, as was first shown by Green and Schwartz, 1984. It then follows that the perturbative anomaly automatically for arbitrary smooth geometric compactifications just because it vanishes in 10 dimensions. But the good thing about heterotic string is that you can use a genuine CFT, which might not come from any geometry uh, as a internal CFT, as long as it has the correct central charge. 
matter whether the internal CFD classical or not. So that was done by Lair here, Nielsen, Skelekens, and Warner in 88. So the question of the vanishing of the perturbative anomaly is settled. What about the global anomalies? Well, in 10D, E8 times E8 superstring, well, it was shown to vanish in Witten's paper in 1986. This implies again that the global anomaly automatically vanishes in all smooth geometric compactifications of E8 times E8 heterotic strings. But again, there can be non-geometric compactifications where the internal CFT does not come from classical geometry. So, let me talk about the particular two-dimensional anomaly I'm going to discuss. It's a bit complicated, confusing, because the world sheet is 2D and the resulting super, sorry, space-time are 24 kind of 12. And we need to count how many massless fermions there are. For this purpose, well, you need to open the textbook on perturbative string theory, and you find the following. Mass from R sector vacuum states of the internal CFT, and then the space-time chirality is basically given by the right-moving fermion number of the internal CFT. Therefore, uh, basically, the elliptic genus of the internal CFT encodes the net chiral number of fermions. So it gives the fermion anomaly. So let's say the elliptic genus of the internal CFT is given by this expression. So elliptic genus is the trace over the R sector Hilbert space with an insertion of minus one to the right moving fermion number. So this projects out the right moving modes to its uh, zero energy states. And you have a contribution on supersymmetric. Because the left moving central charge is 24, uh, this series from the term of the order Q inverse, so let's say it's given by A Q inverse plus B plus dot dot dot. Then uh, the standard technique shows that the leading coefficient A is the net of two-dimensional space-time gravity, you know, and B is the net chiral number of the space-time uh, spin one-half fermion. Therefore, the total fermion anomaly polynomial can be easily contribution from a gravitino or contribution from a fermion is known, and it's given by this, minus 24A plus B times P1 over 48, where P1 is the pond checking class, which is basically trace R squared. So a gravitino contributes a 24th sorry, 24 times that of a fermion. That's not the only contribution to the anomaly. You need to think about the B field one point function too. So string one loop perturbation theory automatically generates the B field part one point function of this form. And the coefficient n can be found by uh, string perturbation theory, which boils down to the uh, integral over the fundamental region of the SL2Z of the elliptic genus of the internal CFT, and it results in basically minus A plus B over 24, as was found in 95, 96. The reason why this e coupling to B produces the anomaly is that the gauge invariant field strength of B, which is H, is not just DB, but has a contribution coming from the transam stem of the gravitational connection, spin connection. Therefore, integral of B has the same anomalous variation as would come from uh, the anomaly polynomial P1 over 2. Summarizing, let's say that elliptic genus of the internal CFT is AQ inverse plus B plus dot dot dot. Then, this controls both the fermion anomaly and the B-field one-point coupling. So the fermion anomaly is minus 24A plus B times minus P1 over 48, while the B-field coupling is this, uh, minus A plus B of over 24 and the integral of B. As I said, 
are identical of B has the same anomalous variation as P1 over 2. Okay, so you can see that, that these two contributions nicely cancel out and the perturbative anomaly vanishes. This is that green Schwarz is not an integer because the integral of a B transforms non trivially under the large gauge transformation of B. So this part can shift by 1. So if B over 24 is not an integer, uh, this coupling can produce a non trivial phase, which is a 24th roots of unity. So when B is not divisible by 24, uh, this particular system can have a Z24 valued global anomaly. So that's the global anomaly. The central question is now formulated as follows. So let's take an n equals 0, 0,1 two-dimensional SCFT with CL and CR given by 2112. So that's the uh, right structure for 2D theory to be used as an internal CFT for heterotic compactification down to 2D. Let's say its elliptic genus is given by AQ inverse plus B plus dot dot dot. The main question is whether the coefficient B, constant term B, is always divisible by 24. So this is not a string theory or quantum gravity, gravity question anymore. It's just a 2D CFT question and it's uh, quite a peculiar one. I've never thought about the divisibility of the constant part of the genus before I thought about this question. And I don't know how to approach this question in the standard way. One thing you can do is to go over the list of known examples and if you go over uh, various papers in the past, you can find many examples. But can we show this in general? Let's first use the theory of modular forms. So uh, let's discuss the elliptic genus again. So given a theory T, its elliptic genus is the Hilbert space, sorry, torus over the Hilbert space in the R sector with the minus one to the right moving fermion number. And uh, you count the number of states in the left moving non supersymmetric side. So that's the partition function of the theory on T2 with the periodic spin structure, which makes it almost modular invariant, but up to subtle phases given by 24th roots of unity, which comes from the world sheet gravitational anomaly, which is given by the difference between CR and CL. So that makes the analysis a bit complicated. So it helps us to cancel this anomaly by adding new left moving fermions where new is given by uh, twice CR minus CL so that the combined system doesn't have any global anomaly, sorry, gravitational world sheet anomaly. What we have is then this combination. So you have the original elliptic genus and you multiply that by a fermionic contribution which is given by the new power uh, of the data hint eta. We now have the following transformation law for this combined object. So if you perform SL2Z transformation, uh, you get this prefactor. This makes this combination phi w into a modular form of weight nu over 2. Mathematicians call phi w the written genus of this theory. So let's come back to the, our original question of heterotic compactifications to 2D. In this case, uh, nu is given by minus 24, which means that we need to consider eta to the power minus 24 times the elliptic genus, which has this form. Combined, this is the modular form of weight minus 12 with integer coefficients, because they count the number of states, and it can have poles of order at most two. So this part, eta to minus 24, can have uh, pole of order 1 
and you also have Q inverse. So using the standard elementary theory of modular forms, you find the following. Uh, phi w, in our case, needs to be an integral linear combination of two possibilities. One is uh, e4 to the cube divided by delta squared, where e4 is the delta to the power 24. So that's the first possibility. And the second possibility is just in the inverse of delta. So the, the theory of modular forms allow us to determine the entire elliptic genus in terms of A and B. So th that's a progress, but it doesn't tell whether B is divisible by 24. For that purpose, you need to use a more sophisticated theory, that's the theory of topological modular forms. So what is this? Well, the ring of topological modular forms uh, generalizes and refines the ring of ordinary modular forms. So it was mathematically constructed by Hopkins and collaborators around 2000 using an amalgam of algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. And this topological modular forms is useful for us thanks to the segal stoltz teichner conjecture, which says the following. So TMF nu is an abelian group constructed by mathematician, but that seems to be conjecturally equal to the following. So you consider the space of two-dimensional n equals 0, 1 supersymmetric theories with a specified amount of nu, which is the difference between the left-moving and right-moving central charge, and you, you classify them according to uh, continuous deformations, like relevant, relevant marginal deformations, or RG flows, or adding some uh, SUSY breaking sector. In particular, if we are given a n equals 0, 1 SCFT t in two dimensions with a specified nu, uh, that should determine a class t in this Abelian group TMF nu. So why is this conjecture plausible? Well, mathematicians, uh, when constructed, uh, when they constructed TMF, uh, constructed also a map phi w, which is a map from TMF nu to the set of modular forms of weight nu over two with integer coefficients on poles, which for us should correspond to sending a theory, two-dimensional theory t, to its written genus, which is an elliptic genus multiplied by delta kin eta. Mathematicians also know how to describe uh, sigma models in terms of TMF class. So given a new dimensional manifold together with uh, B field satisfying certain conditions, uh, we should be able to describe two-dimensional sigma model with M as the target space together with the B field. And that should determine some uh, 0, 0,1 SCFT in 2D. So in view of the conjecture, it should determine a class in TMF nu, and let's denote that as sigma mu and b. Mathematicians uh, also showed that when they combined th these two constructions of getting a TMF class and then mapping to the modular form, and then they get some uh, modular forms, but that turns out to be equal to uh, what we expect as a physicist. So in that case, uh, sigma model, uh, we know the sigma model, so we can compute the elliptic genus of that sigma model, and we can multiply that with the theta kin theta, and that agrees with what mathematicians constructed. So uh, that gives a partial uh, justification for this conjecture. The good thing about mathematicians' work is that they determined the image of this map phi w completely. So for example, uh, delta, which was a uh, modular discriminant to some power k, uh, is in the image of phi w if and only if the coefficient d is a multiple of 24 over gcd 24 comma k. So that's a weird statement. And let's use that. So our question was the following. We take 2D n equals 0, 1 SCFD with the central charge uh, 24, 12. 
and let's say its elliptic genus is a q inverse plus b plus da da da. The question was whether the constant time b was divisible by 24. Please recall that otherwise heterotic compactifications to 2D can have a Z24 global anomaly. We already argued, just by using the ordinary theory of modular forms, that the weekend genus of the theory is a linear combination of either this one or the other one. But the added information we now have is that assuming the conjecture and the mathematical result, uh, the image of phi w contains only a d delta k where d is a multiple of 24 over gcd 24 comma k. In our case, k is minus 1, right? So 24 divided by gcd 24 comma 1 minus 1 is 24. This means that the coefficient minus 744 times 8 plus b should also be divisible by 24, meaning that b itself is divisible by 24. That's what you want to show. Done. Great. But you would ask me, Yuji, you started your talk by talking about uh, Witten's SU2 anomaly. What happened to that? Well, more generally, the question of global anomaly of heterotic compactifications down to di d dimensions with gauge symmetry g can be translated to the study of a certain TMF group. So that's a question in algebraic topology. That is a very difficult group to compute. And I asked a number of friends of mine who are mathematicians, but nobody computed it for me. But one mathematician told me the following. Well, there's a way to show that the global anomaly vanishes uh, without doing any case-by-case -case analysis. The important point is to consider all cases at once and use the structural result of TMF. So that's a work in progress with Yamashita, a um, brilliant younger mathematician in Kyoto, and I hope to report it in a preprint soon. Let me finish with some comments. Clearly, we are not really done, right? We simply transferred uh, the question of the global anomalies of hedge strings to the validity of the segal stoltz teichner conjecture, right? So it's important, I think, to test the conjecture in our own way. Well, there are a couple of works doing exactly that, like this. And let me just add one implication of the conjecture so that you can think about it. So as I said, uh, the image of this map, phi w, has been mathematically determined. And in particular, uh, delta to power the power k is in the image of phi w only if, if and only if d is a multiple of 24 over gcd 24 comma k. So what does it mean? Well, it means many things. But one consequence in our language is as follows. Uh, so. If the elliptic genus of two-dimensional 0, 1 theory is simply 1, then the difference of the central charge, Cl minus Cr, is divisible by 288. Conversely, there should be a two-dimensional 0, 1 theory whose elliptic genus is just 1 without any dependence on Q, and Cl minus Cr is plus minus 288. So that particular theory will be uh, quite a marvelous one. But as far as I know, nobody has constructed it. OK, let me summarize. Today, I considered global anomalies in heteroistic string theories. Uh, such questions can be answered using the mathematical theory of TMF, using the seagull stoltz teichner conjecture, saying that TMF nu describes the classification result of n equals 0, 1 supersymmetric theory with specified difference of the left moving and right moving central charge up to continuous deformation. And this conjecture not only tells us about heterotic anomalies, but also uh, many unexplored properties of two dimensional theories, which I think are worth pursuing. And I just want to say that the list of HEPTH papers on TMF is not very long. The exhaustive list is really this. So there are less than 10 papers. It's a young field and I would welcome any newcomers to the field.
Okay. Okay, let's let's thank uh, Yuji for uh, a wonderful talk. I think we managed the weather, <laughs> the technological <laughs> difficulties successfully with the helps of the community, which is the Yeah, I'm sorry about All right, low see. video quality. I, I think in the end it was manageable. Um, okay. Let's see, uh, questions. I see uh, Jeff Harvey has a question. Hi, Yuji. Hi. Uh, thanks, thanks for the nice talk. Um, there's recently, well, fairly recently, been a proof of Shellican's conjecture uh, regarding 71 holomorphic C equals 24 uh, VOAs or conformal field theories. And right. um, these have gauge groups uh, with various levels. And each one of them gives rise to a compactification of the heterotic string down to two dimensions. So is there some um, either either check of, of TMF computations for these theories, um, or do they do these examples inform some computations uh, related to anomalies in TMF? Uh, thank you for your question. I, I haven't looked into the case with uh, symmetries, but at, at least you can use them for the compactification without thinking about gauge symmetries, right? Still, uh, this needs to be compatible with the thing I talked about being that the constant term of the elliptic genus is divisible by 24, right? And you can go right. over the list of Skellican's 71 choices, and indeed they are all divisible by 24. So that's one consistency check between TMF predictions and the uh, list of by Skellican's. Thank you. I, I thought you also had some condition no on gauge groups. Ah, yes, um, but uh, the problem is that the uh, TMF group controlled in the case with gauge group is, uh, well, at least mathematically well-defined, but it's very difficult to compute algebraic topologically. So if you tell, if you uh, give me a very good mathematician who can do this computation for me, then <laughs> you can try to match what Skelkens tells us uh, against Skelkens against TMF prediction, but uh, yeah, that's the main problem I'm having. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, next is uh, Greg Moore. Greg, go ahead. Yeah, my question is actually pretty closely related to Jeff's. Um, so is it is it legal to take a purely holomorphic conformal field theory so that the uh, right moving n equals one is the trivial theory because then you could just take the 12th tensor power of the leech labs. You, you, you can use that. You yes. your, your theory with uh, 288. Oh, um, so, so for the positive one, it's, yeah, I, I should have, I, I think I said something slightly wrong. Um, uh, plus 288 is okay. Um, so th that's exactly what you described. But the problem is to describe the theory with uh, CL minus CR being minus 288. That cannot be made with ah. construction. <laughs> okay, the, the construction. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's that's more challenging. Yeah, 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 yeah. I should have written only one particular uh, sign. I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, I think Komrin Vafa has a comment. Komrin? Yes, very nice talk, Yuji. Actually, it's Thank a you. minor. I think you meant a perturbative heterodicy in compactification because if you allow for five brains, you oh, can yeah, get indeed. one, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, just want to make sure. Maybe you made that comment. Maybe I missed it. But at any rate, that's the that's yeah, just. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Indeed, it will be very interesting to study uh, non-perturbative heterodic strings where the internal CFT is non-geometric. Yeah, that's not explored very much. So that's I think a new core. But non-geometric, you mean even just five brains? Five brains. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Mean? Yeah, that's yeah. Geometric plus for five brain is already right. out of my consideration. Exactly. But, uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Nice stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one more minute. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, Daniel Harlow has a question in the chat. Uh, no, but you, I think IES has a comment. So I, I, yeah, why don't you call on them? Because Sure, okay. okay, let's go with IES. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a very general naive question. When you okay. quantify to two dimensions, you have to integrate over the moduli. So That's my right. question is, in, has, goes in two directions. One, can there be new anomalies associated with this integral that are not present otherwise? And second, is there a way of canceling other anomalies by doing this integral? 
There's another contribution from that that would cancel. I have no, no reason to suspect that the answer is yes. I'm just raising this as a question. Uh, that, that's uh, indeed an important issue. Um, I, I'm not addressing the proper uh, path integral over the moduli of the two-dimensional CFD in, in my analysis. So um, yeah, that, that part can uh, give rise to additional anomalies, which I didn't uh, discuss. So that's my honest uh, comment. Yeah, I don't know how to- and Can uh, they cancel any of the anomalies that exist for fixed value or- I, 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 don't th I, I don't think so. You need to first cancel the anomaly at the fixed value, and then you need to think about the integration over the moduli, yeah. But then eventually that will necessarily hit strongly coupled a singularity at the moduli space of CFT to the CFT. So that will be a very complicated analysis. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Question. Okay, I think uh, there's some discussion in the chat, which maybe we should uh, continue on yeah. Slack. It's probably a better okay. format. Right. All right, let's all thank Yuji again for a wonderful talk and for joining us. And uh, hopefully we did not wake up his children. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And so I'm sorry about the video problem. Thank you very much. It was all right. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, the next is uh, uh, I'm handing over the chairmanship to uh, uh, let's see who is the next. Ana Maria. Okay, Ana Maria very good. The next all right. Thank you, Mia. And hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so um, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, welcome uh, to this. Yeah, Nathan, you wanted to say something? No. Okay, oh, yeah. so I was saying, yeah, then um, welcome to this session on four generations of women in string theory. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the discussion leaders namely uh, Chiara Napi, Silvia Penati, Miranda Cheng, and Shruti uh, Paranjape. Uh, Chiara, um, Silvia, Miranda, and Shruti, they got attached uh, to strings at different times, as you uh, can see here. They will be uh, sharing with us their experiences and their thoughts about working in these fields and in science in general. After the presentation, we will open the discussion to, to the audience and everybody is most encouraged to, to ask questions or to point out uh, remarks, comments, etc. Um, so the first speaker today is uh, Chiara Napi, a uh, emerita professor at Princeton University. So Chiara, you now take it. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. So um, I got my PhD in physics at University of Naples in 1976. At the time, um, my uh, the the was not called PhD, it was called uh, uh, Diploma della Scuola di Perfezionamento, but it's the same, it was the same as the current PhD. Um, on the timeline showed by Anna Maria, you can see me in between uh, the uh, Veneziano model and anomaly cancellation. In fact, I could have uh, certainly uh, studied the strings when I was at University of Naples, because some of my senior professors, junior professors, senior colleagues, were uh, working with Paolo Di Vecchia and Gabriele Veneziano. However, I did not study strings. I was very interested in mathematical physics at the time. And this is why I ended at Harvard uh, in 1976 on a, a postdoc with the professor Arthur Jaffe, who was a mathematical, who is a mathematical physicist at Harvard. Um, one of the things that surprised me when I was there 
was that I was one of three women in the uh, postdoc in the theory group at Harvard. Only uh, three, uh, two other uh, people, girls were there, and one of them from, was from Europe as well. So I, um, uh, uh, the, and then you looked around, there was no woman in the faculty. Ellen Quinn had already left to Stanford. And there was no, um, uh, very few women in the graduate program. In fact, I don't remember any. And very few women in the undergraduate physics classes for physics majors. That really surprised me because I was coming from Naples and there was a sizable number of women in my undergraduate program in physics. Um, many of these women wanted to become school teachers uh, and teach physics in college, in um, physics in the high school, because that was where the jobs were in, the, in math and, and physics and science in general. And so they were pursuing an undergraduate degree in physics to eventually move into teaching. And indeed, many of them did, but some of us did particularly well, liked the subject and got a fellowship to study, to remain in the program at the graduate level. So I found, I was wondering why there are no women in the undergraduate classes in physics. And the reason turned out to be quite stunning to me women didn't take physics in high school. Of course, if you women don't take physics in high school, you don't find them in, the phys in, uh, in college uh, physics classes. You don't find them as postdocs as, uh, and uh, in, they cannot pursue a physics career. And uh, so the question became for me, why, was not, why were not in taking physics in graduate school? And the answer was right peculiar in the sense it was because it was related to the peculiarity of the high school, the grade school American educations, uh, education. The, in grade school, I mean, the, the way the schools are organized in the, uh, in the US is kind of different from the way they are organized everywhere else in the world, certainly in Europe. Uh, I agree to school is a national enterprise, or a lot, but in the United States, it's a, not even a state enterprise, it's a, a, um, a local, local enterprise, it's run by the municipality. And this is related to the way the, 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 the settlers settled in the American territories starting uh, their own schools and financing them with the, uh, property taxes or local taxes. So every school had its own curriculum and one school, high school only, where all the students of all interests should, should, should attend and no other person from a nearby town. So the school should accommodate everyone was, uh, uh, and in order to do so, it was very flexible in its standard. So you could get out of high school without taking physics, uh, a very little math for that. So, and moreover, in order to offer these courses, the school adopted what is called the layer cake approach. So one year you study biology, one year you study chemistry, one year you study physics, and all the physics curriculum was concentrated in one year. Therefore, the course tended to be challenging and demanding and very, um, you know, the combination of the physics courses being both optional and demanding was the, the perfect formula to create a very leak system, which was particularly detrimental to all the group at risks and not only the women who, traditionally did not uh, were not used to taking physics classes and didn't like to be identified with nerds but uh, also to minorities and socioeconomically disadvantaged the children students because uh, if the class are demanding you need tutoring you need the support and there was none of them so this was a very leaky uh, the first bottleneck in the pipeline to physics and uh, a very leaky one at that. The role of the educational system, I discussed in my experience, I, made a, I compared with Italy 
And uh, as I said, the situation in Italy was very different. We all studied math and science every year in a gradual and systematic manner, including physics. For instance, I come from a Liceo Classico. I studied humanities. I studied Greek and Latin in high school. Nonetheless, every year I had physics. So when I decided to uh, complete my, uh, to, to, to enroll in physics, I had absolutely no problem whatsoever. Uh, and this is, and there's also another issue which is important um, to understand why there is such a bottleneck in the in the physics pipeline in the United States. The the what is, uh, we in Italy, as I said, if you want to become a high school teacher, you have to study physics in college together with all the physics majors. Major uh, in the U.S., you don't need to do that. You can go to a school of education where you study a lot of a lot about how to teach and very little about what to teach. And therefore, not only this is bad because the teachers don't come out as prepared as they should or as inspirational as they should be, and this is con consequences in high school teaching, but also they um, you lose a an entryway to the pipeline into physics for women and minorities. Um, so you can see at the international level, that the country that do better with women in physics are the country where there is a very rigorous systematic uh, curriculum in physics in high school. And I know that, for instance, when I was uh, uh, in Princeton as a professor and as a, a department representative, we had very few American uh, girls in our physics courses uh, and in our, as physics majors, while instead many of our girls came from um, uh, Eastern Europe or China, even at the, the undergraduate level. Uh, and uh, in, for graduate school, most of our women came from, um, from uh, uh, China, for instance. Um, so there, was, there were, in fact, at the time, 60% of the people, men and women, who tried to major in physics would drop out after and during the first year because of the difficulty of taking physics course in college when they had not received a good education in physics and math at the in a high school. Um, there are two um, there are two graphs I would like to show which have been recently published by the American Institute of Physics. You can see this graph here is all the people who have graduated in physics, uh, a PhD in physics in this case, um, since the 1900, but anyway, not many there. But you will see a peak here in the 1970, which corresponds to the uh, space race. This comes 10 years after the Sputnik, so the American students were very interested in competing with Russia and they went into physics. And then it has gone up. But the interesting point I want to make is that uh, if you see the, the orange curve, that is the curve of the US citizens. And the others are not US citizen. And basically, at this, there is, there is there the same number of American citizens and US citizens uh, uh, among the PhDs in physics in general. And let's look at the girls too in the next. Well, here are the women. And you will see that uh, they've reached the plateau since 2008. The number of women in physics has reached the plateau since uh, 2008. Not clear why, but anyway, it's reached 20, 19, 20%, and that is it. And the thing, the thing which is very important to point out here is that more than half here for the women, more than half of the women uh, to getting a PhD in physics in the US are from abroad. They are not US citizens. So that is the discussion of the first bottleneck along the physics pipeline. And that takes us directly to the second bottleneck. So this one, finally you have gotten your PhD. Well, now the problems really start. And the reason is uh, this is a critical time for everybody, men, women, because this is when you have to start 
as a, an independent researcher, you have to, um, to uh, get into the system, you go from one postdoc to another, you hope to get a, 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 um, a faculty position. Uh, there are a lot of difficulties, you have two body problems most of the time. So there are problems for everybody, it's a critical time. But there is, it's really unfortunate though, that the most challenging years in the physics career, the years when you are trying to be productive and establish yourself in the field, are also the years when the biological, biological clock starts clicking for women and you, start, and you need to start a family. In the US, the support for women in academics during this important year was totally missing in the 1980s, much more so than in Europe. For instance, I received only six weeks of sick leave when I had my children's sick leave, two before, four after, no other benefits. There was only one uh, daycare in Princeton, you now, university, new organization for women, and the children needed to be three years old to get there if they were lucky to end, to get in. Things have improved a lot, I must say, at least in Princeton. Many more daycares now, and young faculty members receive pay temporary leave for, from three weeks to six uh, before, to six, 10 weeks after. One semester relief from teaching duties, one year automatic extension of the tenure clock, up to one year of unpaid parental leave. Now I must say, I don't know how this uh, works in other university, I'm just talking about Princeton. And uh, this, uh, this, are, this is excellent because uh, you have to know that in the US, uh, the US are still very much behind on this issue. Paid medical and family, family leave does not come with all jobs in the US. And finally, we get to the third bottleneck, so to the net third bottleneck effect. What about success recognition? I am still under shock, I must say, from when uh, in 1980s there was there were all these uh, papers, all this uh, uh, interest, the interest of women in science, and the big question was, uh, okay, but can women be geniuses? Okay, I said, well, let's first get the women into the into the profession, then we will have geniuses too. Things have not actually gone as smoothly as I expected. For instance, in 2000, in the year 2000, the main university in the US from Caltech to MIT, Harvard, published a report, a report detailing how institutional barriers have prevented the women scientists and engineers from having a level playing field in the profession. I want to leave some of this issue the, 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 to my younger colleagues who have much more to say on this. In the meantime, though, before ending, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the organizer of this conference, not only for the amazing organization and very interesting format, which is particularly conducive to interaction and scientific exchange, exchange but also for the attention they paid to inclusiveness and participation of all the components of the string community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chiara, and now it's your turn, Silvia. Yes, thank Silvia you very much. From, uh, yeah. Universidad de Milano. Do you hear me? Ana Maria, yes, do you hear yes, me? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I, uh, um, but in my five, six minutes, I will focus primarily on the experience of women of my generation on what it means uh, being a woman uh, doing research in theoretical physics, uh, since this is a field where the percentage of women is extremely low. If you take into account, for instance, the distribution of women in Europe in, in the three theory community, uh, women with a permanent position in Europe uh, count less than 10%. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to tell you today is primarily based on many discussions and conversations uh, uh, that I have had with um, women colleagues and not only women, also men colleagues of our community and especially on various activities that we have organized in the last 10 years uh, regarding uh, gender gap and gender issue in our, uh, in our field. 
Okay, so uh, first of all, talking about generations, uh, I think that uh, my generation is really the one which experienced the progressive awareness of women and eventually of the whole community that there was something wrong going on given the small percentage of women, uh, women scientists uh, all over the world, uh, not only in Europe, I would say. And in fact, uh, along our career, we moved actually from uh, the early stage of our career, so we are back uh, to early 90s, when nobody was talking about uh, the gender problem, the gender gap in science, and nobody had even realized that there was a problem about the gender imbalance, in particular in our community. And, uh, you know, it was quite a taboo talking about these kind of things so when uh, I was very, very young and I just realized that going to the conferences, we were just, you know, five, six, at most 10 uh, women out of uh, 100 people. Uh, I was wondering why what's going on. People was telling me, look, uh, shut up, uh, don't ask these kind of questions. Just work hard and go straight and go on and you will succeed. Forget about these kind of questions. Okay, so we move basically from those times to the present time where instead, finally, we have plenty of data and, uh, and statistics, uh, which indeed, uh, prove that uh, there, there also has always been uh, a gender, a big gender gap, and the situation, unfortunately, has not improved along the years. In fact, if you just uh, Google uh, uh, women in science or the gender issue in science, next slide, please, Anna Maria. Thanks. You will be flooded by all these kind of, uh, of plots. This is a typical CISO uh, uh, plot when uh, uh, that that you get. Uh, is, we have such a plot for every single country in the world. I just took two of them as an example. Uh, this is what you get when you compare the percentage of women to the percentage of men at different stages of their careers, uh, starting from very early stage, which means a bachelor and master, up to PhD, postdoc, tenure, uh, professorship and full professorship. And you see, unfortunately, that uh, even if we start with uh, a percentage which may be comparable between uh, uh, men and women, of course, uh, the gap becomes uh, uh, more and more severe as long as we go up uh, in, the, in, the, in the career. And in particular, when we are at the very top level of the career, the gap is extremely uh, severe, okay? This kind of data can be also rephrased in a different kind of picture, which is the famous leaky pipeline. If you just count, these are UK uh, data, if you just count the percentage of women at different stages in their career, you see that every, every time there is a step forward, there is a drop off in the percentage of women. And the, the percentage of women in the top level, uh, which means being a member of the National Academy of Sciences is basically close to zero. Okay, so, uh, the fact that there are very few women can be also just experience. You can see yourself looking around, as I said, for instance, in, uh, if you attend, are attending a conference and you count how many women uh, there are in the audience. Uh, next slide, please. You will find such a situation. This is a sort of a self-explanatory uh, picture that I want to leave there. You can simply count how many women there were in 1911, how many women there were in 2011 at SOLV conferences editions. And okay, so uh, that is of course a problem. This is an objective problem. So we start wondering why, why there is such a problem in our community in particular, and what we could do in order to redress uh, uh, the situation. And of course, right now we have to many years of you know, discussions. We also got some important input from our colleagues in social science. Now we know that of course, there are infinitely many reasons why this happens. And now we understand these reasons quite well. And among the many, 
uh, today I have selected a few of them that I think uh, I consider quite crucial uh, to explain kind of uh, plots and kind of pictures I have just shown you. And what I uh, would like to mention are these uh, three wallets, three, three reasons. The first one has to do with unconscious bias. I think this is one of the main reasons why. Of course, everybody, men and women, uh, suffer from unconscious bias in the sense we are all affected by biases when we judge people, okay, because this bias comes from uh, negative stereotypes uh, or social typical social stereotypes that we grow with, okay. Uh, but bias, of course, uh, may affect the way we perceive a person. And of course, we, it may play a role when we have to judge this person. In particular, this problem of conscious bias, hopefully unconscious, sometimes it is also conscious, in particular comes out you know, in uh, selection committees, uh, these kind of things. Okay, and of course, uh, this uh, uh, bias acts uh, not only against women, more generally, it acts against uh, all the minorities. And in fact, uh, this is not just a gender bias, it's not just a binary gender bias. It may be a more general gender bias, it may be a, a race and ethnicity bias, a religion bias, an economical bias, even a scientific bias, because we know that sometimes we have some bias against particular uh, research topics. Okay, and this is for sure something which uh, uh, has to be, you know, uh, considered seriously. Uh, the second bullet is uh, concerns the fact that uh, women um, sometimes it may happen that they suffer, or very often they suffer from lack of support at the early stage of their career. And along the, their career, they also uh, suffer by, from lack of right recognition of their competence, of their work, of their papers, of their results, of their scientific results. And uh, on top of everything, you can imagine that uh, working in a community where we are less than 10% and working uh, typically in uh, scientific groups uh, where we are the only woman, this is a typical situation, uh, sometimes uh, leads us to feel a uh, sort of sense of isolation or feeling of not belonging. And sometimes uh, this kind of feelings uh, may work once more against women because women risk to get discouraged and finally uh, it may happen that they quit. Okay, so if you think for a moment, you will see that uh, uh, these three bullets that I would like to discuss with you later, uh, certainly help in explaining why we have this such a leaky pipeline, why we have the famous glass ceiling that also Chiara mentioned. Uh, we know, uh, we can explain why uh, there is a, such a low percentage of women uh, uh, at conferences or invited as invited speakers. Uh, we know that this might be the reason why a low percentage of women in Europe, for instance, uh, can uh, be can have access to very rich, very prestigious grants, and so on and so forth. So, um, okay, so I can conclude asking what can we do? Uh, even if I pointed out only uh, negative the points in five minutes, I'm quite optimistic because based on my own experience, I know that we can do a lot. We have already done a lot and I'm pretty sure that uh, I can tell you later what we have done so far. And I'm pretty sure that as long as the community keeps being very uh, supporting and uh, keeps being aware of the fact that there is such a problem, uh, the situation can be uh, redressed in, in the future. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And let me thank the organizers for this interesting opportunity uh, to discuss about women uh, in string theory. Thanks. Thank you, Silvia.
So the next speaker is Miranda Cheng from University of Amsterdam and Academia Sinica Taiwan. So please, Miranda. Uh, yeah. So um, first, I would also like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for the amazing work organizing such an interesting uh, conference and for the invitation um, that uh, for me to uh, speak here, discuss here. Okay, so uh, Ana Maria, can I see the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so in the five minutes that's allocated to me, so in order to fulfill my assignment to represent uh, uh, um, string theorists of my own gender in my generation, I will focus on the section of the leaky pipeline ranging from grad school till the early stage of faculty jobs. And the, my comments will be based on the conversations I've had, had with uh, various uh, female colleagues and students uh, in preparation for this discussion session. So the first point I would like to raise is that we need a culture shift. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we need to create a safe and inclusive inclusive and welcoming work, working environment, not just for uh, the minorities along the male female line, but in fact, for all minorities, I believe. And uh, as Sylvia said, we need to keep uh, curbing consciously our unconscious uh, bias when we're evaluating the work and achievements of our peers. And uh, well, honestly, I do not think we have such uh, a safe environment right now. Um, in fact, it, it is rather saddening and sometimes infuriating when I'm talking, when I was talking to various colleagues that almost every single female colleague that I have talked to uh, has had a bad experience in our field, uh, which uh, range, uh, range from just hurtful, bad, inappropriate jokes to harassment, in including sexual harassment. And uh, that's no good. That's uh, something that uh, we've got to change. And the second issue that has been raised a lot in the discussion is the issue surrounding work-life balance. Well, that is an issue that affects most of uh, many of us, men and women alike. But statistically speaking, uh, it seems that academic careers of women suffer disproportionately bad from these issues. For instance, a lack of support or insufficient support on childcare or uh, issues such as partner hiring has also been raised a lot in the conversations I have. And just the third point I would like to raise, which I think is an urgent point, is that there's evidence that the female academics are hurt disproportionately bad by the pandemic effect. And uh, well, the pandemic has been sad for various reasons, but it would also be very sad if it ends up delivering a big blow to our effort to construct a more inclusive uh, community. Okay, so... Um, those are the weakness of the pipelines that I've heard uh, most. Um, then how, and, and here on this slide, I would like to propose some concrete actions that we can ponder upon and, and, and discuss later. So the first is that perhaps to help to combat stereotypes and one can consider outreach activities, but here it's very important, I think, to not to burden, you know, not to put the burden on, on, on our colleagues with a minority background to combat the stereotypes because, well, that's actual work. And uh, for to come back the feeling of isolation, which also has been mentioned a lot, and the feeling of like not belonging to some boys club. And uh, for some people, I believe uh, to have a mentor will be uh, helpful. And the third point is that to curb discrimination and harassment, it might be a good idea to have a contact person uh, whom you can talk to uh, with a low barrier in your own institution or maybe even in the international community. And uh, another popular topic is childcare support beyond what's uh, legally uh, you know, guaranteed uh, for you in your own country. The institutions can think about, for instance, teaching reductions or on-site childcare support or you know, incorporated in the, work, in the organization of workshop and conferences. 
And then uh, the last point is that uh, I hope we will take the pandemic effects into account when soon we're you know, doing our hiring and evaluation and perhaps even some systematic measures to counterbalance that effect will be helpful. So um, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. And now the last speaker is uh, Shruti Paranjapi from um, University of Michigan. She recently got the, uh, her PhD. So Shruti. Hi, thanks Ana Maria. And, and thanks to the organizers for this very unique opportunity. Um, so a little bit about me before I start. Um, I was a graduate, I was an undergraduate in IISER in Pune in India. I did my master's on conformal field theories and quantum quenches in DIFR in Mumbai with Gautam Mandal. And then most recently, I was a PhD student at the University of Michigan. I worked on scattering amplitudes and EFTs with Henrietta Elvang. And um, I just graduated a couple of months ago and now I'm headed to do a postdoc at UC Davis in the fall. Um, next, slide. next slide, please. So the, there were a couple of factors, some of which have already been touched upon uh, that I wanted to discuss. Uh, most of these will be somewhat sociological because in the end, physics is done by people and understanding how those people behave is part of uh, understanding the problem. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the edu education and motivation of younger students, which Kiara already talked a little bit about. So I think one important thing to understand is the motivation of young students to take up a career in physics research is often gendered because in society, people see STEM as being a male field quite often. Um, and this, this does two things, I think. The first is that it reinforces social stereotypes. So young women are often told that they are hardworking as opposed to creative. And this reinforces the idea that maybe they can make it as a physicist, but they can never make it as an excel in, they, they can't ever excel in the field. Another such stereotype is you can either look good or be smart and there's nothing, there's, there's no way of uh, having both. And I think this is also another damaging stereotype. The second thing I wanted to, um, I think we should think about is imposter syndrome. This is something that affects most people in academia, men or women. Um, but disproportionately, it's felt by people who work in relative isolation with a lack of community, which means it, it disproportionately affects minorities uh, or, and women. And this is the belief that the position you have or the opportunity you currently have is due to luck um, and not due to your research capabilities. And this is a problem when people have this belief and therefore don't go after opportunities, uh, don't apply for jobs or grants, which their more confident counterparts then will receive. The, the second aspect I wanted to talk about was mentors and role models. I was very lucky in life. Um, I guess this is, what, this is why they say we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, um, to have mentors and role models who are very supportive. I think this is very important. Rather than having um, mentors who could possibly be uh, abusive or harassing, it's good to have a system of mentors who actually provide guidance and support. So a mentor is someone who you know who provides guidance and who, what their gender is, is irrelevant. A role model, on the other hand, you may or may not know, and it's someone you see as like you. And role models, provide a proof of principle that someone like you can be successful. Um, I, I believe that to have better mentors, faculty need to take mentorship duties more seriously and, and structurally they need to be given the resources to, to be good at mentorship. And as for role models, a more diverse faculty will make sure that no matter who you are, there is a role model that you can identify with. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about social pressures. Um, so 
to begin with, let me give you a statistic. So in India, where I grew up, 36% of science PhDs are women, but only five to seven percent of physics research faculty are women. In comparison, in the US, 20% of physics PhDs are women and 16% of faculty are women. And this is basically to illustrate that there are different societal expectations of women at various stages, depending on what society they are a part of. Um, most of these expectations are familial in nature and they come into play around this, this stage, the stage of my career that I'm in now. And these are to, to get married or to, or to raise a family. Um, and these are seen as being in contention with having a career in physics. Uh, so I think there's, there's two ways to approach this. One, to make it actually more compatible. As, as Miranda said, you, you need to have daycare, you need to um, have maternity leave and understand um, and support people with partners um, who may or not have that much geographical um, flexibility. And the second thing is, of course, social change. And I understand that the physics community alone cannot bring about social change, but we can be drivers of it. And I think that is something we all need to think about. So I'll, I'll just conclude with one, one thought, which is which we all understand, and that is that measurements are frame dependent. So one person's measure of success might not match someone else's, and their measure of comfort of a work environment might not match someone else's either. Um, so yeah, it, it really shouldn't matter what how strong someone is or how rebellious they are or who their parents were or where they grew up. We should only be selecting for people who have strong research capabilities so that physics can go ahead um, at full speed. And I think with a few structural changes and a lot of understanding, we, we can get to that point. Um, that's all I really wanted to bring up. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Shruti. And please uh, let us uh, all thank uh, Chiara, Silvia, Miranda, and Shruti for this very enlightening presentations. And um, so now is the time for questions and, and uh, comments, uh, remarks. So I will stop uh, sharing here. And I think, uh, well, you probably already know the, how it works. Uh, you can raise your hand uh, via the Zoom. You can make comments uh, via the Zoom chat. Or you, uh, if you can, please stay uh, with your camera on. And if you have some pressing comments, and wave in front of the camera. And uh, OK, if uh, we go into overtime, then we can go to, this, to the Slack channel. And thank you all for being there. So let's see who is first. So Nathan. So, so I had a curiosity question. So you all come from different, most of you come from different countries. How do you think the cultural difference in the different countries affects, I don't know, your success or how you have? Well, uh, uh, if I can answer as first, I think uh, it, it counts a lot indeed. So when I compare my, my career and the reasons why I can feel to be, I don't know, a little bit disadvantaged because I was a woman, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, you know, kind of reasons why are quite typical of the Italian culture that, that I don't find similar uh, reasons. So that's why, for instance, I put much attention on problem of unconscious bias, because this is something which in Italy is very, very present, very, very present. And probably in other countries, it's not. In fact, in, uh, in other countries, uh, the situation might be due to slightly different reasons. In my country, in Italy, for sure, this is, I think, the main reason in, in our community. Maybe I can briefly say that that just um, I think in in coming from India and in Indian society, I, I, I'm very lucky that my parents weren't like this, but there is a lot of parental pressure to get married and start a family at a certain age. And sometimes I've seen that when young students leave at that critical stage, 
to a different country, it puts enough gap between them and the society that's putting pressure on them to do something that they are able to um, live life more on their terms and go after their career if that's what they wish. Well, uh, between different countries, there may also be different uh, kind of facilities and, and family support. So maybe it happens that in some countries it's easier uh, to, to have a family while working hard for research, while in other countries it's not, or maybe in other countries the situation is improving now. In Italy, I must say that probably Chiara already mentions that uh, at, at that time when we were very young, uh, the situation was very bad from the point of view of uh, any kind of uh, support uh, to young families, uh, whereas now uh, I must say the situation has improved. Uh, quite a lot. So this also may make the difference, of course. Okay, we have a question from Lata Joshi. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you. Hi. Thanks for the nice discussion. Uh, I have a question for Chiara since she uh, talked about the two body problem and I think it can be useful to some people in audience maybe. And then the question is that, uh, uh, is maybe a more practical one that how, how does one manage when the both the husband and wife have a promising career and they both have deep interest in science, but then after a few years of raising a family and finding it difficult because the job is demanding and requires long hours, how does one manage such situation? Because we start to question whether one of us should drop out and find easier, uh, less demanding jobs. So again, repeat the question. I understand this about the two body problem, but what exactly shall I say about it? How does one manage after a few years when? Ah, I was saying that uh, when both the people want to stay in academia, yeah. which is very demanding and requires long hours, how yeah. does one manage the, for a long time, like in a few years, PhD, postdoc, it's fine that, and then I think for myself, it starts to feel like uh, tiring up having a work-life balance when both of you want to do and have good career in academia? Yeah, I quite frankly, I don't think there is a good answer to this. It's actually a, a very hard situation uh, to deal with. And uh, um, I, I know that it's also different from uh, in different institutions. For instance, I must give credit to Princeton University where I am for trying to solve the two body problem in uh, 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 get offering, you know, uh, making possible for both, both, both people in the couple to apply to the university and look for jobs. So when you are physically in the same place, that is, makes it much easier, okay? Uh, and, then, um, and then basically you have to uh, make your choices. Basically, uh, you know, if you are two people working, you know that a lot of that money <laughs> is going to go to they care for the children to support and things like that. So uh, it's, it's hard. I'm not, I don't have a formula. I wish I had a formula, okay. Okay, but that is one of the main problems in this field, okay? Just uh, stick with it, do your best uh, and put the money where, where you think it can help you. Okay, thank no, you. Thank you. It, it helps to hear that it's hard uh, for you and yeah, for you as well, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Sarah Cremonini. Hi, yes. Uh, so first of all, thank to all of you for the uh, for leading the discussion. It was all very interesting. I just wanted to add a comment. Having grown up in Italy and moved to the United States, um, I would like to say that although in Italy the culture is certainly a more, well, there's a, a more explicit amount of sexism. Um, there is certainly a lot of bias in the United States. I just think it's a lot more subtle. Uh, and you would find the same problem, I think, um, globally. In some countries, uh, the bias is more explicit. In other countries, it's just a little bit harder to see, but it's still there. Um, and another thing that I think we should not forget is I think a lot, um, a lot of the times you find more discrimination and bias as you climb up the ladder. So for example, in Italy, there are plenty of people that I know who never experienced any problem until they, they went farther up 
in their career. And uh, I think you'll find that in the United States, if you look at every sector, once you reach kind of the upper levels, you find a lot more um, bias against women, not only women, of course, uh, but members of underrepresented groups in general. So it is a universal problem and it has to do also with how far along you're going in your career and how competitive the field is. That's my personal impression and also from talking to a lot of people in different sectors. So that was, that's all I wanted to say. So we have a question now from Daniel Arlo, please. Yeah, hi, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the issue that Miranda brought up about making the culture of the field um, safer and, and healthier. And I think an essential aspect of that is that, you know, by nature of academia and the structure of our field, the, the power is extremely hierarchical. You know, all of us depend on letters of recommendation, you know, conference invitations, you know, and, you know, especially when you're a graduate student um, and you, you have to have a positive relationship with your advisor. Uh, and in a situation like that, um, I think there's a huge responsibility that needs to be on the advisor, you know, making sure that even unintentionally that power is not being taken advantage of, you know, even if you as an advisor, as I am now, you know, think that your intentions are perfectly good, right? And that you're behaving in an appropriate way, your students may not feel comfortable telling you that they're not okay with the way that you're behaving, right? Because if you, you know, what if that causes you to somehow, you know, think less of them or gives you an incentive to write something less positive in a letter of recommendation and then that's it for them, right? And that, and you know, and that calculate, you know, and I don't really know what we can do about that. It's very hard I mean, because letters of re recommendation are just so essential to the way that the field operates. I'm not sure that we can change that, but then as a result, you know, those of us who write them really need to constantly be thinking of this, you know, is anything that I'm doing you know, something um, which uh, could put someone who I have power over in, a, in an uncomfortable or awkward situation. Um, so that's one comment. The other comment, so that maybe is harder to change. I think also something that might be a little bit easier is that, you know, there's a long tradition in theoretical physics of sort of macho behavior. Um, you know, and, and some of it, you know, is all in good fun, you know, intellectual sparring and so on. But I, I think it's good to be aware that not everyone enjoys that or feels, feels comfortable with that. You know, just, you know, with my friends, it might be fun to, you know, if somebody says something wrong to try to grind their nose in the dirt about it, right? But maybe not, you know, when it's some younger person or person I don't know, or someone from a different institution. I mean, it, it shouldn't just be assumed that that's the norm, you know, without, you know, without being comfortable with the people that you're, you're doing, you're doing it with. Uh, okay, so those are my two comments. Thanks. Uh, sorry, if I can just comment on your first comment. Uh, uh, yes, this uh, issue about uh, delta of recommendation letters is a big issue. And this is still, I think this is still due to unconscious bias because you know it's really depends on kind of perception you have of the of the person but i think uh, once you realize that uh, you should do something as you're saying uh, this is already a big step forward i think any okay. particular selection committees should take this into account uh, this is something for instance we are trying to do when we work uh, in the selection committee for postdocs at european level every year this is something that we try to pay attention to. Yeah, and I would like to also to, to just say that it was very sad that I heard stories like, oh, I got harassed uh, inappropriately in the conference, but I didn't dare to tell other people. I tell you, but don't tell other people because I'm just a grad student and he's a professor. And it's very sad. I mean, that's, that's not how the field should operate. We should all be more careful with this kind of things. Okay, so now we have a question, a comment from Maria Pilar. Yes, good morning. 
Uh, I have a question for Silvia. Uh, I would like that you, you said that there has been some measures that have been implemented in order to improve this uh, the situation. Maybe you could con comment about the, about them. Well, of course, this is kind of difficult things because you know trying to implement the same kind of uh, uh, let's say actions uh, in all the European countries, as you know, is difficult because every single country has its own rules. Uh, but uh, what we at least what we have done so far has been to well, first of all. I, I keep repeating this thing, but I think this was a great uh, uh, achievement that we got, uh, which was to make the community aware that there is a problem, a community aware that we have to pay attention in any uh, contest where these kind of things may appear. And then we started comparing between different countries which kind of actions uh, um, you know, can be implemented. And for instance, let me just mention one thing which has been done at this point at really at the European level, which I find extremely useful, which is the following. Uh, starting from next year, uh, you cannot apply for, you know, the very prestigious European grants unless you belong to an institution which adopted a, what they call a gender equality plan. Okay, so every institution has to, to adopt a gender equality plan, which is what? It is a set of uh, it sort of, uh, let's say a document, a declaration that in the next few years, you will implement actual real, uh, real actions, real uh, affirmative actions, of course, uh, it depends on the institution. It depends on what you want to do. But the point, the the, re, the point is that there will be every year they will check you if you have done what you have declared you want to do. And this is the first time that uh, I think we will manage. For instance, here I'm talking about my own institution. This is the first time we will manage to uh, realize. Uh, something concretely, because, you know, usually you produce a lot of documents, a lot of words, uh, blah, 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 blah. No, this time they will check you if what you have declared, you, if you have done what you have declared. And this is, the, this is a great historical occasion because, you know, we will really do things. For instance, uh, you know, at the level of uh, general institution, uh, providing, of, of, um, you know, distribute, when you distribute money, when the, the, the university uh, gives money to the, to the departments, we may introduce as one of the criteria whether the department adopted uh, uh, particular politics, uh, gender politics, whether uh, they, in the old um, um, procedure of, you know, new positions and these kind of things uh, that they, they will, that they have hired uh, women and men or only men. So these kind of things uh, might be a good criteria to, 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 you know, to push people to do something concretely. Okay, we have a question from Deepak, please. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, it's, a, it's a comment. Uh, and of course, uh, not being uh, a woman myself, uh, I'm very hesitant to make uh, comments on such issues. But I'll just say one thing that uh, one, apart from all these things that you know, all the speakers have raised regarding unconscious bias and so on, uh, one basic problem lies in the fact uh, that men in general are simply not aware of the difficulties faced by, by women. Uh, purely by on virtue of the fact that that they, that they are women, and uh, you know, and and it's not sometimes it can just be due to unknowing ignorance, but sometimes and uh, or as collaborators or co-authors. Uh, and even as as as, as students, uh, that uh, that 
uh, women face certain difficulties which which uh, which men don't and uh, we need to be open about it and educate men about it that, that that's that's simply uh, the thing and another comment if i'm not taking too long is that there should be uh, apart from all of these you know nice words there should be structural changes in place so uh, there should be uh, different facilities provided for women in institutions uh you know and that goes without without saying uh and uh, uh, there should be uh this thing what do you call it a uh, daycare and uh, and uh, parental you know leave uh, provided for anybody who is willing uh, to use it thanks so now we have a question from uh, ben privovel yeah, uh, well, yeah, since this is our international meeting, I, I kind of wanted to ask about other nearby fields. I have the impression that, that for example, astronomers have made much more progress in this area. I, I know they also have their own problems. It's maybe a bit relevant to um, some things Marika was writing in, in the chat. Um, I don't know if you included astronomy and physics, but I have the feeling that our field has been particularly slow to make process progress. And do you have any insight into you know, how we could do better as a field in that area? Or am I just wrong that, that our field has been particularly slow? May I say something about that? For instance, the bio, in the biological sciences, there are a lot of women now doing extremely well. Uh, so, um, it, and in the, you mentioned astronomy and cosmology. There is a lot of women, there are a lot of women in cosmology and, uh, and uh, astronomy especially. And I don't know exactly why in the biological sciences, because I think women have this interest in being useful and they like fields where they can make a contribution to humanity. And this is why there are so many doctors and so many biologists. And in the astronomy, well, there is a big tradition behind. Remember that uh, you know we have a lot of astrono astronomers who worked in uh, catalog cat catalog catalog in catalogs of of stars and galaxies and so on. And uh, uh, for some reason, that is a, a a field that uh, strikes more people imagination and uh, definitely we have a lot of women in that field which is wonderful and in particular I a lot of women coming from Italy who have found a job in the US tend to be cosmologists and astronomers and it's just a, it's just a nice field to be in I guess well, uh, if I can add something, uh, com considering um, astronomers, uh, I don't know if you have read uh, in the last few years, they had a serious problem of sexual harassment in their community. Um, well, comparing with other uh, fields, um, what, I, what I can say is that probably phenomenologies are more or less uh, the same as we find the situation is comparable to ours. Whereas the situation is much better among the uh, particle experimentalists, but this has an easy explanation you know, because when you enter a big uh, experiment, no matter whether you are a man or a woman or wh whatever, you have a, a precise uh, role in the experiment and they want to keep you because you, you, you are working well in that role. So in, even here you know, in, the, in the experimentalist group uh, here in Milano, there are a lot of women. I, I wouldn't say 50%, but certainly close to 50% because this is a completely different kind of work. Instead, you know, our work is a single man, single person work. We have to prove to, to, to be a genius every day. <laughs> so that's probably what discourages many people. Can I also add that uh, the number of permanent jobs makes a big difference um, when it comes to the number of women in a particular field. And when it comes to theoretical physics, there is a bottleneck when it comes to uh, getting a postdoc and then going from postdoc to tenure track or, or whatever it's called in whichever country. Um, whereas in biology, at least, there are a lot of postdoc positions and the bottleneck really occurs when you go from being postdoc to tenure track. And that, that 
that is really where um, so so a lot of people can stay at the postdoc level and that allows for more flexibility which then allows for um, it, it's more inclusive So oh, let's have a now uh, the comment from Alexander. Yeah, thanks to all of you for the really interesting presentations. Uh, I had a question for Miranda. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on the extra challenges that the pandemic has brought, because I, I don't think it's something that I had quite appreciated. And also, you know, what can be done to help? Um, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Just my own experience from, you know, my collaborators and, uh, and uh, you know, the productivity drop among my collaborators who have uh, young children at home and without, that's dramatic, right? I mean, for collaborators who do not have young children at home, their productivity seems to be increasing <laughs> during the pandemic. But it's like it could easily drop to zero in some cases if you have young children at home. And uh, from what I read in, uh, in, for instance, there's this Nature article I can send you the link that just like when translated into, you know, um, yeah, productivity, I mean, and, 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 and childcare, I mean, most of this childcare seems to unfortunately still falls upon the shoulder of the, the, the women. The, so that's why, uh, yeah, so according to these different studies, I mean, it seems that um, the female researchers are the ones who take the brunt of, uh, yeah, the, 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 the loss of productivity in, in, in uh, and I see, and I see with my own eyes how, you know, some young mothers that I'm working with are struggling to, you know, with a young child at home and then you try to work at deep at night and then, you know, squeeze some teaching in. That's just uh, very tough. And that seems to be a more, um, more than just anecdote. That seems to be a systematic uh, phenomenon as far as I understand. Yeah, and not only in physics, but in all uh, uh, in, in all, all walks of life. I mean, that's... Of life, but in academia, especially because of what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Now we have a question from Clifford Johnson. Hello, everyone, and thanks for this great discussion. I, I hope we can, moving forward, maybe uh, continue to have reflection like this amongst ourselves when we gather uh, on, on topics uh, adjacent as well. I, I was um, thinking about some of the things people were saying, uh, particularly in the chat about uh, the early stages, even before we worry about the, the massive problem of the pipeline, which is just who's interested in our field and, and what are we doing to, to encourage interest. And it's very striking to me, uh, the lack of uh, women of African descent, black women, uh, uh, you, you, know, you think string theory uh, and related fields and you look around and I, I can think of very few examples. Now, uh, you know, we could just sort of say it's an addition of two effects, right? The, the effects uh, uh, people who look like me and then people who are women and it's just doubles. But I, I, I wonder whether there's, there's something additional there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just encouraging people to think about it but it may also be uh just what i'm seeing and people are seeing uh different interests uh, you know i'm thinking at levels at school and the graduate level I'm, I'm seeing no one um from that uh um uh group uh even showing interest uh and i don't know why that is yeah, can I say something about this? Because when I was a director of a graduate school uh, of graduate studies at Princeton University in uh, physics, I, I had more than one black uh, female uh, student who all of a sudden had decided that she was interested in physics with uh, never having taken a grad and under a high school class. And we tried everything, tutoring, uh, giving, providing the background. I was very eager to have this these girls into the physics program. But after a while, I mean, they couldn't take it anymore. I mean, why? There are so many other opportunities out there that missed the train and they realized that it was very hard to get in. And again, this goes back 
to the uh, to the problem that they just didn't get physics enough physics enough math enough background in the high school and this and they is particularly true as i said for black people and for for women and they have the, you know they, they got it from both sides yeah. and that is the problem I, at least the one i have experienced i'm saying that it is all the problem but i personally have experienced that one trying to get women, interested women, into physics, but it was too hard to catch up at that point. Hmm. Okay, and I'm afraid we will have to close to, uh, sorry, Sandeep, uh, we have to close to, um, for the preparation for the next uh, session. Uh, so let's all thanks uh, the speakers and um, the organizers for, for including this, this session. And also let, let me finish um, by showing you um, this advertisement of, of an, an event that's coming up during String Feno in, in, um, about, in about two weeks. Um, so maybe, I don't know, Pedro, you can tell us if we can stay a little bit more. I think it's perfectly fine to stay a little bit more. We need like six minutes for screen share. For so, okay, so we can go we on can for keep, four months. Pedro, please then let us know when we should uh, quit for, for good. Sure. Okay, in four minutes. So if there are any more comments, uh, questions. <clears throat> sorry, Anna Maria, can I? Yeah, can sorry. I... Yeah, please. Uh, sorry, Sandy, please. No, no, not at all. I wanted to come back to something about the leaky pipeline, which we have seen at TIFR and in India. Maybe Shruti can also comment. You know, we do quite well in terms of having excellent uh, students, women students at the undergraduate level. But we found when we did the statistics at TIFR, uh, which is a research institution in India, and also gathered similar statistics for the other research organizations, that the number of women who were making it into our graduate program was disproportionately low. And uh, we couldn't understand it. They were not doing well on our entrance exams. Uh, and uh, after a lot of thinking, we came to the conclusion that uh, perhaps they were not responding to the stress, et cetera, of the examination as well. Uh, and so what we've done is we have started um, a sort of uh, sensitization process wherein we uh, encourage uh, women undergraduates who are promising to come and spend time in the summer a year or two before they are finishing their undergraduate degree and you know take some lectures we have women and men scientists mentoring them and so on the program is only two years old it started in physics has grown to computer science so we don't know but i say all this to ask if you all have had similar experience in your institutions what have you done and what do you think might help improve the situation if I can say what uh, we have done in Princeton, or we, we are trying to do in Princeton, was something very similar to what uh, you are doing. Basically, we, uh, Princeton University for a while, brought students from Trenton, a socially, uh, economically disadvantaged area, mostly black, to Princeton for uh, a summer internship summer courses like uh, uh, catch-up courses and uh, and the hope that some of them or oh, and we also brought yeah p uh, students from uh, uh, some uh, school from the south where there are a lot of black people all if they were interested in physics we they could get summer courses here and they also would get the internship in one of the labs and there are this, uh, such programs because i have not had the time to say but uh, the professional organizations in the US are trying to remediate to this problem with that rich program exactly of the type you are talking. For instance, these days, you cannot get an NSF grant unless you do uh, some outreach. And this is the kind of outreach that we were talking about, uh, that we were trying to do at Princeton, exactly what you are doing in India. So I don't know exactly what the outcome is. You see it down the, the you know, down the line in 10 years from now, but well, we hope it will work. Right. Okay. Anastasia, can, can I just interrupt? Anastasia, can you try to share screen again? 
Yeah. Just meanwhile, Jeff, well, do you want yeah. to make your comments? So you can keep commenting. I just want to. Yeah, thanks. Jeff, please. Thanks, Anna Maria, and thanks, thanks also to to the discussion leaders. It was a it was a very enlightening discussion. Um, I'd like to I'd like to ask a question about a data set that's so, south of the equator. Um, I am I am my, my position at, at the university here is is as um, uh, as the deputy dean of science um, for uh, and my portfolio is specifically postgraduate students and uh, and research. So I, I get to see I get to see these issues take place across all the disciplines in science. You know, physics is physics is 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 just one, and the problem is is slightly nuanced for physics. But these are universal issues that have to do with science across the board. Um, <clears throat> there are some disciplines that are that are slightly better, astronomy, for example, um, and some disciplines that are that are um, slightly worse in terms of social interactions and, and things like that. Um, my question actually is 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 for our hosts, um, uh, specifically Nathan, for example, uh, or, or uh, anyone in in in. In Brazil or, or, this, or, or South America, as to it, what's the problem like there? Because because certainly I can I can see the the, the issues that are being spoken about um, in in Europe and and North America, um, but a lot of the problems that we have with encouraging women in, in science, for example, um, yeah, my, my wife could probably speak better to this than than I can. But a lot of the problems that we have with encouraging women in science and my and uh, people of color in science. Are, are are deeply cultural in in in, in my society. Um, you know, it's very difficult to convince somebody um, to go into uh, a field like physics when a lot of their family doesn't even know what it is we do um, uh, for a living or how one can make a living out of this. Um, so 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 my question is to to Nathan. Um, I, I, of course, you know, anyone's. Will accept a good answer, but but I'm I'm curious as to how things are in South America, for example. I think it depends on the country. I mean, Brazil, there are many women, for example, in astrophysics, in cosmology, in in our area of string theory, there are very few. Um, I think we have a similar problem that was mentioned by Sandeep. So we have an exam, and and the exam. I think the women don't don't do in the top whatever one two three percent, um, and that that's a problem. But uh, I, I mean the solution is hard. But but maybe what Sandeep was suggesting I think is a great idea. Can I quickly add that there's a lot of data that shows that objective type standardized tests tend to work worse for for women and minorities for whatever reason. Um, there's a lot of data on the GRE and the SATs in the US that shows this. Um, I don't know what a good alternative is, uh, but I can, I, can say, I can share the resources after this is done. I'm sorry, right now, I really think we should screen share test. Now we only have two minutes. <laughs> we are really risking ruining all the, the schedules. I think Thanks a lot. Thanks. I'll really pass it to Anna Maria. Anna Maria, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. And thank you, everyone. Kong Kao, can you try to share screen yours? Um, right. Let me try. <laughs> Perfect. Freddy or Lionel? So Lionel is not yet. <laughs> Sorry, I am here now. Okay, I'll put you co-host just one second, Lionel. Um, thank you for being. Sorry, sorry, I'm a bit late. <laughs> Freddy, do you want to go ahead first, maybe? Sorry, to the web. <laughs> I well, went to the website. Test the screen share. To... Either one. Oh, to try the screen share. Okay, that's good. Yes. Um, let me see. Um... Okay. 
try here. Full screen now. Can you see the yeah, yeah. the mouse? Yes. Yeah. Maybe change one slide to check that uh, it works. Oh, yes. Good. Perfect. Excellent. Final. Yeah. Stop share. Oops. That's my mouse. Sorry. There we go. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, it's good. So well, let's start the session. So remove, yeah. Henriette, please uh, take it away, yeah. All right, thank you so much to the organizers for a terrific okay. conference. Yeah. And to all the speakers and for all the people who continue the discussion on Slack that allows people in different time zones and with different obligations to follow along to discussions that would normally take place in one corner of uh, the coffee break. It's really great to be able to, to follow along this way. So it's a pleasure to introduce mm -hmm. uh, Kang Wen from Queen Mary, and he'll tell us about new exact results and modular invariants of integrating correlators and n equals four subangles. So take it away, Gong Kao. I'll let you know when you have five minutes left. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so first, let me thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference and uh, in, inviting me to speak here. Um, so I will talk about the uh, um, exact results and the modular invariance or uh, integrate Correlation functions in and for super young meals. <laughs> so um, the talk will be a, mostly based on these two papers. I loaded with Daniel Doligoni and Michael Green. Um, in various place, I will also mention uh, early work that done was uh, that was done uh, with uh, uh, Chester, Michael Green, Silvia Pufu, and the Yifan Wang. <laughs> so. Um, the object we will study uh, in this talk is a four-point correlation function in uh, n 4 super yamios with SU and gauge group. Um, so this is a correlation function of four uh, super conformal primary operator. Uh, I call O2 here. Uh, sometimes it's also called O20 prime. Um, so this is the build out of the two scalars of the theory. And uh, to get rid of the asymmetry index, I introduced this uh, now vector I call Y here. Um, so this is a BPS operator and it's famously known that the two and the three point function are protected. Um, so the first natural case is a four point function, which is what uh, we are going to study. Um, <clears throat> it is convenient to write this as a, a, a free part, namely, uh, the part that you can compute from free theory and uh, uh, a remaining one. And the remaining part can be further decomposed say, into two pieces. Um, and I write that as say, I4 and the TN, where the P factor I4 a, is completely fixed by the symmetry. And it contains all the information about this now vector Y, or said in another way, it contains all the information about the R symmetry. And this uh, unique function uh, is, is our focus, okay? So this is a function of the, of, of the class ratio, and it's also a function of the coupling. Um, things that will be interesting in a non perturbative effect. So let, I will use the uh, complex by the coupling. Um, I think sometimes I will also call it as a tau one plus I tau two, where tau one basically is the angle and the tau two is the one over G under square. And of course, it's also uh, depends on the uh, rank of the gauge group. All right, uh, what is known about this correlator? Well, it is a imperturbation theory. Uh, this was computed up to uh, three loops. Um, as for the integrand, uh, in the planar limit, the integrand was constructed up to 10 loops. And uh, 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 an interesting fact is that uh, the non-planar non contribution only starts to end at the, ten, uh, at the four loops and the integrand was also constructed. At the strong coupling, uh, one can compute this correlator using ADSLT, uh, even in early days of ADSLT duality. And more recently, there has been a, a lot of uh, interesting generalizations 
by including the KK modes, con considering loop collections or string collections. Um, the non perturbative instant on effects uh, were studied uh, in the, the semi classical limit. All right. Um, as my title suggested, so we are really interested in um, this SO2D modular uh, invalence of this correlator. Um, since SO2D symmetry relates the correlation function at the weak and the strong coupling, um, so we want to compute this correlate at the finite coupling. Well, <laughs> computing a non trivial four point correlation function at the finite coupling uh, in general is very difficult. Um, so instead, uh, we will consider a similar but yet highly non trivial object we call the integrated correlate. Um, so the, the definition is very simple. So you take the correlator, well, say you integrate it over the space time. Uh, here now it's uh, the clause ratio with a certain measure. And with suitable choice of the measure, which I will describe shortly, and uh, this integrated correlator can be computed exactly. At the end of the talk, well, towards the end of the talk, I, I will also uh, uh, discuss one may reconstruct the unintegrated correlator, uh, at the least for the first few orders in the large rank expansion. <laughs> um, so there are two integrated correlators that have been studied. Uh, I will call just number one and number two. Um, the measure, <coughs> uh, for the first one, the measure takes this uh, rather simple form. And the second one, well, has the same measure, but insert yet another function I call D111 here. Uh, so this is just uh, a, the D function or the contact the Viden diagram. Um, or if we want, this is just uh, a one loop box integral in four dimension. All right. <coughs> so before I present uh, say our result, let me just comment um, the simplicity of this integrated correlator. Uh, say just, let me just focus on the first one. Um, so I mentioned that uh, in, in the perturbation, um, the integrated correlator was computed up to three loops. Um, in fact, at one and two loops, the correlator is simply given by so-called ladder diagram. And the ladder diagram uh, was famously known, can be computed to any loop order. So L is a number of loop. Um, it's given by this, uh, let's say, polylog reasons. It turns out the integrate ladder diagram, namely use the measure I just said on the previous page, <coughs> was also known to any loop order. And then for that, it's just given by this uh, simple Riemann zeta. Um, now, at the three loops, the correlator takes much more uh, complicated expression, uh, uh, way more than just ladder diagram. It contains uh, so-called multi polylog reasons and so on. Um, but we found that the, if we take that the really complicated expression and the integrate over this measure, everything collapses, and you got just got a zeta seven with this uh, rational coefficient. <coughs> but let me emphasize again. So we really want to compute the correlator exactly, not the order by order in perturbation. <coughs> so this was made possible uh, by realizing a relation between this uh, integrated correlator and the partition function of n to star super yamus on S4. And the relation is given here. Um, so n two star super yamus is basically say n four super yamus deformed by some mass term, and uh, the statement is that the integrated correlator is given by say you take the partition function and take four derivative with respect to mass or respect to the coupling and set the mass to zero go back to n four super yamus. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, when you take the dilute you, you bring down uh, integrated operators from the action. So that's how say, the integrated um, uh, correlator is related to this four dilute acting on the partition function. Um, this relation is useful, uh, of course, because the, the partition function of n could to start super yamus on S4 is famously known, can be computed using supersymmetrical localization. Um, so I won't go into any detail here just to say, instead of a past integral, so this, this partition function is given by n finite dimensional, n-dimensional integral, and that receives contribution from perturbation 
as well as from a non perturbative effect with instant on the south, well, instant on anti instant on the south and north pole of the S4. Um, in my talk, so I will actually mostly focus on uh, the first integrated correlator. Um, at the end, uh, towards the end, I will uh, briefly comment on the on the second integrated correlator. Um, so, well, without uh, going into any detail, um, just to say that uh, we analyze this uh, localization formula very carefully, especially the Nikosov partition function, uh, by studying a lot of examples. We observed, uh, we observed uh, some patterns uh, that allowed us to uh, conjecture an exact expression for the first integrate correlator for arbitrary n and arbitrary coupling. Um, the expression takes the following uh, this the following form. Uh, we write it as a say, uh, something over two dimensional uh, lattice, so p and q uh, integers, and uh, all the coupling dependent dependence uh, appears in this particular way. Um, so in some sense, all the non-trivial information are contained in this rational function, which I call b and t here. So b and t takes this form. And the numerator I call QN is a degree two n minus one polynomial. Well, it's explicit form, maybe not so important, um, but anyway. So say for SO two, it's given here. SO three, it, it, it takes this form. Uh, you may notice it's a symmetrical polynomial. Um, so let me make some quick remarks. Uh, one is that the, this rational function. Um, has this so-called inversion invalence, uh, namely it's invalent if we take a t equal to one over t. That's associated with this symmetry property of, of this polynomial q I just mentioned. Um, it also obeys several interesting uh, integral identity. Uh, one of them is that uh, if we integrate it over a measure like one over square root of t, it vanishes. Um, this property, I mentioned it because it's important to, to do a Poisson summation. And Poisson summation is one way say, to read off uh, explicitly the Cajun's non contribution from the formula. So the statement is that a Cajun's non term uh, can be obtained uh, from the formula by doing a Poisson summation on P. And the instant number K is basically P head times Q, where P head is an integer uh, replacing P when you do the Poisson sum over P. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> another Important property is that this is a manifestly manifestly SO two the invalid. Um, that's simply because of how the complex fiber coupling appears in this particular way. And if we sum over integer, it's easy to show this is a SO two the invalid. Um, another uh, property is that uh, uh, one may re-express the, the the result uh, in terms of a infinity sum. Uh, or a non holomorphic Ison series with uh, some coefficient, which I don't show here. Um, so, well, th this can be obtained by simply take this rational function and expand around the t to zero, and you integrate the order by order. Um, since non holomorphic Ison series will appear again, so let me just remind you it's also given by a lattice sun um, for. Any well for complex fiber S as far as the, the sum is uh, convergent, um, so one can do a free decomposition for the uh, non holomorphic Ison series, where the zero mode is basically the, the perturbative term and the, the non zero mode are the instant ones. Okay, <laughs> um, another important property of this uh, 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 rational function is that it obeys a second order differential equation. Uh, very much like this one. And that differential equation can be translated into a differential equation for the integrated correlator itself. And we call that as a Laplace difference equation since it's an equation that uh, relates the correlator for SUN theory uh, with the correlator of the SUN plus one and the SUN minus one. Um, I, like, I should emphasize that this Laplace operator is SL to the invalid. So this equation is SL to the invalid equation. <clears throat> so just as a comparison, uh, the well-known uh, non-holomorphic Ison series 
a base, a, well, much simpler uh, Laplace equation takes this form. Um, as I already said, since it's a kind of recursion relation, so once the initial data is given, say the integrated correlator for SU2 theory is given, then you can use this equation to determine uh, all the uh, correlators for arbitrary n, since we know the boundary liquidation from the perturbation. Um, in the remaining uh, few minutes, so I will just uh, discuss a little bit uh, this function in various limits. Um, let me begin uh, by discussing uh, the standard say, perturbation expansion or loop expansion. Um, so you can take the formula, just expand it in small coupling at, for arbitrary n. Uh, that is the expression you, 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 you will find. So first of all, it looks simple. And then at L loop, basically you find the, uh, say zeta 2L plus one with some rational coefficient. Um, as I already kind of uh, discussed, uh, one can take the known result of this correlation function and the integrator over the measure, uh, I gave it to you. And at least for, for, for the first three loops that we have checked, you will find this result. So setting in another way, the localization computation uh, did match with the standard quantum field theory computation uh, at the, well uh, to the order we have checked. Um, another property you may notice is that the non-planar contribution indeed starts at the four loops. Again, that was also known from the more standard uh, study. Um, one may also look at the say, larger n expansion, so kind of genus expansion, and at each or the genus, uh, one can expand in small lambda or large lambda. So let me begin with a small lambda expansion. Well, one can actually go uh, pretty high, but anyways, yes, the concrete expression is not that important here. Um, just to mention one small thing. Uh, so we found that at each order, uh, the theory is convergent with the same uh, finite radius. Uh, well, this property, I think it has been seen in Enforcibiamius for other physical quantities, such as the cuspers and normal dimension or amplitudes. Um, now one can also do a larger expansion. Uh, as, as expected, now the expansion in one lambda is a half of the integer power. Um, so one big difference is that the, the theory is, is asymptotic and not the Bohr sample. Uh, since we have concrete expression, so we, we can do a resurgent analysis and uh, to complete it with non perturbative uh, terms. And that's the result we found. It takes this uh, uh, polylogic form. Um, maybe more relevant uh, to us uh, is, uh, is another expansion, namely in the larger n expansion, but keep the Yamios coupling uh, to be finite. Um, so in this expansion, <coughs> we find that uh, a, only half integer power of a one of n appears, and the coefficient at each order is given by linear combination of the non-holomorphic Einstein series, which I introduced earlier. Um, compared to the the, the, the final n case, where the final n uh, the correlator is given by sum of infinity number of uh, non-holomorphic Einstein series. Uh, another big difference is that the index, I probably didn't emphasize, there was an integer, now it's a half integer. Okay. Um, so as I promised, uh, now I would, I would discuss uh, the other integrated correlator, uh, namely you take the partition function and take a four derivative with respect to mass. Um, this one turned out uh, a, a bit harder to compute. Um, so right now we don't have a say expression for this integrated correlator at the finite end, uh, but nevertheless, so in our early work, we computed this integrated correlator in the larger n expansion, but for finite coupling. And that's the expression we found up to order one of n to the q. Um, so you notice that uh, you know, besides the half integer power n appears, we also now have a integer power n. And for the half integer power turns, um, the coefficient again is given by linear combination of uh, non-holomorphic Einstein series. In fact, 
at each order, it's the same non-holomorphic isosceles appear, but just with different coefficients. Now for the integer guys, um, new modular invalids appear. Uh, we call it, well, it, it appear early in, in the study of a, a string amplitude. This is called generalized non-holomorphic isosceles. They are defined a, a below. So um, maybe let me remind you, so in the case of a non-holomorphic isosceles, uh, they obey a very similar, uh, say, Laplace equation, but it's a homogeneous in the sense that on the right-hand side, it was zero before. But now, so for, for this generalized guy, uh, they have a source term, and this source term makes this equation actually rather harder to solve. And I think this, the solution to this equation for general, say, R and S is not known, so it was solved for this case. Um, say one big difference between this generalized non-holomorphic isosceles and the uh, isosceles is that uh, the generalized uh, non-holomorphic isosceles uh, receives contribution from uh, both say instanton and anti-instanton pairs, but whereas for isosceles just as instanton or anti-instanton just separate. You have five minutes left, Konkao. Okay, great. Um, so in, in, in the final say, five minutes, uh, let me just discuss how one would uh, reconstruct the uh, original or unintegrated correlator. Uh, well, the idea is rather simple. We just write the ansatz for the correlator. Um, well, to do that, it's most conveniently can be done in, in Merlin space. So uh, let me just remind you, so say how, how, how the Merlin entity was defined. So you have a correlator uh, you do a Merlin transformation. Um, so after you subtract, well, after you remove some gamma functions, uh, what's remaining often called the Merlin amplitude. Well, for good reason, uh, one would remove those gamma functions, but let me not go into that. And Merlin amplitude was known uh, to have a very similar property as a, a flat space amplitude. Uh, so therefore we know quite well about its analytic structures. And uh, knowing these analytic structures allow us to write, say, ansatz for the milling amplitude. Um, so, so, so here C is the uh, central charge, namely n squared minus one over four. So I'm doing a larger n expansion for the milling amplitude. Um, as, as I said, we, we, due, to, due to the fact that we, we, we know it's an analytic structure, so we were able to write the ansatz for it. Basically the first turn, is the contribution coming from supergravity. And the second term is a contribution from R to the four. Well, so because I fact out R to the four and this is the supergravity one loop. And then this term is a contribution coming from D four R to the four. And the last term uh, I, I write here is coming from D six R to the four. Um, as you notice uh, up to here, a, at each order of one over n expansion, um, there are mostly a, a two uh, unfixed uh, say functions, and you can use these two uh, integrated correlators to fix them. Uh, indeed, so one, one can unambiguously fix um, this milling amplitude up to uh, this order. Um, at this moment, um, well, to fix say d six out of the four on ADS five colors as five, uh, since we have well three unfixed coefficients, we need the three conditions. Uh, at this moment, we use the flat space limit, namely by knowing the fact that if I take a flat space limit of the milling amplitude, I should reproduce the ten-dimensional uh, superstring amplitudes. That gives me uh, yet another condition combined with this uh, two integrated correlator. I can uh, fix all those d1, d2, d3. Um, out done that, um, that's the answer we found um, for the for this uh, say unintegrated correlator uh, in the larger n expansion up to the order say, d6 out of the four. Um, so say one consistent consistent check is that uh, one can take flat space limit of this milling amplitude, and we found that precisely reproduce known results of super string amplitude in flat space. Uh, of course, that check uh, is not uh, non-trivial for, for the D6 out of four, as I said, I, I used uh, flat space limited to fix this one, okay? Um, 
So just to avoid any confusion, so those coefficients uh, as a precise correct, because uh, when you do a uh, flat space limit, you have to do some integral uh, going from ADS5 plus S5 to flat space. And those numbers are, are precisely correct once you do the integral and yeah, okay. Um, so let me just uh, uh, summarize um, and make some comments. Um, so say, I guess the message I try to deliver here is that uh, um, it, it is difficult to compute the correlator itself at the final coupling, uh, but maybe one can look for a simpler uh, quantity. Uh, in my talk, I have been focusing on this integrated correlator. And we found that uh, with the right choice of the measure, uh, this became much simpler compared to the correlator itself, but yet it's highly non-trivial. Uh, so they can compute it exactly, but also provide the useful tools for study uh, non perturbative effects. Uh, in my talk, I have been mostly focusing on this SL2Z property of, of enforceable amulets. Um, so in this talk, uh, as I said, I have been mostly focused on uh, one of the integrated correlator. And it will be interesting to generalize our results uh, for the other integrated correlator at the final end. So this correlator, this integrated correlator has to be studied uh, at the finite coupling uh, in the larger N expansion order by order, at least to certain orders. Uh, it will be interesting to, to understand its structure at the finite N. Um, it will be also interesting to say, generalize the story for other correlators. I have been just focused on one correlator. Well, basically the simplest correlator in N for super Um one, one direction is that uh, um, uh, and for has this so-called uh, bonus U1 symmetry introduced by intrigator. And for the correlator beyond the four points, it's possible to violate this so-called bonus U1 symmetry. And the mathematics associated with that uh, is, is so-called non-holomorphic modular forms instead of non-holomorphic modular functions in the case of four points. So it will be interesting to study uh, those are objects even at the final end. So in this paper, we studied the larger angle expansion. Um, as I already said, so this talk, uh, I really just focus on uh, the simplest four-point correlation function uh, of enforceable Yamios. It's a correlator of the lowest conformal dimension. Um, it will be interesting to study, uh, say, KK modes, correlated of higher weight, a, a, a higher weight, uh, uh, Kind of primary operators. Um, so there has been interesting observation that uh, uh, those correlated, those KK uh, correlators or KK modes are in fact uh, kind of related to each other uh, through so-called hidden 10 dimensional uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, you may hear uh, more from uh, Coronado's talk. Um, I think it will be interesting to study them uh, in our content, say understanding them at the finite coupling, uh, at least for this uh, integrated correlator. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Gang Kao. We got two raised hands. Let's start with Pedro. Um, hi, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, can you summarize a bit uh, what, is the, uh, what uh, happens in ABJM? I already asked in the chat. My confusion is about the non-perturbative corrections. Do we have the same type of non-perturbative corrections at strong coupling? Because in flat space, those Eisenstein series analog, right, are much simpler. It's just the first few perturbative terms without the non-perturbative. Is there a counterpart for the gauge theory quantities or only in flat space do they become simpler? So in ABJN, it will be a map to say 11 dimensional uh, M theory. The coefficient R to the four is, is much simpler. It's a, it will be just a number. There's no coupling dependence. So you, uh, I think I'm talking about the tooth limit. So I think you are talking about your second limit, right? Yeah. So I was asking about your tooth limit when you had this exponential of minus square root of lambda. Oh, I see. Uh, but maybe I, I, maybe I should not be talking about that limit. I think that's- I, I don't know. I, I don't want to make it a discussion. I'll ask more in Slack. Right. Hi, thanks. Uh, I was curious if you could motivate um, uh, 
physically why the particular measure was chosen for de- defining the integrated correlate. I didn't right. sort of problem missed it. Right. Yeah. So well, this was chosen uh, basically because uh, with that choice, it's related to the uh, the partition function of uh, angle two star superamulus. So the point that the as I was saying, if you take a derivative with respect to the parameter, uh, you bring down say four integrated operators. So these four integrated operators may or may not uh, O2, the one I was interested in. Um, mm-hmm. So you have to do a super conformal transformation to bring them to O2. That was done in, the, in this paper. Um, okay. So that will generate some factors. And furthermore, say it's on S4. I'm really interested in correlated on R4. So you have to do conformal map from S4 to R4 that generates some other factors. Combine all those factors together, uh, as shown in those papers. Uh, that's the measure you will find. Yeah. Thanks. You. Um, it's perhaps related to the last question. You gave these two examples of integrated correlators. I mean, are there other potential integrated correlators which you could get nice results for, or are these um, somehow uniquely selected? Right, so there's one more has been discussed uh, in the literature. Uh, so I, I put it directly uh, and to start with Yamios on S4. Uh, one could put it uh, on squashed S4, so that's a squashed parameter. Um, then one can do a, a derivative with respect to the squash parameter, let me call B. Um, so potentially, there's one more, uh, well, as far as I know, uh, there's one more by taking two derivatives with respect to mass and the two derivatives with respect to the squash parameter. Um, however, in, we, well, we don't know if it's, uh, that's uh, linearly independent from localization side, uh, in our paper, we actually, prove, well, we didn't prove, but we, we, we provide the strong evidence uh, from, from localization side, uh, say two derivative respect to mass, two derivative respect to the squash parameter is not linearly independent from these two. On the other hand, well, it's a possibility that as a measure, one may generate a linearly independent measure compared to these two. So that, um, so that, that question is not settled, uh, settled. and I sh- just let me, sorry, I'm sorry to, to, to change the slide. Uh, let me just come to here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, to fix these six out of the four, I need the three conditions. Uh, well, if I don't use the first space limit, uh, then we kind of feel there should be another one such that uh, allows me at least f- to fix these six out of the four things. We kind of know the six out of four BPS. It's a BPS. So we should probably switch over to Anastasia now. So let's thank Gang Kao again. Okay. And Anastasia, can you share your slides, please? Great. All right. So we, we're happy to welcome Anastasia Bulovic to discuss recent developments in N equals four super annual sample suits. Here you go. All right. Uh, It's great to be here. Uh, Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak and for organizing this great conference. So I'm gonna tell you about some recent developments in N equals four Young Mills theory amplitudes. Uh, My talk is gonna be based on these four papers. So these are together with uh, Mark Spradlin, our current postdoc and former NEMA student, Akshay Yelishpur Srikant, my former student who is now a postdoc at Oxford, Anders Schreiber, and two of my current students, Jorge Margo and Li Cheng Ren. They, are, they should be somewhere on Zoom. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, planar N equals four Young Mills scattering amplitudes have been computed to very high order, as you'll see momentarily. Now they have remarkable properties that sparked interest from various mathematicians who work on combinatorics on algebraic geometry and number theory. On the other hand, several methods that have been developed in the past decade for uh, these uh, N equals four uh, amplitudes are directly applicable and have been greatly helped the QCD computations. So it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, area to think about. 
So in my talk, what I'm going to do is I'll just um, give you a short update, tell you a little bit about some of the recent developments uh, here. And uh, in particular, in the second part of my talk, I'll describe some of the approaches uh, that hope to explain some of the properties of these amplitudes using various mathematical constructions. So a more precise outline of the talk is right here. So um, first I will review basically one slide status and uh, then review some tools, sort of uh, main tools that we use to compute uh, these amplitudes. Then I'm gonna review the six and seven points and their connection to cluster algebras. Uh, then I'm going to outline some new and interesting features that start appearing beyond seven points. Uh, so I'll explain what these features are, and they, these are the sort of uh, uh, the area of uh, uh, you know the, the sort of the forefront of these computations. And I will uh, explain how some of these um, things could be uh, obtained from uh, plabby graphs and tensor diagrams. So the second part is gonna be a little bit more technical based on uh, these papers I just uh, mentioned. Okay, very good, status. Okay, so uh, what's uh, the status of these computations? Well, yeah, you've heard a lot of talks about four point amplitudes here, you know, four and five points are kind of trivial. They are known, um, uh, to all loop orders uh, because of dual conformal symmetry, because we're studying a very special theory such as uh, n equals four, uh, these amplitudes are given by something called uh, BDS ansatz to all loop orders. Uh, so the uh, interesting things start happening at uh, uh, six points. And uh, due to the um, heroic efforts of these people. And please, I refer you to this review for sort of uh, the progress and the update on this. The seven points have been uh, computed through seven loops and, oh, six, seven, uh, sorry, six points have been computed through seven loops and seven points have been computed through four loops. Now, more recently, uh, Song He uh, and his uh, group computed eight and nine point NMHV amplitudes through two loops. So that's maybe uh, the, the results of the last uh, year um, and a half. And of course, if we want to go um, uh, beyond uh, nine, so for N greater than nine, uh, MHV amplitudes have been known through two loops uh, for, for, since uh, 2010, uh, and uh, they were computed by uh, Simon 10 years ago. Okay, very good. So uh, how are these computed? How are these high loop computations done? Well, they're not computing by evaluating this, uh, you know, seven loop Feynman diagram. And uh, instead they're computed but by what's known an amplitude bootstrap. So how, what is, how, how do we do that? Well, we, you know, as usual, write down the answer as a linear combination of functions and uh, determine the coefficients by solving a system of linear constraint. So what I've done here, I've, uh, so it's easy to say, but uh, very, very difficult uh, to do. So here I've um, copied a table from this review by um, Lance Dixon and collaborators that I've already referred to. Uh, and here you can see the number, so, so this table, lists the number of remaining parameters in the ansatz for say six, so this is this table is for six point amplitude after each constraint is applied at each loop order. So suppose you wanna compute something at six loops, you start with um, uh, the system, which has, um, you know, what are 3000 parameters, and then you start going down, down and down, applying various constraints, so such as, you know, uh, parity symmetry, dihedral symmetry, uh, various collinear limit, uh, multi-regi kinematics, Steinman relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you, you continue until uh, you find a unique solution. And again, as I said, for six points, this has been done by uh, Dixon and collaborators up to seven uh, loops. Now, of course, it's remarkable that there is, there is a unique solution. You know, it's a very, uh, such a great theory and it's 
you know, so constrained. So, so just that fact is, uh, is remarkable as, as well. Okay, very good. So that's, these are the, these very high loop computations. So now let me tell you a little bit about some of the tools. So there are lots of tools, there are lots of interesting things. So I'll just mention the two most um, kind of important ones. So uh, first, you know, we're computing sketching amplitudes, they're functions of usually of a momentum. So instead of using momentum P, one um, goes to momentum twister space. So we label amplitudes by n points uh, z, zi, uh, which are in P3. Now, um, as I already mentioned, n equals four young Milstein has dual conformal symmetry. So in this variables, dual conformal symmetry is nothing but SL4C. Um, and there is a natural SL4C invariant, which is, which I wrote here. So everywhere, any paper on n equals four young Mills amplitudes you open, you'll see those brackets. So these are these, are these four brackets of momentum twisters. This is nothing but the, de the, the determinant that um, of the four by four matrix uh, that I've written here. So that's, that's the variables. Now, functions. So what kind of functions are we talking about? Well, again, for n equals four, we are dealing with very special functions. So it's known that, uh, believe that M, at least MHV and LMHV L, L loop amplitudes can be expressed in terms of these multipolarly polylog functions. And the weight of that polylog is twice the loop order. Now beyond NMHV, like at 10 point and cubed MHV, some, you might've heard some elliptic polylogs start appearing and there's a whole program and there's a, a sort of small community of people who are working on those. So for my talk, I'll just gonna restrict to, uh, to these. So what are these uh, generalized polylogs? Well, okay, so you can just re define them recursively. So if you have a weight M, polylog, you take its differential and uh, you can write it as uh, weight m minus one polylog d log. And then you continue d uh, weight m minus one is m minus two d log and so on until you hit for m equals one, that's the usual log. And the coefficient in front of it will be some rational number f zero. Uh, so given this, we can then define the symbol of the polylog, of these polylog functions, and we just define it by nothing but the tensor product, so it's an m tensor product, of all the arguments that appear here in these uh, d logs. Okay, so for example, let me just quickly give you an example. So, oops, I have to move this, okay. So, um, like take uh, lead two, you, you know that uh, D of lead two is minus log one minus, minus Z, D log Z. So that's a weight two um, polylog. And the symbol of that is minus one minus Z uh, tens of Z. So what the focus of, so, so there, there are lots of interesting things I could say here, but I'm just gonna stay focused. And what I'm gonna be focused in this talk is this symbol alphabet. And so what is a symbol alphabet given an amplitude? That's a collection of all possible arguments that could appear in those d logs. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that, that's denoted by uh, phi alpha here. Uh, now, it, so, so what's the meaning of this? So first of all, it encodes singularities of amplitudes that's number one. And number two, it's also is an input in the bootstrap program that, that I had on a previous slide. So in fact, when I said, okay, you start with a function, what you actually start with here, you start with some symbol at some uh, high, high loop order. So what, so, so what I will tell you a, a little bit today is how do you know and what are the properties of this, of this symbol alphabet for, um, as you increase the number of points. Okay, so let me just quickly uh, give you an example. Suppose you, you know, what, what is the symbol alphabet and what's the amplitude? So 
So, so suppose you are um, looking to, at two loop MHV amplitudes for six and seven points. So for um, six points, what's the symbol alphabet? It's just given by Pluca coordinates on GR for six. Okay, so for um, seven points, you have nothing but Pluca coordinates. So you have um, 35 Pluca coordinates um, uh, there. Plus you have these 14 other coordinates, which are seven cyclic images of these two uh, uh, expressions. So both of these are just some quadratic, so, so, so now quite some quadratic functions of Pluca coordinates start appearing. And if you were interested in what, you know, the actual function is, so, you know, you are two loops, so you want to have weight four. So it will be Lee four of all these various uh, brackets. And at seven points, you have, you know, a more complicated uh, function called Lee two two. And again, you, as you can see here, a more complicated um, uh, simple letters uh, start appearing. So, but the thing to remember is, with, so six, uh, points uh, alphabet is given by the 15 letters and seven point alphabet is given by the 14, these 49 letters. So these, so, so where does this come from? This comes from some amplitude computations, okay? So, so far, this is all, you know, you take your amplitude, you do some computation and that's the result. So I'm, I'm just telling you the final result. So what we'd like, the question uh, I'm interested in and, you know, um, we are interested in if there is an independent mathematical description of these symbol letters. Okay, so for uh, six and seven points, it's been well known for some time uh, that uh, the answer to this question is yes. And indeed, these letters could be described by cluster algebras. So let me have a quick, quick, um, overview, quick reminder what these cluster algebras are. So, um, uh, so in particular, we observed that the symbol alphabets are given by the subsets of the cluster coordinates of something called Grassmannian cluster algebra, GR4N. So what, what's um, quickly a cluster algebra? So uh, it's defined by two things. It's defined, first you wanna have uh, an initial quiver that's fixed by the type of algebra you are talking about. So this is how it looks like for GR4N. And number two, you wanna specify certain mutation rule. So given initial quiver, there's a certain rule, which, um, you know, depending on how the arrows are connected in the quiver. So you have this mutation rule and uh, it produces for you, so you take each coordinate, you apply this mutation rule, you produce for each coordinate a new coordinate, a prime coordinate, and uh, so on. Uh, and um, it produces you what's known cluster coordinates. So it's a very well-defined procedure. Uh, now these, so, so, so well, why we're here. So these cluster algebras were invented uh, about 20 years ago by Fomin and Zilibinsky. And uh, it's an active area in mathematics. They appear in other um, areas, etc. But if you are not familiar with this, uh, I would recommend uh, you can just Google cluster algebra portal and it contains everything you wanted uh, to know. Okay, so for example, since I've been uh, giving kind of baby, baby examples of six and sevens, so here are cluster coordinates for six and seven point amplitudes. So we forget the amplitudes, we just open uh, math. Um, paper, and we say, okay, so what's the, the cluster coordinates for six and seven uh, points? Uh, and uh, okay, so there, there we are. So here, remember the initial quiver was like something like three by n minus five. So the initial quiver, ignore the, the um, coordinates in the box, just something like this. So, so what I taught you, so that's the initial quiver. Now you want to mutate and produce new coordinates. So if you mutate on this node, you get this quiver and so, so on. So in this process continues. So until you get, so for this case, you get 14 quivers and you exactly reproduce 15 cluster coordinates. So for seven points, you know, you start with a different initial quiver and there are, you know, uh, more quivers. And then the, the um, nice thing is that uh, you, you look at uh, what cluster coordinates you produce and you get exactly the symbol letters that we obtained from, from our amplitudes computations. So 
this is very cool that there is a mathematical constructions that you know mathematicians studied that appears in n equals four young mills theory okay so great so this has been what i've just explained has been known for uh, a long time and um uh, it's nice but we would like to go further so what's what's what's, what's happening recently okay so uh well it it turns out that the new new features start arising as you increase the number of points. So first of all, these cluster algebras become infinite when n is greater than seven. And second of all, that as I said, the amplitude computations have been done recently, and it turns out that simple letters involve square roots. So previously, we only had quadratic functions of these fluke coordinates. So now, uh, just to, to 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 flush it out, so so we you, you know the six and sevens were very very easy symbol letters but as you go to eight this become quite more complicated so th there are like you know these rational letters which are at most quadratic and cubic functions of bloopers but then there are also letters involving square roots okay so these are the eight point computations and these are the nine point computations of just these letters so just these letters are not as you know simple to explain and these were done by song he and his group, okay? So what we'd like to do now, we'd like to see, similar to our six and seven point examples, we would like to see if there is some mathematical description of, of these two slides. So very simple, you know, these are the letters, can we describe them in a, you know, previously we just said, okay, these are classic orders for GR46 and GR47. Okay, so that's the question. Okay, so let me just have a glass of water. Okay, so the question, so so th so that's um, uh, 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 that's that's kind of we are moving on to more recent developments, and there's been several approaches to answer this question, and uh, starting maybe um, in the last year and a half. So there's been uh, I will flush basically a slide for first two. There's been an approach using tropical geometry uh, by uh, James Drummond uh, and others. There's an approach I'm sure you've heard from Nima uh, uh, using dual polytops explaining these features. Um, but I'm, I'll try to focus a little bit more on uh, our approach using platygraphs and tensor diagrams to describe them. And finally, there's also an approach by actually Henrietta student using scattering diagrams. So very good. Actually, in view, Henrietta, how much time do I have? You have about six minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, basically skip the tropical geometry and dual polytops and just tell you like a couple, like three minutes per, per, um, per approach, uh, now that I've explained uh, the problem. So um, how can we get these, uh, uh, you know, symbol letters? Well, we can get them from Plavi graphs. So it's been known for uh, a long some time that the building blocks of uh, young, these n equals four amplitudes could be a young unit variance, which are described by these integrals, where the matrix in this integral is parametrizes a cell of positive Grassmannian. Now these cells are in correspondence with Plavi graph. So that's an example of a Plavi graph. And so our strategy is very simple. We start with a Plavi graph and then we solve uh, this delta function CZ so there's this associated to Plavi graph, there's a C, and then compare with known symbol letters. So very, very simple way to try to produce it. So here's an example. So let's let's go back to six points. So here's a Plavi graph for six points. You write your, your C matrix, you solve for the face variables in a given way, and, and you start producing uh, the letters. So in this way, we could go go and draw you know, some simple things uh, for six and seven points and produce exactly this symbol alphabet. So we have a mathematical construction describing these letters. So the interesting thing, of course, is try to do it for something, uh, for some of these um, uh, square roots. So indeed, you know, you take the simplest eight point um, graphs and you can get uh, the square roots. So I guess we were very excited about such simple ways, you know, of, of getting those square roots. But unfortunately, I mean, but but then that turned into a, a little program that, um, you know, we had to write paper what, number one, number two, and number three, because if you look at, so you, you don't want to just compute uh, algebraic letters. You also want to, you know, here there's some rational letters. So it turns out that that there's some subtleties that in, in, in order to, 
uh, produce the rational letters, you have to allow some non plabic matrices. Okay, so, uh, but the upshot of this is that we were able to identify a set of graphs that reproduce all known eight and nine point symbol alphabet. So the two slides that I showed you. However, we don't have yet a theory explaining the pattern uh, of which cells are associated to which symbol letters observed in amplitude. So what, what we're doing is like some providing some phenological data in hope that future work will shed more light on this interesting pro problem. So now let me spend two more minutes um, about um, uh, discussing a second approach that to, to the same problem that um, wrote another paper about. So uh, there's something else uh, interesting. So, so, so cluster, cluster algebra literature is a very um, broad subject. So it turns out those cluster variables can be represented by tens of diagrams who were um, uh, discussed, uh, who were invented by Fomin and Pilavsky in 2016. And to each uh, uh, tensor di diagram, one can associate a tensor invariant. So these are, I've just, you know, I'm not going to introduce tensor diagrams here, but I've just written some examples and they're tensor invariants. Um, so the, Fomin and Pilavsky proved, um, uh, Fomin and Pilavsky conjectured that a planar tensor diagram is upright. Um, I'm sorry. So they conjectured that for an algorizable tensor, for, for an algorizable web, the tensor invariant is a cluster variable. So uh, a web is upright if it can be turned into a tree diagram using some Stein relation. So um, I don't want to go in uh, great details in, in here. So, but using these techniques, we can obviously produce all the uh, rational letters. Now it gets more interesting uh, with the square root. Basically, we, we have a proposal to look at the webs that can be reduced uh, to one in a loop. And um, then we can assign to it a certain web series using some rules. So here is a um, tensor di diagram with one, uh, with one in a loop. And then we show, so, so there's some rules. How do you write down this W? So then we uh, showed that you can um, uh, you can uh, sum this, and then the, at the end the series takes the following form, where the poles of this expression are exactly the square roots that appear in symbol alphabet for eight and nine points. Okay, so I, I um, you know, I could give a whole lecture series on just this. But I hope what I try to do here, I just try to give you a flavor of kind of things we have been thinking about and kind of mathematical constructions that uh, that appear in um, in this uh, um, n equals four Young Mills theory amplitudes. So with this, I'm going to conclude. Uh, so th that's my concluding slide. Uh, so symbol alphabet uh, of n equals four Young Mills amplitudes is described by the Grassmannian cluster algebras for six and seven points. Now, starting at eight points, one needs a mechanism producing the finite subsets in this cluster algebras and also a mechanism to produce the square roots. There's been some interesting um, uh, approaches, uh, proposals to, uh, to study these. And what we've done, we've studied candidate mechanisms coming from plavi graphs and from tensor diagrams to address this problem. So um, looking further, so indeed, I mean, we're doing this uh, very phenologically, you know, example by example, it certainly would be nice to have, uh, to do it more systematically. Moreover, there is some relation between plavi graphs and tensor diagrams, which uh, we don't honestly understand very well, but it would be nice to understand the relation between all these different approaches. Um, finally, I just focused on how do we know the symbol alphabet, but of course then there's some, a lot of activity also, you know, how you uh, write down the cluster functions, which correspond to the final amplitude. And uh, finally, of course, a lot of what I said was special to n equals four Young Mills theory. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of uh, the tools and methods that that we use for n equals four have been applied to you know computing some of the integrals that um, that are uh, useful for uh, um, PCD. And moreover, there were several papers recently also um, observing cluster structure 
in uh, just Feynman integrals. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Let's see if there are any questions. So, so I have one. So you, you gave a few slides ago the list of five different approaches. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the, on the strengths of each of each approaches and, and maybe how they complement each other. Okay, so, um, right. So first there is a tropical geometry approach. So by, by James et al. So there they get exactly the symbol letters for eight points. And uh, recently there was a paper by Jovis Papathanasi et al. generalizing that for um, uh, nine points. Then there's an approach uh, by Nima where they find evidence for the type of square roots, but they don't produce exactly the letters. Moreover, the method of phrase et al. is a, is a more complicated one. Um, you know, I, I, I like flabby graphs the best. So, so that's what I will say. And Freddie has a question. Yes, I also agree that play with graphs are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, my question, my, my question is, uh, if you can, if you can say a little bit, uh, I, I, try, I try to go through your papers and 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 realize that uh, you use this generalized Mandelstam invariance and so on. I mean, how how do they enter in the in the story? Um, I couldn't. Uh, you you mean, I mean the? This, the uh, I mean, they 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 are not in your in your in your slides, but. Uh, um, in, in your paper, you have some this this generalized Mandelstam invariants that depend on several indices and the axes. Uh, you mean you talk about tensor diagram paper? Yeah, or? the axes. Yeah, the axes. Yeah, I, we were just discussing that maybe we didn't have to even include include those. So yeah. Oh, I see. So okay. I I I mean uh, yeah, if we were to write this paper again, I think we would. Um, you know, I don't know if Lichian is on call here, so he likes them, but I, 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 I would formulate, why would we write that paper in the way I uh, just presented it? I see. Okay. No problem. So I think that time is up, so we should turn over to the following discussion, and hopefully there'll be more discussions of cluster algebras on Slack. So let's thank Anastasia and Gonkao again. Thank you very much. So, uh, so yeah, let's resume uh, the discussion. So very short reminder about these discussions. Uh, turn on your camera if you can, if your internet allows, and uh, if you are participating, it's much better to, to feel at home. Um, <clears throat> I know that Freddie has a little bit worse internet connection, so he will not uh, turn on his camera while giving his presentation, but then he will. And, um, and then in the last 30 minutes, I do encourage people to raise their hands. And as usual, I'll give priority to, to people that have not spoken, spoken yet. And, um, and do continue on, on Slack afterwards. Someone also asked me if the, um, if the chats are being uh, recorded because there are often lots of interesting discussions going on in parallel uh, in the chat. The answer is no. I re we realized uh, yesterday we tried to find, but it's not recorded. That's the bad news. The good news is that it's very easy to download them. So you can just, but okay, <laughs> only in the future, <laughs> not for the past ones. But uh, you can just, uh, before you leave the meeting, uh, download the chat. So, it, but uh, yeah, otherwise we don't want to post them. We don't want to put them on YouTube. We want to keep it very informal, of course, but uh, if you feel like there are good points and you want that information, feel free to cast them off. Sorry, just a okay. correction. Sorry, but you have to click save chat. So in the chat feature, anybody can save the chat. So you that's have to I, click that and then it will save your chat. No, well, that's what I said. Yeah, you can download the chat. Save, download, it's the same, right? Yeah, you can save the chat. So yeah, so without further ado, let's uh, pass over to the first 20 minutes for preparation for the this informal discussion. So Freddie, please. Okay, thank you very much, Pedro. And thanks to all the organizers for giving us the opportunity to lead this discussion session on worksheet approaches to field theory amplitudes. So let me start by um, explaining something that we are all familiar with, and which is the fact that a string theory contains quantum field theory amplitudes. So as very well explained by Mangano and Park in this very nice review in 1999, a string theory amplitudes in the zero slope limit reproduces 
the young Mills amplitudes on the mass shell. And this is due to a miraculous formula, which is the Cova Nielsen formula, which is, was already introduced in 1969. So this is, uh, this is something uh, very, very well understood. Now, let me present what the formula looks like. It's an incredibly compact formula that is obtained by computing a correlation function uh, of vertex operators. So let me notice, uh, le let me explain a couple of things about this formula. This is an integral over the modular space of order points on the boundary of a disk. And it depends on dimensionless Mandelstam invariance. These are combinations that are dimensionless, and that's very important. The reason is that quantum field theory amplitudes arise when all such invariants are sent to zero, because we send alpha prime to zero. In other words, we are tricking the modular space, we are telling the modular space that we are doing a multi-factorization loop. Now, of course, Feynman diagrams emerge from the boundaries of the modular space, and they are functions of dimension-full Mandelstam invariants, the pi dot pj. They are not vanishing because internal states in those Feynman diagrams are generically offshore. Very good. But then this begs the question, is there a way to use the boundary of the modular space only and only if the quantum field theory amplitude needs to go to the boundary? So in order to answer that question, we have to connect the space of kinematic invariance for the scattering of M massless particles to the modular space of the M puncture, or say the modular space of M puncture spheres. So here I'm showing the four particle case or the four puncture case. And the goal will be to map a generic point in the kinematic space to a generic point on the modular space and map and go to the boundary of the modular space where the sphere factorizes into two only when, the, when we approach the regions in kinematic space where we should develop a singularity. In other words, when we have factorization. Well, it turns out that it's possible to do that. And the way to do it is, known, is now known as the scattering equations. And the ingredients are very simple. We start with a Morse function on the modular space that is constructed from the kinematic invariance, the Mandelstam invariance, the natural SL2C coordinates on the space. And these coordinates are constructed using the homogeneous coordinates for the points on CP1. But if we go to inhomogeneous coordinates, we can find the conditions for computing the critical functions of this uh, Morse function, the critical points of this Morse function. And those are what are known as the scattering equations. Now, these are the equations that link the kinematic space to the modular space in such a way that you only go to the boundary when it's needed. It turns out that these equations have a very long history, starting in say, at least in 1972. Now, in 2013, together with Song He and Ellis Yuan, we found a way to use these scattering equations to compute or to provide formulas for three, for three scattering in any number of dimensions for a variety of theories. And amplitudes are computed as integrals over the modular space. But of course, these integrals are now localized to the solutions of the scattering equations. And there are n minus three factorial such points. So this integral is nothing but a sum. So far, all known integrants can be separated into two parts, each of which has the same SL2C transformation. And traditionally, they are called left and right. The important thing is that they have no poles in kinematic invariance. In other words, all poles are generated and controlled by the scattering equations. So here I'm just going to show you very quickly um, a table with some of the theories that were first constructed. In fact, the first ones were here, Einstein gravity, Young Mills, and something that is called the bijoin scalar theory. And putting these together, you find that, that formulas like the KLT relations follow from simple linear algebra. Now, I also wanted to show you these two theories here because at the time they were constructed using the CHY formulation and they were new theories. So in other words, this was a method for discovering new theories. The special Galilean is something that has received a lot of attention and this theory still hasn't been, hasn't been found to have, uh, not even the Lagrangian has been found. So we have the S matrix, but not the Lagrangian. Now, we're going to understand all this, hopefully, uh, by the time we get to Lionel's part, where he's gonna talk about the ambit twister string construction and the world shift construction that leads to all these formulas. But in order to understand why twisters and why string come together, let's take a, a little trip in down in history and let's go back to 1986, when Park and Taylor propose a miraculously simple formula for three gluon amplitudes when you have two negative helicity gluons and the rest are plus. 
If you haven't seen this formula, you have to go and, and find it. Two years later, Naive interprets the part Taylor formula as a 2D correlation function of fermions on CP1. So we have to wait, we had to wait until 2003 when Witten introduces twister string theory, which is a string theory on twister space which computes perturbative n equals four super Jamil's amplitudes using maps from CP1 to super twister space CP3 slash four. And these maps could be connected or disconnected. And the integrals over the model space localized. So they are not integrals, but they are localized. Soon after, Berkowitz proposes an open string formulation. Now, in 2004, just a year later, Royman, Spratling, and Volovich proposed that connected contributions compute all three level amplitudes. And then we ended up with a picture where the connected contributions con compute everything. Also, the disconnected ones can compute everything. But today, we're only going to focus on, on the connected contributions. And that's why I'm now showing you what is now known as the Witten RSV formulation, which is also a beautifully compact formula that encodes all amplitudes in n equals four super -yamians. Now let's continue with our historical review. In 2012, Hodges proposes a miraculously simple formula for three, gra for three graviton amplitudes with two negative helicity uh, gravitons and the rest plus. Again, if you haven't seen this formula, you should go and find it. Um, it didn't take that long. For, for a Witten-like formula for n equals eight supergravity to come out. And this immediately begged the question, are these formulations exclusive, exclusive to n equals uh, to four dimensions and to uh, maximally supersymmetric theories? After all, we had n equals four super Mills, and here we have n equals eight supergravity. And the answer, of course, I already gave it to you. The answer is no, because in 2013, the CHY formulation provide a generalization and then the worksheet models as ambi twister strings came. So this is going to be discussed in Linus part. But since I still have a few minutes, maybe two minutes, um, let me discuss some recent developments. And some of these developments are so recent that this happened just less than a week ago. So there was the, the, a paper explaining how to compute uh, or how to define cosmological scattering equations for computing correlation functions in the Sitter space. Just a year, a, year, a year ago, we had the scattering equations on ADS, also how to compute correlation functions in any space-time dimension. I should also mention that intersection theory is something that happened uh, three years ago, but it has grown into a whole program. This is a way of connecting a string theory and the CHY formalism that beautifully it serves as an umbrella for, for, for both things. And not only that, it generalizes to applications in Feynman integrals and also in phenomenology. Of course, there are connections to celestial amplitudes. After all, we also have a CP1 here. But since we have a whole, a whole session on, on Friday, I'm going to postpone, I'm going to leave this for discussion, so I'll postpone it until Friday. Last but not least, I would like to mention something about the scattering equations on, on, on higher dimensional projective spaces. And the reason I think this is exciting is that it leads to a notion of generalized Feynman diagrams, worksheet, particles, and strings. So what I'm showing here is nothing but a dual representation of a five-point boring five-cube Feynman diagram that we are learning in high school. That depends on the high school. But um, it has a dual description in terms of what is known as a collection or as an array of uh, Feynman diagrams with one less particle each. So in a sense, this is some sort of an ensemble of different, of, of different Feynman diagrams that satisfies some, some particular consistency condition that allows them to be dual to these particular Feynman diagrams. Now, when you go to... to higher points, you step into an alien world where this duality doesn't work anymore. So you step into an alien world where factorization uh, and locality become things that are, that, are not, uh, that are not very well understood, okay? So with this, I want to say only that we have experts from each group waiting in the audience for your questions. So please, after Lionel's uh, part, come and, and participate because they are all standing by. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank Freddy for a beautiful introduction, which was perfectly on time. Thank you. And, um, and uh, let's move on to Lionel. Uh, you, you are muted, Lionel. Sorry. Uh, Very good. Hi. So thank you. Um, and and thank, thanks to the organizers for this sadly only virtual visit to uh, Brazil. Um, and thank you, Freddie, for an excellent introduction that leaves me with um, uh, a, a fantastic starting point for what I have to say. So, so here I want to talk about uh, work which um, uh, most immediately there's work between uh, groups based in Oxford and in Cambridge, uh, so the Cambridge group led by David Skinner. And, um, uh, but, it, uh, but, but there's also been a lot of uh, wonderful collaboration with Brazil and of course building on uh, uh, CHY and uh, the, the groups in perimeter and but then before that uh, the work on the twister string. So it, I'm talking about ambi twister strings, and this is meant to be the theory that underpins the uh, the um, uh, formally that Freddie was just uh, beautifully explaining. And uh, so, so the, the word here that's unfamiliar then is going to be ambi twister space. The um, uh, so what is ambi twister space? It's a space of um, complex light rays. So that is to say, we complexify space time. And so this, this MD, which is meant to be a D-dimensional spacetime here, uh, is, is to be thought of as complexified. Uh, so it's CD, not RD. And, um, uh, but it's meant to be a Minkowski space with a metric and a light cone and such like. And it could be curved as well. It could be a complexification of a curved uh, spacetime. And um, uh, uh, the idea is that in fact, the um, uh, physical fields, physical structures in spacetime uh, are encoded into just the uh, global complex geometry of ambi twister space. So, um, it, in fact, it's easiest to describe that for the gravitational field itself. So, you can imagine just you take a curved complex space time and you, you can just uh, write down with some assumptions it's a space of complex null geodesics. And inside that space of complex null geodesics, you will have the space of light rays through each point. So this capital X here is meant to be the um, uh, light cone of the point X, and capital X prime is meant to be the light cone of the point X prime. And if you think about this projectively, these are compact complex manifolds, and they have a moduli space, and that moduli space simply gives back space time. It determines space time, and incidence then uh, between X and X prime determines the um, uh, light rays in the space time. So you can reconstruct the conformal structure and with a bit more work, maybe a bit more, uh, maybe the full metric. So this was really based on uh, 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 earlier ideas to do with Roger, Pe uh, coming from Roger Penrose's nonlinear graviton and work on Yang Mills by Wiss and Eisenberg and, and, and so on, who are trying to extend uh, the original twister ideas of Penrose to non self dual spaces. Anyway, so the upshot is that the global complex structure of ambitwister space determines the space time uh, together with its metric or conformal structure. And uh, furthermore, the Penrose transform, which has been developed, encodes uh, space time fields in terms of uh, cohomology on this ambitwister space. So everything is complex analytic. So um, uh, ambi twister strings then are going to have this uh, ambi twister space, the space of complex null geodesics, as its target space. And um, uh, the vertex operators of the ambi twister string theory are then going to be built out of the cohomology classes um, uh, uh, on ambi twister space that uh, encode the space time fields. And um, uh, uh, one of the things that some um, uh, it, it's remarkable about this, so I, I'll, I'll give an example of this uh, in the next slide, but one of the things that's remarkable about this is that you can somehow write down models which parallel all of the favorite world line uh, theories that one uses in a first course in string theory to, um, uh, you know, usually in a first course in string theory, you start with a world line theory, then you fasten out your world line. Well, uh, we can do a similar game here in ambi twister strings. You can start off with an RNS model, Green Schwartz, Pure Spinner, uh, the Ferber, Twister, model and so on. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, and it seems to be the case that you just wave the magic wrong wand of string theory over these things, but in this holomorphic world, 
And you robustly seem to get endpoint field theory amplitudes, uh, alpha prime equals zero in this story. And um, uh, uh, it gives them in the form of the world sheet formally that we've just been told about the uh, you know, RSV, W, Shazoo Skinner, SCHY, and so on. So just to give the most elementary example then, uh, if you write down your uh, world line, um, massless world line action in first order form, what you do is you, you just replace D by D uh, affine parameter by a D bar operator on a Re Riemann surface sigma. And um, you have a, maybe a Lagrange multiplier to make that sure the world line is null. And um, you complexify space time and because the field equation is going to be that d bar x equals zero, so it has to be complex to have solutions. You get, uh, uh, you quantize, you get BRST operator. Criticality gives you a critical dimension, much as in conventional string theory, and you compute amplitudes with vertex operators, much as you do as a correlation function of vertex operators, as much as you do in conventional string theory. And um, uh, uh, the, the, the key sort of intriguing thing here is that the, just the vertex operator descent gives rise to the Penrose transform, and this gives rise to the scattering equations that Freddie was telling us about. So, uh, and you also get a double copy involved. So you have, in general, we add some further supersymmetry and world sheet matter to get the uh, amplitude formally. And uh, we have to have a left and a right world sheet matter, and our vertex operators have VL, VR, and the um, scattering equations delta function. So this is, um, and then with different choices of world sheet matter, SL and SR here, uh, uh, we can get that whole range of uh, formulae that uh, Freddie was telling us about, and in a nice double copy array. And uh, this is now kind of atomistic in terms of the uh, vertex operators that um, uh, uh, decompose uh, uh, into left and right parts, the correlators then decompose into left and right parts and so on. The, um, uh, the remarkable thing, so these are all the CHY formulas. They originally appeared in the second round, uh, dirac born infers and all those Galileans and so on. But these series then have uh, extra sectors. So for example, the biojoint scalar has a gravitational sector. The Einstein one has Raymond sectors. And this is really a story about type 2B supergravity in, in 10 dimensions in this, um, or 2A or 2B supergravity in 10 dimensions, this Einstein formula. We don't need to use the RNS model, we can use other models. And so we can do twistorial models and then they manifest as supersymmetry perfectly when you get, we get the polarized scattering equations. The other thing that you can do with the string approach is you can just follow this, uh, the, the ambitwist string approach is you can try to extend the CHY formally to, to loops. And we've just followed the standard sort of routine that you'd expect in string theory. So you, for example, you work on a torus uh, to do one loop, and um, uh, you discover that the scattering equations uh, can be extended to fix the moduli. So, so, so you, you, we get um, fixed points inside this kind of uh, plane uh, in, in, inside the, uh, 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 the, the, the fundamental domain for the moduli. Um, now, you might have thought that it's a bit extravagant to have all these elliptic functions for um, uh, 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 loop integrands, which um, uh, are going to be, in some sense, rational functions of the loop momenta. And uh, uh, what you discover is you can actually do an integration by parts to um, uh, uh, get all of these um, contributions from these uh, solutions to scattering equation in the fundamental domain and just concentrate them all on the nodal sphere uh, Q, uh, at tau equals I infinity. And then you can get sort of purely rational formulae again. And this is work that's been, uh, uh, well, it's a group of us started this, but then the, um, this has been followed through in rather dramatic form to Genus 3 most recently by Yvonne Guy and two Ricardos. And uh, uh, what they discover is a fantastic interplay with the true string, so to speak, uh, um, correlation functions, the field theory amplitude, and lots of sort of stepping stones in between. And uh, I can't really do justice to this, but I hope one of them, hope maybe Yvonne is in the audience, people are curious about this. I think uh, Oliver is gonna talk about this a bit tomorrow anyway. Lionel, you are almost out of time. Okay, so um, uh, uh, further directions. The, uh, um, the other thing you can do is you can take the models into curved space. You can do amplitudes on strong backgrounds. 
And uh, uh, so this is one thing I've been developing with Tim Adamo and friends, uh, Atul Sharma. Uh, you can get fully nonlinear connections to the space-time action, at least in special cases of amplitudes. And this has actually led uh, Atul Sharma to get a, a, a recent sort of breakthrough is to get a twister action now for Einstein gravity. And this feeds back to something that Freddie briefly mentioned, which is the disconnected formalism. There's much work on ADS, CFT, and holography. Uh, uh, models in the bulk, uh, models in the boundary, which is in some sense, well, I don't really know how the Gabardiel and Gopakumar fits in with this. I don't quite know what's going on there. And there's a celestial story as well. There's a lot, lot of work on this. Um, I mentioned the twistorial models in different dimensions. There's Alpha Brown goes to zero is still actually deeply uh, puzzling. Why does is there any relation to the conventional string where alpha prime goes to zero? There's just still something we don't really know. And this unreasonable robustness is something, you know, the, the bosonic model I, we thought was just producing a pile of junk for its gravity amplitudes. And then uh, Thales and friends, um, Henrik, sort of uh, explain how it is that it's producing this peculiar sixth order bit theory. So why is it that any old junky theory, which who's, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, Got all sorts of anomalies and everything. Uh, uh, why is that giving rise to a, a, a at least a coherent classical field theory? Uh, that, that's something that I, I really don't understand. The connections to maths, just very briefly, work with Hadley Frost and Carlos Mafra, Lee polynomials, KLT, color kinematics duality, just tying in with moduli spaces. Uh, so there's a lot of useful things in cluster algebras of surface type and so on, uh, somehow leading to connections with other areas of amplitude law. So I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Lionel and Freddie. So let me emphasize that one thing that we have been asking all the speakers uh, of these discussions to do, so please do take advantage of that, is to send us the slides beforehand. And by the way, if you are one of the few future speakers, do send us your slides as soon as possible. So do check on the slides beforehand so that to prime you and to think of questions to ask. And uh, I would encourage people to also check them out now. Uh, they have beautiful uh, last slides with questions and ideas of things to ask and uh, uh, topics to explore. So uh, they are on the website. And uh, let's open. I will first look for people that have not yet asked questions or spoken before. There is a question from uh, Charles Wang. Charles, do you want to ask your question out loud or? Yes, so I, I guess that the usual answer to this in, in the world of twister theory, uh, there are two answers to that really. One, well, one, is, one is, sorry. Oh, sorry, the, the question is what happens if the manifold can't be analytically continued at, such as if it has a bump function or something. Oh. And um, uh, uh, so, so, so there are two answers to this. First of all, you could approximate any smooth function with an analytic function. But the second answer is, you know, and, and analysts are not very happy with that as an answer. And what actually tends to happen is that your, your complex uh, thickening tends to shrink down to what's known as a CR manifold. And by the time you're down to a CR manifold, then you can do complex analysis on that, but with some, uh, with various, um, uh, caveats, but it's a rich theory and it very much echoes the fully um, uh, analytic theory. And you can do the same things anyway. Uh, Nathan? You, so you made a comment at the end about bosonic gravity theory that you said you could make sense out of it. Can you say in what sense you can make sense out of it? Ah, well, okay. So, uh, I mean, this is a terrible theory. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, 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 what, what was remarkable? So, 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 when we first wrote down the bosonic thrit, string, uh, ambi twister string, it had a gravity sector, and we wrote down amplitudes, but they looked like a pile of junk, to be honest. And we didn't really think that they corresponded to anything of any interest. And then um, Henrik and Thales, I can't remember who they all were. Uh, um, sort of actually explained how it was that these that, that these do come from a higher order gravity theory, which um, in the heterotic case can, uh, uh, agrees with the um, conformal 
uh, gravity that Ewan's Ed Ritten found in four dimensions for the original twister string. Uh, and, and then the bosonic case, it's a uh, sixth order. Um, so these are, of course, are listed with ghosts, and people hate these theories as, as quantum theories, but as a, just a set of differential equations, they, uh, some classical theory, they, 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 they make some sense. Okay, thanks. As usual, if you want to follow up on a particular point, uh, uh, wave your hand. I would like to, uh, I don't see anyone. I would like to hear a little bit about the status of ADS. Well, what do we know about, uh, what's the status of amplitudes in ADS? Well, I, I, ADS, we, we could also, we, we, we could also have uh, the sitter as well. So it would be nice if, uh, if, if they could all tell us a little bit uh, about what the status is and, and how things work out. I mean, I sent an email to David saying that we would back the question over it back that question over to him if he turns up. <laughs> but I'm not sure if David is there. I, can't, I haven't. I've seen many papers on scattering equations in ADS and some, uh, but they, they looked a bit. No, but Sebastian, Se Sebastian is here, so Sebastian. Yeah, yeah maybe ask, uh, maybe Sebastian's a good as good a person as anybody. Right, else. maybe yes. maybe I should comment on that. So, so first of all, these these models work in. Uh, position space, and there's basically two classes of models that have been proposed. Uh, one is basically treating ADS in arbitrary dimension as a, uh, a cosset space, and the other types of model, and this is the what uh, Roering and Skinner did, was to treat ADS free as a group manifold, perhaps ADS free cross as free or some other compact direction. So then it turns out that you can come up with, you can write some ambitwister-like actions on uh, either space. So it's some kind of a, uh, uh, analog of the, of the usual flat space uh, action, either on the, on, the, on the group manifold or on the coset. It turns out that the, at least the coset one turns out to be uh, anomalous. So there's the usual vial anomaly that, that we know from the flat space ambitwister string. Uh, but it turns out there's also some other more technical issues. Uh, we came up with a limit if you, uh, in which they disappear. So the limit that you have to consider is if the ratio of the string scale to the ADS scale or the sitter scale goes to zero, uh, then, the, then the model, the, the worksheet model sort of makes sense in arbitrary dimension. And of course, the, the one specifically in, in ADS3, the one of skinner Rurig, uh makes sense uh, then without that limit. Uh, so the I think the status is that nowadays we know how to, so people have written down sort of um, how to reproduce simple scalar within diagrams from this formalism. And then more recently, there's been work on how to also generalize this to say Yang Mills and make connections to things like um, color kinematics duality and so on in, in ADS. Would we expect to find some simplicity uh... Or some surprises when we deal with gluons or gravitons? And, uh... Yeah, I think, I think there's basically two separate questions. One is, can we write down CHY-like formula in ADS regardless of the model? And I think that would be more optimistic. The other type of question is, can we write a wall sheet model that, that does this? And I think there that you have to be more careful with, um, basically the answer to that, to your question is that in general, they mentioned we don't know the answer to this question. In ADS free crosses free, we, we do, and that's um, uh, that is known how to do it for I think both Yang Mills and pure gravity or super gravity in uh, certainly super gravity in ADS free crosses free. I mean, I, I could just quickly add that uh, uh, the original Casazzo Skinner formula has been extended to um, ADS and DeSisa. Um, but the status of that is slightly unclear. That's, that, that's not really quite a correlation function. It's, it, it's like an amplitude in, in, in the CISA is probably the best way of saying it because it, you've got the integral over the whole space from square minus the square plus in the CISA. So, so that's been worked on by a few of us over the years, by Tim and myself and others. Mitris has a very nice question in the chat. I Okay, so maybe, maybe someone... Sorry. Oh uh, no, I thought I thought that maybe someone can tell us a little bit about uh, the status of, of 
DS. So, so this uh, about this recent paper on the cosmological correlation. Oh, is anyone, is Umberto in the audience? Or Arthur? I couldn't find them in the... If and they if are, are, you can have their camera on after so many discussions, <laughs> so much effort. Shame on them. <laughs> Please. <laughs> While we wait don't for them, I, yeah, don't okay. be shy. There is a very nice question on the chat by Dimitris that I think Dimitris is trying to move to a more quiet place to ask the question. Or do you want me to ask it? <laughs> if you can unmute yourself, Dimitris. I mean, I can read yes, it. I think, I think here it's. I think here it might be quieter temporarily. <laughs> So my question is, does the non-holomorphically split nature of the hygienist moduli space, uh, as described by Donagi and Witten, for example, affect the current formulation of the ambitwister string, or are these subtleties somehow avoided, perhaps due to their only being contributions from the boundary of moduli space? Um, I, I was just looking for uh, Yvonne, but she's not here. Um, but um, uh, I, th I think the, the short answer to that is, is that in the ambitwister string, the um, uh, uh, the supersymmetric world sheet is degenerate, and and so, and so the non-splitness is not something that actually happens. Uh, it's a peculiar degeneration. So the supersymmetry does not square to give you the derivative on the um, world sheet, and so therefore uh, the, the the moduli space uh, in the ambitwister space splits. Uh, the actual uh, the the actual world sheet correlator is very closely related to the conventional string one, but it's not the same. And uh, Oliver is probably the expert on that particular story. Um, and I don't know if he'll talk about that tomorrow or, or if, if he, well, anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Is it the case that there is an underlying super Riemann surface? Or well, even there's, a there's, surface to start with? The, the, so the supersymmetry on the Riemann surface in the RNS uh, ambitwister string is, as I say, degenerate. So, so, so the kind of um, uh, uh, it, it doesn't square to give you the straightforward derivative on the world sheet in the way it does in the conventional. Ah, ah. And, and so, therefore, the moduli space uh, splits. Uh, but that's not to say that there isn't a very detailed and close correspondence between the moduli space. I, 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 Oliver, well, I say Oliver deals with the pure spinner string, which doesn't have this issue. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was calling, and Nathan is very, very discreetly, but he's waving. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, maybe Nathan, yeah, sorry. I'm not happy with the loop. I think Lionel knows. I'm not happy with the loop computations in the ambitwister string. Essentially, I don't think you understand how to integrate over the moduli. So I, I honestly don't think you can say anything until you know how to integrate over the moduli. I mean, you have these complex integrals that I don't think make sense. I, I mean, I know that actually the other person who has thought very deeply about this is Piotr. Uh, oh, he's here. Okay. Uh, so, so we could sort of, I don't know if he's listening. Yeah, I mean, Piotr and I have debates about this, and I absolutely agree with you that it's not a settled subject. And uh, I, I, I think of Piotr as somebody who's thought about it more deeply than I have. So if he's prepared to say something, that would be great. Yeah, Piotr, yeah, please. I can just be, just, I, I don't have anything, unfortunately, I don't have anything super precise or very conclusive to say. Uh, it's just that there is one thing that I think really uh, remains ununderstood is the, the prescription for the zero mode integral for the loop moment, for the momentum field, for the loop momentum. And that um, is tied to the choice of uh, integration cycle and which solutions you gotta pick for the scattering equation. And I think that's still an open, an open problem and that the rest of the quantization and determining the, the, the moduli, et cetera, has been done quite neatly, I think. Uh, but uh, the zero mod part is uh, still an open question, I would say. But I don't have, the, the loop momentum is really the thing that doesn't, that comes in a bizarre manner. I'm happy to agree with all of that. <laughs> there is a question uh, from uh, Marcus Pradlin wrote me in the chat privately, but is saying that, uh, asking basically the same question that Nathan is also asking uh, in the chat. Uh, if you someone could comment about uh, how the MB twister alpha prime to infinity is related to high energy scattering in string theory. Is it a coincidence? Is a, 
or is there a relation? Maybe Freddie or Lionel could say something about it. Yeah, I think I, I think Sebastian should be the, uh, because uh, that that is, is precisely that question that was uh, nicely putting into context with intersection theory. Mm. Okay, very good. Uh, right, so maybe this, in my opinion, it seems very much like a coincidence. Let me actually emphasize uh, something that we might have seen last week, uh, the difference between the scattering equations and the critical point conditions in the uh, conventional string. So the scattering equations are the ones that have a sort of finite number of solutions because they're defined on the moduli space. And as we've seen, uh, as we've seen last week, in order to correctly uh, talk about asymptotics in the tra traditional string when you take alpha prime to infinity, you have to really uh, uh, upgrade the moduli space to the covering space, sorry, upgrade the, the Morse function to the uh, covering space of the moduli space. And this is how you see the, 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 the critical point conditions really have infinite number of solutions. And this was, this was the thing that, uh, had to be true in order to be consistent with the fact that uh, there's a Stokes phenomenon as you study the high energy limit of strings. And it sort of leads to this small breakdown of our traditional intuition that the strings are supposed to be uh, uh, exponentially suppressed at high energy. Uh, uh, what really happens if, if you say, uh, analyze it in the physical channel is that you're supposed to include the, in, indeed you have the exponential, minus uh, the exponent minus the, the, the area of the string, but it's really supposed to be multiplied by some an infinite number of poles. That's how you see the resonant, the, the fact that the resonance is survive in the high energy limit. And the, this is a small breakdown of this uh, traditional intuition because it tells us that at arbitrary large energy at tree level, the uh, amplitude could be arbitrarily large. So it doesn't really decay. Now, of course, what has to happen is that once you start including higher genus corrections in traditional strings, it has to be that these infinite spikes, these in infinite peaks get resolved into uh, sort of bright Wigner-like distributions, right? Uh, and I think this sort of, I think it's a very interesting open question how this happens uh, sort of from technical standpoint is how there has to be some kind of resumation of saddle points at genus one that leads to this kind of uh, smoothing out of the peaks. And also I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, sort of more conceptual point to nail down, for example, what the width of those peaks is supposed, supposed to be, which would tell us about like the average width of the, of the strings uh, and, and so on. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done, especially at genus one to nail down the answers to such questions. I mean, I, I would just make this one small point, which is that, of course, that high energy scattering, it's only the one solution of the scattering equations that contributes, whereas, whereas of course, for these, all of these formulae, you need all of them. Right. Uh, Mohab? Yeah, hi, thanks. So this is a question for Leine, uh, hi Leine. So you mentioned this uh, new action by Sharma for, for gravity. So I guess uh, in twister space. So I guess this is a, a Plebansky type um, action. So uh, are you suggesting that this comes out of the ambient twister string um, in, any, in any simple way or, or do what you have indications of that? Or? It's a separate development in some sense. So it's more like the twister action that we had for Yang Mills years ago. And, uh, uh, and it correlates directly to the CSW, Freddie's uh, 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 disconnected version of twister string, which, which then has, you know, has non-local vertices, but it uh, has MHV vertices. So, but this, this action hasn't yet been pushed that far. Um, but it is, it is exactly built on your and uh, Chris's uh, uh, sort of Blavatsky-like action and lifted to twister space. And, it's, and, it, and it relates to, uh, I, I believe it relates to a new sigma model in twister space that we, we, we had, which is a different, different to the ambi-twister string in the sense it has a kind of holographic nature that you're looking at the space of null geodesics at infinity, not in the bulk. And uh, so, so it's a different connection with the space-time amplitudes from the ambi-twister string, but it's closely related. Andy? Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Um, 
No, you were unmuted and now you are muted. <laughs> you muted yourself when you started speaking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the question from um, the discussion a few minutes ago uh, about loop diagrams. So could somebody just clarify when, I mean, in general, we don't expect to have sensible loop diagrams in a theory that is not ultraviolet complete. Are some of these theories supposed to or hope to be ultraviolet complete? And when, where, and why should we expect these loop amplitudes to exist? Well, I think that the, the, the simple answer there is, is, is perhaps that um, the, the formally produced loop integrands and uh, 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 which we then fully expect to diverge. <laughs> so so uh, uh, for in, in, you, you know, for 10 dimensional supergravity or whatever. Um, so, so, so we're still, we're still actually sort of asking the question as to whether you can even get the standard field theory loop into grands, which would, will then diverge. I see, okay. Well, it's a, it's a dimension agnostic uh, loop integrand. Um, say, if you are interested in four dimensional N equal eight supergravity, where, well, we don't know whether UV divergences uh, begin, I think we can expect a sensible UV finite answer at low loop orders. Nathan, right here. I guess the N equals four superhang mills in principle, you could try to compute loop amplitude. So that, that at least that makes sense. Yes, and I guess what we'd hope is that you'd get the uh, loop into grand and that they, they well, actually, but you say it makes sense, but then you have the infrared divergences. So, so in fact, th there's always something bad. <laughs> um, Maybe we should talk a bit about about um, these uh, chiral or twisted strings that are the finite alpha prime uh, ancestors of ambitwister string and where alpha prime to infinity gives ambitwisters on the nose. So the set chiral strings are uh, related to conventional strings by a sign flip of alpha prime, at least in the right moving sector. So you change the notion of creation and annihilation operators in one of the chiral halves and this truncates you to finite spectrum when in the maximally supersymmetric case, only the master states survive. And I guess there's a great deal of computational control in the tree level amplitudes in these um, chiral strings where you get rational functions in uh, alpha prime, even in the bosonic model. Mm -hmm. So let me ask a very naive question in general about these twister strings. Is it true that these twister strings are normally engineered to match the amplitudes that we get, or do we sometimes get new insights uh, that were uh, unexpected from playing with these twister strings that we did not know before? My feeling, my impression was that there were some formulas, some determinants, and people create some twister string to reproduce some determinant. Or uh, is there a more constructive way of building and finding new theories and new amplitudes? Well, my, my claim would be that the, 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 the um, uh, I mean, what you describe is that absolutely what happens. Um, I mean, David and I were reverse engineering from Freddie's formulae, um, uh, and uh, and but then later you you can obtain new formulae. So, for example, the new sectors that you find, uh, like finding the Ramon sector, is something that 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 that's, um, uh, would have been hard to do from, from the formula itself. And of course, those amplitudes are as awkward to write down at multiparticle uh, level as they are in the conventional string. Uh, and also the twistorial models, I guess, were new formally. Uh, and, and that was where I refer to the robustness that, that you, you just write down a new uh, uh, representation of an ambitwister string and you end up with uh, new, new formulae, which you didn't really expect. Uh, Rajesh? Uh, hi, I, I had a sort of a general question. It's a little vague, um, but um, maybe uh, Leonel or um, Freddie can answer. Uh, uh, so it, 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 these um, ambitwister string theories, which have twister spaces that target space, how, how does locality in the um, actual space-time come 
come in, given that you're finding scattering matrix amplitudes of local theories, uh, and you have this large number of them. Uh, and given that ambit twister space is a very non-local encoding of ordinary space, do you have any sense for how, uh, how that's uh, somehow captured? Um, It's a good question. I, <laughs> I, I uh, but 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 I wish. Sorry, I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> sorry, uh, maybe Freddie's got something he could say. Uh, uh. No, I guess what I can say is that at least from the from the final from the final object. I mean, the, it's more or less in the same way that a string theory does it because. Uh, what you're relying on is that uh, the structure of the modular space is what does the magic. So, so the structure, so so the structure of singularities, factorization, all the all the all the all the properties that you really need are already there. In that, I mean, as I like to tell uh, sometimes students, I mean, if uh, if you if you had a mathematician friend uh, many years ago and you ask, look, is there any mathematical space that does this and that that factorizes like this? They would have said, well, yes, so we have it. And you have tried very hard to connect it to physics because you would know the answers that you need. Uh, so I think the, the answer is that it does it in the same way that a string theory amplitudes do it. But, but yeah, so, so, so I'm struggling because you see, so, uh, uh, so, so Fred is saying that as a property of the scattering equations. Uh, uh, that they have this beautiful property that they encode factorization. Uh, but I wish I could see that directly from, I, I, I think it may be that uh, uh, somehow the CFT of the ambitwister string knows about that factorization. I suppose that's where you might see it in the ambitwister string. Uh, Shota? Yeah, I, I had kind of a bit uh, technical question. So, uh, so I know like uh, in, equals for, in N equals 4 mills, you can also like write the action in twisted space. And I know there are also some works of N equals 4, well, Jan Mills action in ambit twisted space. But I think like uh, action in the ambit twisted space is not like uh, used as, comp not much used as compared to the action in the twisted space. And is it like, uh, is it used for or like, uh, what's the property? And What's the relation to ambitwista Borsi theory? I, I think I think uh, I, I would just say I, I don't I haven't managed to use the ambitwister action to do any non-trivial calculation beyond three points, tree level. Uh, so so I think the short answer is it's, it's it's sadly been a little bit useless. I mean it's a uh, um, yeah I, uh, I I mean I think it. What one can maybe hope that it relates to the ambitwister stream, but in the same way that sort of the churn it, it, it has a structure of a churn Simons action. So, so you could hope it relates to the ambitwister string in much the same way as churn Simons actions encode conventional string theories. But again, I don't think that's ever been made explicit. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is a question from uh, Nathan and Deepak in the chat uh, about uh, how the ambitwister connects to the amplitohedron. Well, the amplitohedron is, of course, a story about a, a Wilson loop, and so it's no longer an amplitude. And and uh, so so I uh, uh, I've, I've struggled for some time to try to understand how it is you could make contact with the um, uh, Wilson loop in ambitwister space. Um, yeah. So 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 so, so again. Um, uh, so, so there are lots of um, connections with positive geometry more generally, but, but that, that's been more via the um, uh, momentum amplitudehedron, which is something that was introduced by Matteo Parisi and Tomek Lukowski and friends. And um, uh, so the momentum amplitudehedron is, is the corresponding story about the amplitude. So it's a dual, the amplitude and the Wilson, plane of Wilson loop are, are, are sort of dual conformal or T dual to each other. And so the amplitude you can deal with, but I don't know how to deal with the Wilson loop. I don't know if Freddie wants to add something or uh, no. So she? Uh, hi, I want to follow up on Andy's question earlier. So um, uh, 
with the about the UV divergence, we can just do dim reg. Uh, what's wrong with just doing dim reg? No, there's nothing wrong with doing dim reg. I, I think our struggle really has been more to sort of um, uh, uh, really believe the steps that get us towards the um, uh, loop integrand. I mean, they, the steps that get us towards the loop integrand are are quite um, uh, systematic now, as witnessed by this recent paper by Yvonne Geyer and, and the two Ricardos. Uh, uh, and 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 then of course it's, it's dimension agnostic, so 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 you can do dim reg. So, so, so there is nothing wrong with that side of it. I think what um, Piotr and Nathan were worrying about is, is believing the formulae that uh, live on a genus three Riemann surface as to whether that formula is um, uh, completely well-defined as far as its modular invariance is concerned. And, uh, uh, but the steps that then take you from that to a, um, a, 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 a Riemann sphere with three double points, um, can then be used to write down a loop integrand, and that is completely uh, systematic, and that gives you the correct answers. And, and, and so, so they've managed to walk through that process to go from the field theory amplitude in BCJ form uh, through to the correlators on the world sheet and connecting to the kind of the, 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 the true string amplitude from the ambitious string kind of formula. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, one could a priori worry whether the integrand is unambiguously defined if the integral is uh, ill-defined. But uh, if one puts some restriction on how it behaves near the degeneration limit of the modular space, then presumably it's, it, will, it will be unambiguously defined. Yeah, I think I think that's maybe a way of saying it. And, and I, just, just a, a minor uh, comment about this uh, ankle source of Kremlis, uh, or was mentioned this infrared divergence, but of course one could go to Coulomb branch. And uh, if you look at uh, the exclusive amplitude of just the Cartan photons, there'll be no infrared divergence there. Absolutely. And, 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 and of course, uh, uh, both uh, the primitive group led by Freddie and, and, and now uh, Yvonne and I and Julianne Albonico picking backing on their work have now figured out how to do some of that. Andre has a very nice question in the chat. Andre, do you want to unmute yourself? If not, just write no in the chat and I will. Uh, I think some of the, can you hear me? Yes, yes. If you would, uh, yeah. some, some ambitwisters models can be obtained from, for example, your spin, pure spinner string by looking at the limit when two light-like geodesics on the world shift coincide. Maybe particle limit of some sort. I just wanted to ask if, first of all, if this is true and second, if there is something special about these particular cases of ambitwister models? Um, so I think uh, uh, I, I haven't really seen it done in a way that I completely believe um, uh, as, as a limit of the, uh, the, 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 the true string. I mean, I, we put a little appendix in at the back of our paper, which we didn't quite believe in, in, in the, fir the first paper. But as, as, as uh, Ollie was saying earlier, the twisted strings maybe give you a bit more of a well-defined route whereby you take a conventional string uh, and, and then you sort of change some signs in, in level matching and whatnot and, and you get this twisted string. And then, you, and then in that, you can take the alpha prime goes to infinity limits, but you then have to evaluate it using Sebastian's uh, uh, twisted cycles, but then you, you do get ambitwisted string formula. So there's a, there's a sort of, there's quite a convoluted process there, which I, I guess uh, you could regard as being reasonably systematic now to go from one to the other. But there are many more ambitwister models than those which can be obtained this way. So my question was, is it something special in those cases? Well, I don't know how to go back. And of course, a, a, a long-standing fantasy, which I think maybe, that's right, I shouldn't put words in his mouth, maybe shared a bit by Nathan, is that at some point we'll be able to get the two, true string realized in some twister space or ambitwister space and so on. Uh, but, but, but that's not, um, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a long way from being realized. Just to make sure we have a follow-up question, Talos. So maybe uh, it would make sense to, um, if Talos would like to, to ask Sorry, it. What? Do you want to ask your follow-up question, Talos? Well, it's not exactly a follow-up question. I mean, okay, but just, uh... you got to ask your question. Okay. Oh, sorry, but 
Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, I just read you. Well, you ask your question. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, so all the all the ambit twister models we know are based on this closed string, right? So, but there is something like the open twister string. So, if anyone thought about open ambit twister strings? Is there any sense in which, I mean, any way in which we could make sense of it? Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. Um, because it's a first order system. And so I don't know how to put sort of Dirichlet or Neumann. But actually, Piotr maybe has thoughts about this. I'm not sure. Yeah, not just me, actually. Back in, in Cambridge, also to um, David and uh, Tim and Eduardo, we're think, trying to think about how to define some boundary, con nice boundary conditions. But one of the problem is that the ambitious string firstly comes out as some holomorphic model. So it's hard to any sort of boundary condition breaks holomorphy. And then even if you try to go away, forget about holomorphy, it's, um, there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be nice physical boundary conditions you could put that are compatible, or at least you couldn't find any. But that's still maybe an open question. And related, is there non perturbative are there deep brains or stuff like this? I think we don't really know. Uh very soon, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Mohab, do you have a related comment? Yes, I have a related uh, comment. So, so in the original twister string, there is a there is a nascent formulation which is followed more or less in the and the and the, and the twister mm -hmm. string. But there is also the B model formulation of Witten, and that of course there are G brains and they play a very important role. So I was wondering whether you had thought about uh, a B model formulation of the and the twister string, or whether they give something completely different. I mean, I, I always thought of the B model as simply providing the holomorphic vector bundle, and then the D one instantons were essentially uh, Nathan's twister string. That was the way I always thought of it. I mean, I don't know if that's the correct way to think about it, but that was, maybe Nathan will be able to correct me or. Well, so maybe a related thing. I mean, so, so in the original version with the B model, there's also the, 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 the relation to this theory of uh, Bershatsky and company. So BCO, OV, et cetera, which is, mm -hmm. which is the complex structure deformation um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the twister space. And this is, this is related to the nonlinear graviton construction and so on. But of course, on, on MB twister space, this would be different. It would be much larger. And I'm not, I, I, I don't know what it gives. I was wondering whether you have, you have given this some, some thought. I, I mean, again, I think, I think the nature of uh, the B model and um, uh, maybe even Bikov is, 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 is that they encode the information of the uh, global complex structure on twister space or ambi twister space. And um, uh, the novelty of the string is, is that it adds these non local terms in ambi twister space or twister space, the, 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 the D1 instantons. And that's what's uh, driving the amplitude formally. So, so, so you always need something more. And uh, yeah. No, but so, the point so, is that in the B model, you know exactly what the brains are. So, so, so for example, Witten in his paper, so goes through the, the non-perturbative, uh, or at least what he, what was understood of the non-perturbative uh, sector of the, um, uh, of, of the theory, because in the B model, you can classify the D brains. So, so maybe one approach, if, if there was a formulation, of the ambit twister string in terms of B model, then you would know what the what the what the allowed D brains um, uh, are because the structure is fixed in the B model. But, but I mean, it's just a suggestion. I have a suggestion. Some people might want to take a short break. Let's continue informally uh, afterwards, maybe for seven more minutes. Uh, I still I have uh, some questions, but uh, let's thank uh, Freddie and Lionel for a very nice uh, discussion. And, uh, and yeah, I would say for seven minutes, we can continue and ask some, some more questions. And uh, Rajesh, you can uh, go on first. Uh, uh, hi, I, I was just wondering if I could ask Freddie to elaborate a little more on the answer to the question on the locality. Uh, so more specifically, what 
normal uh, world sheet string theory, uh, we see locality in uh, space time, like you said, the poles and the scattering amplitude come from the OPE on the world sheet uh, when you bring together vertex operators. Now, when your scattering amplitude is localized on modelized space, uh, how exactly does that work? I mean, uh, just can you sort of just sketch how I should think about it? Uh, the uh, the analog of a world sheet OPE giving rise to uh, the um, uh, the uh, pole behavior of uh, scattering amplitudes, which you can take as a proxy indeed for locality. Uh, so in some ways, it's like the UV IR connection that you normally talk of between world sheet and space time. Uh, so is there uh, is there some way in which you can kind of see that uh, analog of that? Uh... Well, once again, I think the if you want a geometric question, you really have to use Morse theory and, and actually understand the properties of this Morse function, but. Uh, but of course, the 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 the, the way the, the way the connection was found at first was not even um, was not even done uh, when the Morse function was understood. So it was more done uh, uh, using a, using a one form, which actually Lionel introduced in a sense when when from the from the world sheet approach, you naturally produce a, a one form that maps. Uh, that connects, um, that sends uh, that that connects the model space to to the null con, and when you do that, you can actually see you can actually see explicitly how how factorization will come about. But I think a more geometric approach would come from the from studying from understanding the Morse function, and and this is something that uh, also probably Sebastian can explain uh, if he has thought about it. So as, as far as I understand, the your your question, Rajesh, is how sort of bulk locality emerges from ambitwister strings or scattering equations, more or less. First of all, I think it should be said that not every sort of random function or integrand that you write down localizing on scattering equations gives you some local expression. So it's only those special cases. We understand that it's somehow related to the geometrically it would be related to the fact that your integrand or your collation function be before integrating have to have logarithmic singularities at the boundaries of the modelized space. So that seems like a special um, uh, property of, 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 of the integrand. But um, I think if you wanted a more precise connection, you would have to dig down more into the ambitwister models and uh, I guess for the UV question, you would ask about the critical dimensions and so on. Um, I, I'm not sure if tree level itself would tell you. you uh, no, no, you see the UVIR connection even just, I mean, from this fact that uh, when you bring vertex operators together on the world sheet, you, you see long distance behavior in terms of the uh, uh, the poles in the uh, space time uh, in the conventional, let's say, just flat space uh, string theory. So, uh, so I was trying to have some mental image of something similar like that for this case. But, uh, uh, but, uh, but in uh, yeah. Mm. But, 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 but it's, just, it's more or less. I mean, maybe Lionel can explain it more. But uh, the the. The formulas also come from a correlation function of vertex operators. So, so Lionel yeah. could explain perhaps that the, the same intuition follows. So, you, when you bring the vertex uh, but, operators, uh, but isn't it other. localized? Uh, but isn't it look once I fix the momenta? Uh, then uh, I mean, so is it that you, uh, the points will collide? The localized points on modelized space will collide when I come to. Because now you have these discrete points on the say the fundamental re or whatever the yes so, the so, yeah. so you have you have yeah so so you have you have a huge number you have n minus three factorial such points and only a subset of them will uh, will be mapped to the mod to the model space exactly the ones that you need to, to reproduce the recursive structure so. Um, yeah, that's right. So the other ones will remain at genetic points. 
Well, let me ask a question, Freddy. What do you think is the physical meaning of this higher dimensional SY uh, scattering equations that you have? If you have to speculate, I mean, it's the informal, most informal part of the informal discussion. Oh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> no, actually, I, actually, I think I, I think uh, I've been banging my head against the wall for 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 quite a while. I mean the. Uh, what it seems, I mean, this, the, these objects, as I said, I mean, this is something that uh, already for five particles, it's exactly something that uh, it provides a dual formulation to the standard scattering amplitudes that we all know and love. So um, even if you didn't think about uh, going to higher, um, and so, so this is something that mathematicians and biologists who do molecular biology uh, have, uh, have considered. Uh, because they have relations to tropical Grassmannians. So oh, there, there, are, there are several indications that tells you that uh, somehow, somehow these higher dimensional generalizations are there. And these Feynman diagrams, Feynman diagrams are then replaced by these arrays of Feynman diagrams where somehow you remove particles from each one of them and you impose some compatibility condition. And it, leads, it, it gives rise to, to interesting objects. And um, and say when you go to six particles, if you have if you have instead of a collection, you have an array of objects. Once again, this provides a dual to the standard to, to the standard field theory amplitudes. I mean, one speculation is that this is actually a nice way to see what happens when you have uh, when you have a stack of deep brains, and uh, we we usually consider we, we usually consider amplitudes when we have uh, when we have brains. Uh, Open streams stretch between different D brains. Uh, in the limit, when the when the D brains are on top of each other, we don't follow them very much. But um, I mean, it, one one possibility is that uh, this could provide some 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 picture for how it actually happens. And these are all wild speculations. Uh, another possibility is that really what you're doing when we do Feynman diagrams, we are doing um, we're doing quantum gravity in one dimension, in, in, a, in a zero plus one dimensional space, which is the space of the Feynman diagram and the Schrodinger parameters. You are integrating over, over all possibilities. Now, when you have this collection of Feynman diagrams, it's as if you had an ensemble of objects. Um, so is this, is this really a generalization of, 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 uh, of, how we, uh, of how we think about quantum field theory? Of course, in order to have any meaningful ideas about this, uh, we should find a limit in which uh, we replace uh, SL2C by SL3C and SL4C. So it's somehow a way of, um, and, and if there was any control way of, of generalizing SL2C to SL3C and go back to SL2C as if it was a uh, a perturbative expansion, then, then we could get more insights on, on what these things mean. But yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I don't have much to offer at this point. Nice, thank you. I suggest we thank uh, Lionel and uh, Freddy and... Uh... <clears throat> thank you very much, it was fun. And... Uh... Let's test the screen sharing before moving to the last two talks of the day. So I, I see that Frank okay. is already online. Frank, do you want to, to test? Uh, yes, give me a second. Okay. Or shot. Huh? Yeah. He already started doing. Looks good. Yeah, do you want to change slide just to check that it's working? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So Shota, you want to try? Yeah, 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 I'm gonna do that. Uh, you can see the cursor, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the cursor. Read uh, everything that is in the background very, very yeah. carefully. Sorry. It's, it's hard, hard to see, to read uh, very clearly what's in the background, but I don't think that's the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you see the cursor? Ah, yeah, I know what it's like. What it's see, fine, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, well, well, don't tell it. <laughs> 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 oh.
Oh, Pedro, you spoiled. No, 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 no one is here. Everyone's but but by the way, like, so my question is, can you see the cursor? Yes, we can see it. Okay, and then it changed, right? Um, the screen did not change. Yeah, yeah it did, it did. Oh, it did, it did. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a small change. Okay, okay. all right. Yeah. So okay. Amit will be chairing uh, your session, Frank and Jota. So you might want to coordinate with him. Warnings, five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can just shout at me. <laughs> no problem. But it doesn't have to be five. Like it can be seven or like a or any uh, appropriate time. Well, yeah, as long as it's not like forty-three minutes, then it's okay. So I mean, so the, first talk, the short talks is twenty-five minutes, five of questions, and the long and the review is uh, forty minutes and ten of questions. Okay, so yeah, I will never get forty-three. Warning. Okay. So we start. Can I can I try sharing again because I, I didn't yeah. check uh, one thing. So let me share again. Yeah, yeah, we can see your scribble. But we don't hear you, you're muted. Uh, yes, yes, I muted myself. Okay, it's fine. <clears throat>
Shota, maybe press play to enter. All right, so let's go to the full screen. Pedro, shall we start? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to open the last session of today with a review talk by Shota Komatsu. He will tell us about integrability in ADS CFT. Please. Okay, uh, let me th uh, thanks a lot. And let me thank the organizers for putting together this great event. And today I'm going to talk about uh, ADS CFT and application of integrability to gate theory which happens to be a subject Feynman also wanted to understand from this picture. So this is the last blackboard of Feynman. And he had an idea of describing like a soft physics of QCD happening in two-dimensional transverse plane using integrability. And if you want to know more about it, I would recommend reading this paper. And also uh, there, are, there, is, there are nice slides of Kolokin by Hiroshi. Okay, so, so let me start with this, this disclaimer. So today, uh, so although integrability can be applied to several theories, so today I'm going to focus on n equals four system mls in four dimensions. However, uh, let me just mention that recently there was a very interesting paper by these authors uh, in which they found some new structure in n equals two super conformal view theory. And the goal of, the, of my today, of the talk today is to give you a feeling of what the quantum spectral curve is and explain some application, and also to explain some recent developments involving D-brains, in particular determinant operators. So there are things that I'm not going to discuss, for example, a hexagon or a Yangian from defects. And if you're interested in those topics, please see these references. But let me just highlight, uh, there will be talks today and tomorrow on related topics. So uh, let me start with this question. So what do we mean by n equals four system mls is integrable? To, to answer this question, so let's consider the correlation function of single trace non-BPS operators. So if you expand it in the large n limit, you get this power series of one over n square. And on top of that, there will be correction coming from d instanton or instantons in your mls theory. And furthermore, we, ex we expect that there will be correction of the form e to minus m square, which come from black holes or single boundary wormholes. And there might also be correction, which is doubly non perturbative And our expectation is that we can compute terms on the first line, but not the, ter not the terms on the second line. And by now, we also know that some correlation functions involving uh, operators whose dimensions scale like n are computable, uh, which are like a dual to d brains. However, at the moment, we don't have strong evidence to believe that operators whose dimensions scale like n square are computable. And a short summary is that as long as operators do not back react ADS5 times 5 geometry, there is a chance that we can compute things using integrability. So next, let me address this question. Why should we care? Why should we care about solving n equals 4 supermills? So the first reason is that it might, well, it will give the first example of, of solvable interacting gauge series in four dimensions, uh, which is a great achievement if we succeed. But to me, what's more important is that it gives us a data point about string theory on Ramon Ramon flux background. And at a more technical level, there are qualitative and quantitative similarities with Spioya Mill theory, for example, BFKL physics. And in addition, if we succeed in solving planar n equals for super mills, then we can use it as a starting point for conformal perturbation theory or a Hamiltonian truncation. And more speculatively, it might tell us how the worksheet emerges from the gauge theory, which I view as a simpler version of the question, how do bulk and gravity emerge from quantum mechanics? So let me just give you one example. So an example is a fluctuation on GKP string, a so-called GKP string, which is dual to uh, now Wilson lines. And as you can see in this picture, at strong coupling, namely on the ADS side, the string can vibrate uh, along the radial direction. However, at weak coupling, if you do the computation, then you see no mode corresponding to the radio fluctuation. So this problem was addressed in these papers using integrability, and they found that this radio mode is nothing but the two fermion bound state, which becomes marginally stable at strong coupling. And I should also mention that a similar mechanism for probe brains was discussed in a series of nice papers here. And finally, 
once we succeed in solving n equals four super mills, hopefully it might give us some hints about Dworsky dual of pure m mills. And I guess like uh, there will be some related comments in the talk by Matthias tomorrow. So before explaining how integrability works, let me just give you the status of the research or status of the field. So integrability was first discovered at weak coupling in the analysis of the two-point function or the spectrum of local operators. And then later it was generalized to finite coupling, but in the limit where the length of the operator is very large. And finally, in 2009, uh, people succeeded in computing the spectrum at finite coupling and finite lengths uh, using a method called thermodynamic beta ansatz. And then uh, the method was reformulated into a beautiful and elegant formalism called quantum spectral curve uh, in 2013. And similar development happened for a three-point function. First, people analyzed it at weak coupling using the spin chain method. And then uh, later, uh, we succeeded in generalizing this, these results to finite coupling, but in the limit of large lengths. And that is the method called hexagon. And for a while, people tried to generalize this to get the finite coupling, sorry, finite size three-point function, but so far we didn't succeed. However, two years ago, we realized that if you consider a slightly different set of operators, uh, which are determinant operators, then you can actually generalize the thermodynamic beta and that's and directly compute a finite a coupling and finite size three-point function. And also recently, there were many attempts to do, try to know something about three-point function using quantum spectral curve. And I'm going to talk about these new developments, but of course I, I'm gonna review the basic stuff as well. So, uh, and my main, main message, the, so the main message of the today's talk is uh, N equals four super mills is half spin chain and half large and gauge theory or matrix model. Well, of course, like a, this might sound like a trivial statement to some of you, but I'm going to convince you that there is some deeper meaning. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So in 2002, Minahan and Zarembo found a relation between a one loop dilatation operator and a Hamiltonian of the spin chain. And their idea is to consider this kind of single trace operator made out of two complex scalars, Y and Z, and map Y to downspin and Z to upspin. And under this mapping, they found that the one loop dilatation operator can be mapped to a uh, Hamiltonian of so-called Heisenberg spin chain, which is given by this. And what is nice about this Hamiltonian is that this Hamiltonian turned out to be solvable by a method called beta ansatz. So what is beta ansatz? So the beta ansatz is a simple two-step procedure for constructing the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. Step one, you write an ansatz by viewing upspin as the vacuum and downspin as an excitation. And the ansatz for the wave function is, is very simple. It's just a sum over plane waves. And the only unknown input for the ansatz is this S matrix. Well, or the this S factor, which you multiply whenever you swap the order of momenta. And step two, we just impose that it is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And as long as, as soon as you impose it, then you immediately discover that S, this S is going, is fixed to be this form. And this U is related to momentum of particle in this way, and it's called rapidity variable. And on top of that, you find that this, these momenta need to satisfy algebraic equation, which is called beta equation. And if you want to compute the energy, what you just need to do is to solve this beta equation and determine all, all p's and u's, and then uh, you, uh, use this formula to compute the energy. So this was the story for the one loop dilatation operator. So what we should do, what should we do if we not want to know the finite coupling spectrum? So for the finite coupling, we first need to assume that integrability persists at finite coupling. And once we assume it, then a general theory of integrability tells us that we can still write the beta equation at finite coupling as long as the length of the operator is sufficiently large. So this is the equation. So however, to really use this equation, uh, we really need to determine uh, this S of lambda, in particular, the dependence on lambda. So this problem uh, was solved by essentially by Bizert. And 
he, uh, who realized that actually this F S of lambda can be determined by imposing the so-called centrally extended SU2 slash two square symmetry, where SU2 slash two square part is just a subgroup of superconformal symmetry. So this is surprising because in ordinary quantum field theory, just imposing the symmetry is not enough to determine the coupling constant dependence. And the magic here comes from the central extension P and K. So let me just tell you like uh, what they are. So on the gauge theory side, it's actually very easy to understand what these P and Ks are. In order to do that, we just need to remind ourselves the basics of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry acting on boson gives you fermion. And if you take another supersymmetry generator and act it on the fermion, then you get several terms. But in particular, uh, you get this term, which is given by the commutator between a complex scalar field and a boson. And this is precisely our P. And what is, the most what is most important here is that this P comes with G and Mills, and that's basically the reason why P knows about the coupling constant dependence. And this relation can be summarized into this anticommutator, Q and Q prime anticommutes to P. And interestingly, these P and K also have an interesting interpretation on the spin chain picture. And in order to see that, we just need to take this definition of P and then acted on a spin chain state, which consists of a bunch of Z and one Y. And because it's commutator, if it acts on Z, you just get zero. So non-trivial term only comes from the action of P on Y, and which is given by this. And as you can see, so this is nothing but a discrete translation. So this uh, nicely embodies uh, the fact or principle that I wanted to advocate that N equals for you super MLs integrability is half spin chain and half gauge theory. And once you determine this, of S, this S of lambda and using the beta equation, you, we can actually determine all perturbative one over L correction at finite uh, coupling, at, at finite root coupling. However, if you're really interested in the finite size spectrum, you also need to know the exponential corrections. Uh, but the exponential, exponential correction can be computed by a method called thermodynamic beta and that's which I will describe later. And using that method, people basically like a, created this kind of plot, which nicely like interpolates weak, weak coupling answer and the strong coupling answer. However, one problem about this TBA approach is that it works for some operators like Konishi state, but generally it's actually hard for most operators because TBA equation is an infinitely many coupled integral equation. So we need a better method. That is quantum spectra curve. So, to tell you what the quantum spectral curve is, and let me just go back to the simplest uh, spin chain, which is the Heisenberg, Heisenberg, Heisenberg spin chain that I was talking about. And so for the Heisenberg spin chain, the beta equation, if you write it explicitly, you get this expression. And now I want to reformulate this beta equation. In order to do that, I introduce what's called Q function, uh, where like a, this is just like a polynomial whose roots are given by this uj. And you can actually show that this beta equation is equivalent to this functional equation. And in order to see that, you just need to set this u to be uj. Then the left-hand side becomes zero because of this q term, whereas the right-hand side gives you this kind of a bit complicated expression. But if you massage this expression, you can easily see that they are the same. And although not obvious, this, uh, this equation, this functional equation can be further reformulated into this equation uh, if we introduce like another variable Q uh, which is which is defined by T in this way. So this is the central like equation in the quantum spectral curve approach and which is called QQ relation. And mathematically uh, that it, you can think of it as a kind of generalization of the Blücher identity of Grassmannian. So the, what's nice about this QQ relation is that actually you can generalize it to the full n equals for super mills, although the uh, form is a bit more complicated. However, uh, there was one problem about QQ relation. Actually, QQ relation do not, does not depend on uh, the roof coupling. And in fact, the same relations hold uh, both at finite coupling and also for spin chain at weak coupling. So in that, in that sense, like uh, this QQ relation is intrinsically a spin chain relation. And in order to incorporate this coupling constant dependence, we need to use the other side of the coin, which is the fact that it is a large gauge theory or matrix model. 
So let me explain what is the other what the, the other half of the coin in a simplest in the simplest possible example, which is the large and Gaussian matrix model. So of course, in the large and Gaussian matrix model, there is not no dilatation operator to diagonalize, but there is something that you can still diagonalize, which is actually two point function of single trace operator, because the two point function of this kind of single trace operators in the large and limit are non diagonal. So you can try to diagonalize it by like trying constructing some nice linear combination of single trace operator. So this problem was addressed in this paper, and they found that actually this single, if you replace this single trace operator with a linear combination of single trace operator, which is given by Chebyshev polynomial, then you can diagonalize the two point function. And the nice feature, a nice feature about, the, about this Chebyshev polynomial is that if you write it in terms of what's called Zhukovsky variable, uh, it takes exceedingly simple form, which is given by this. And this is basically Q function or quantum spectral curve for Gaussian matrix model. So there are several nice features of this Q function uh, for the Gaussian matrix model. First, uh, it is most naturally defined on the X plane, which is a double cover of U. So if you solve this equation, you get this expression. And by the way, this square root is nothing but the Wigner's semicircle, and which happens to be also the inverse of the resolvent. Second, uh, the charges of the operator can be read off from the asymptotics that you go into infinity like this. In other words, uh, you can interpret this Q function as a degree L branch covering of CP1. Third, uh, and most importantly, uh, it satisfies what's called gluing condition. So if you take this Q function and then analytically continue through this branch cut, then x, going to, x goes to one over x. However, because of this form, you can easily see that q, this q function is invariant under this analytic continuation. This is the gluing condition for this q function. And this third feature, the gluing condition, you can actually naturally generalize to n equals four supermills. And because in n equals four supermills, we have several matrices, so we have several q functions. So the x, gluing condition gets a little bit more complicated but you can still write it. And what's, what is most important here is that together with the QQ relation that I talked, or talked about earlier, uh, these two relation completely determine the Q function. So this is another manifestation of the principle that I was advocating. And similarly as the Gaussian matrix model, if you want to read off the charge, then uh, you can read it off from the asymptotics at infinity after solving these like a two, relation, two equations. And by using this quantum spectral curve, people succeeded in doing many computation, but in, uh, and also in particular, uh, people succeeded in computing analytic expression for 11 loop anomalous dimension of Konishi operator. Uh, it's, it's a bit long, but it's nice because it's very explicit. So, so another nice feature of, well, so in the case of Gaussian matrix model, uh, the correlation functions are also given by uh, integrals of Q function. For example, uh, so this, can, this you can show by simple like a matrix model using simple matrix model techniques. So for example, two, function, two point function is given by integral uh, with this measure, whereas the three point function is given by the integral with this measure. And I should emphasize that this is not just a made up uh, because actually they describe a topological subsector of N equals four zip mills. So given this, uh, it's kind of natural to hope that maybe something similar is also true for n equals four supermers. So for example, maybe we can write some expression like this. Unfortunately, we haven't uh, yet achieved this, but in the past few years, uh, there have been a great, great progress for constructing the measure for the two point function at weak coupling. And the basic strategy is to impose this kind of a slightly generalized orthogonality condition. And by doing that, they succeeded in de deriving DMU2 for GL and M spin chain, non-compact spin chain, and also spin chain with general representations. So here, I just wanted to show you the simplest possible case, which is the SL2 spin chain of length cell. And that is given by this integral. Actually, the two-point function is already given by multiple integral and the number of integration variables is given by L minus one. 
And here it's a bit interesting because instead of usual van der Mont, you have some like a weird van der Mont, like a half turn Simon matrix model, half usual matrix model. And given this structure, I think it's kind of interesting to ask whether we can derive it or generalize it using beta gauge correspondence. So this expression is only for weak coupling, namely one loop. So obvious next steps are to generalize it to finite coupling and also to figure out the measure for the three point functions. So there are several difficulties that we expect. For example, the number of integration variables uh, is actually going to increase as you increase the loop order. The second difficulty is that a uh, measure for the three-point function is going to be different for the measure for the two-point function because of the double trace operators. So I don't have time to explain that, but this is a kind of like a natural expectation. Nevertheless, uh, we should be optimistic because in some cases, actually you can uh, compute this uh, measure for the three-point function, for example, in some fishnet limits or from, from localization. Okay, so this was it for the quantum spectral curve. And now I'm going to move to the second topic, which is about de Bryans and determinants and G functions. So in uh, two years ago, we found a new class of correlation, solvable correlation functions, uh, which is basically the three point function of two determinant operators and one single trace non BPS operator. So there are several nice properties of this three-point function. For example, uh, it is in some sense analog of baryon baryon meson vertex in large NQCD. So this is like a joint version of that. And secondly, uh, this has a nice holographic description. This determinant operator is dual to deep brain in ADS, uh, which is called giant graviton. And also another nice feature is that uh, you can compute it at weak coupling using matrix product state and at finite coupling using the techniques of Warchi G function, both of which I'm going to describe uh, in next slides. But before moving on, I just wanted to mention an analogy with FZZ T brain in a minimal, minimal string, uh, which corresponds to insertion of determinant of E minus H in the matrix integral, where H is the matrix here. So in the case of FZZ T brain, so this parameter E basically controls the position at which FZZ T brain ends. And similarly, if I introduce a generalization of this determinant operator by introducing parameter X, then this X basically controls the position of D3 brain in ADS5 and S5, in particular inside S5, uh, well, in particular in, inside S5. And as if you increase X, then like a D brain moves, it moves in this direction. And so let me just describe the weak, how the weak coupling computation goes. So the idea is actually very simple to what Steve talked about uh, last week. So the first step is to just represent, represent, represent determinants by fermion integrals like this. And the next step is to just integrate out n equals for super mills. And that is going to give you some effective action for mesons, uh, which are bilinear of these fermions. And in the present, ca present case, because we are considering like a three point function of two determinants and one single trace, this meson is given by two by two matrices. And another nice feature is that if you write the effective action of the meson, then it comes with a factor of n in the large n limit. So in the large n limit, you can actually uh, evaluate it at, at the subtle point. And there was a very nice paper today and which basically show that the uh, subtles of this uh, row integral in the chiral algebra sector is in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the D brain in uh, BCOB theory. So in the context of twisted holography by Costello and Gaiotto. So if you are only talking about determinant operators, then this is the end of the story. But what we wanted to compute is to compute a three-point function involving single trace operator. So let's take single trace operator to be of this form. Then if you repeat this procedure in the presence of single trace operator, then you find that the final answer is given by a, some matrix trace, which takes a similar structure as the original single trace operator. But here, uh, instead of like n by n matrices, which we, or we originally had, we actually have two by two matrices where uh, essentially these matrices are given by the subtle point value of this row. 
And so, and, and, not, and in order to proceed, uh, we can also rewrite, we rewrite this uh, trace uh, into an overlap between matrix product state and O. So, and where the matrix product state is defined in this way. And you can clearly see that if you just take the overlap, then you pick up a particular term in this matrix product state, and that is given by this trace. And here I just wrote, drew the usual description of the matrix product state. And one nice thing about this uh, overlap between matrix product state and, and the operator, which is the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, is that this was actually studied a lot in statistical mechanics in the context of quench dynamics. And what they found is that if you, uh, this matrix product is state, oh, sorry, this overlap is non-zero, even and only if uh, the set of momenta are parity symmetric. So they have to come in pairs. So this, this is basically some selection rule, and it implies that matrix product state is invariant under uh, the uh, infinitely many charges. Uh, this basically means that matrix product state is what's called integrable boundary state introduced first by these people. And on top of that, they found that this overlap is given by some simple expression, the factorized part times ratio of determinants, where determinant is basically defined by log derivative of the data equation. And I should also mention that N equals four super mills also gives generalizations of these known formula, for example, to the SL2 spin chain or supergroup spin chain and so on. So, so that was the story for the uh, weak coupling. And, and so how do we compute it at finite coupling? So in order to compute it at finite coupling, you need to use the string theory picture. So as I said, determinant operators create D brain. And if you have a single trace operator on top of that, then that is described by a process in which D brain absorbs the closed string, which on the worksheet is nothing but this uh, overlap between boundary state and the closed string state. So this is basically some generalization of what's called G function introduced first by Affleck and Ludwig. And in order to determine this uh, overlap at finite coupling, uh, we first determine the reflection amplitudes against this boundary uh, using uh, like a consistency condition, uh, we, which we call integrable bootstrap. So this is the reflection matrix. And the kind of uh, constraint that we impose is like a symmetry constraint and boundary and Baxter e equation and boundary unitarity. So well, I don't, I'm not gonna give you details, but what's most important is that this boundary and Baxter equation, which basically is a statement that this uh, boundary state corresponds to integrable boundary state. So this is an assumption. And in step two, uh, once we determine this reflection amplitude, we consider now cylinder partition function and take a limit where the length of the cylinder is very, very large. Then in this limit, uh, we can expand the closed, sorry, the cylinder partition function into the closed string sector. And that is given by this expression. So this is a sum over closed string state and there is an overlap term and then there is a propagation term. And the same partition function can be viewed also from the open string theory side. And if you view it as from the open string theory side, it's nothing but the thermal partition fun function at uh, temperature, e sorry, inverse temperature equals L. And so this is given by some thermal partition function of open string. And in the limit when R is very large, you can replace the sum of open string states by a pass integral of density of excitation. So this is a bit like a, a, a hydrodynamic like representation in which repl you replace a state with some kind of density of particles. And in this expression, uh, what is nice is that, um, okay, sorry. So in this expression, so you have like some effective action and this effective action is determined by the reflection amplitude that we determined like earlier in the previous slide. And what is the most important, what's most important here is that this effective action comes with a factor of R and in the limit of large R, you can evaluate the subtle point, uh, sorry, sorry, this pass integral at the subtle points. And if you compare this expression uh, against the expression coming from the closed string, you can see, you can clearly see that different saddles co corresponds to different closed string states where, and, 
And the diff subtle point equation is nothing but uh, what's called TBA equation that I mentioned earlier. And if you carefully like uh, compare it, then you can easily see that basically one loop determinant gives you this factor that we wanted to compute, this overlap that we wanted to compute. So using this uh, strategy, we can just compute it. And the final answer is given by some kind of ratio of Fred Holm determinants. So, so the, this overlap is given by some given by two factors. The first factor is some free factor, which depends on the details of reflection amplitudes. And the second factor is the uh, Fred Holm determinants, uh, which also showed up in the talk by Clifford last week. But here uh, it takes a little bit more complicated form because this uh, like an integral kernel actually acts on a vector of function rather than a single function because it, this S is a matrix. But the detail is probably not so important. And what's important is that uh, it repro reproduces and generalizes the weak coupling answer. And furthermore, uh, what's nice about this method is, uh, is that a variety of quantities can, in principle, be studied by the same methods, uh, including things like the instantons. And let me just highlight one intriguing observation. Uh, so, which is like this. Uh, so if you consider, so, so in all these examples that I showed in the previous slide, there is one interesting common feature, um, <clears throat> which, is, which is the fact that um, the, if you do the computation at weak coupling, uh, you get a matrix product state with bond dimension D, and that number D is exactly equal to the number of boundary bound states which appear at finite coupling computation. So this is just an observation, but it's very interesting because it basically tells us that a part of the Warshi degrees of freedom, which is the bound, number of boundary, boundary bound state, can be seen already at weak coupling. Okay. Yeah, actually, I might be a bit fast, <laughs> but okay, let me just go to the lessons and future direction. So, so here, like today, I showed several like uh, recent developments about integrability, uh, but I think uh, the, one of the most important lessons that we can learn about all these integrability approaches is that uh, the large and Feynman diagrams is really the same as string wars eating ADS. Uh, of course, I think like uh, people kind of knew it, but uh, integrability has shown us that there is a precise sense uh, in which this is true. And given this, like I think it's kind of interesting to ask, for example, uh, to to ask whether we can do something similar in a different setup, for example, at finite temperature. And the second lesson is a little bit more technical. Uh, basically, integrability tells us that. Uh, Tufte expansion in the large end limit has a finite radius of convergence. So this is also something known like already like in the works by Tufte. But uh, because of integrability, we now know that what is the radius of convergence for many quantities. And the radius of convergence is pi square. And in, on, in addition, uh, integrability tells us that uh, or indicates or suggests that uh, below this branch cut, there are actually infinitely many sheets. And so, and, give, and also like a, there is a singularity at uh, lambda equals minus pi squared. So given this presence of singularity, I think it's kind of interesting to ask whether we can take some double scale and limit uh, near the singularity at like minus pi squared. And by the way, I just wanted to mention that uh, this kind of double scale limit was like a previously speculated by Polakov that it might be has some, it might have some connection to DS, but I guess like a more reliable but exotic version was discussed in this paper. So, so let me end uh, by repeating this question. So, like op two op there are two open questions: with can we see a well, can we do the finite temperature analysis and can we see a horizon from the large and Feynman diagrams? And there is some interesting feature in the analytic property of the Tufte coupling, and maybe it might be interesting to explore the double scan limit. Okay, with that, let me just end my talk. Thank you very much, Shota. Um, please, any questions? 
raise our hand. Yeah, there, are, there are people who raise hands. Amit, you're, Amit, you're muted. Nathan, please. So, is it understood better now the relation of integrability on the world sheet and on the spin chain? I mean, has there been progress on understanding the relation? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I don't think so. I think like there are uh, developments about understanding on both sides. For example, on the world sheet side, uh, people succeeded in relating uh, the integrability uh, in of the ADS5 and S5 to uh, four digit and Simon theory by Costello and others. And on the spin chain side, there are some works by Bizard uh, in which they he tried to uh, kind of derive the uh, integrability of the action, but um, I don't see any like a connection yet. Okay, thanks. Leopoldo. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about the potential connections with um, horizon and black hole physics? Yeah, well, I don't have much to say, but um, I guess at finite temperature, uh, it's important to take into account um, the holonomy coming from S1. And that corresponds to some kind of like a winding mode on the worksheet, or like some people call it ver vortex. And I guess like a condensation of the vortex is going to play an important role. And so on the strip, on the pure string theory side, something similar was discussed like uh, in this paper. But yeah, I think there are several more things that we can do on the Feynman diagram side. Germani. Hi, Shweta. Um, thanks. Hi. Uh, my question is related to Leo's. Um, so my understanding is that if you're looking at uh, high, uh, finite temperature correlators, one approach would be to um, look at the operators with dimensions of order n squared and, and look right. at their, their observables. But uh, as far as I understand, this is not uh, completely within the limit of integrability right. or at least we don't know how to yeah. Yeah, contact directly. Um, can you say anything about prospects? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Even so go back? I'm not saying that like we can compute them using integrability, but the integrability has told us that like there is a precise sense in which we can identify the Feynman diagrams with the worksheet. So we should be a bit more optimistic and trying to mm -hmm. see some features of like horizon or finite temperature physics from the Feynman diagram. So that was just that was my point. Maybe I can ask a slightly more technical question about finite mm -hmm. temperature physics. Uh, is it possible as a stopgap instead of looking for a horizon to see that at finite temperature correlators have poles and no cuts? That's from company. This is a prediction well, from ADS-CFT because in, right. free, in weakly coupled theories, the analytic structure of thermal correlator has cuts <laughs> from multiple. Right, states. right. Right. You only see quasi normal poles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question, but I don't have anything to say about it. Thanks. You go. Uh, uh, thanks for a very nice review. Uh, the fact that uh, the singularity is at minus pi squared, I guess, implies that one can go smoothly from zero to infinity along the positive lambda, right? Mm -hmm. And that's related to the fact that you typically get alternating sign series, right? If you develop mm -hmm. perturbative series. Uh, as far as I know, it's a rather special feature of the Anikov four super young mills. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments on how big a class of uh, gauge theories have this property? Like say, are some unequal two supersymmetric theories like this? Uh, what is known? E well, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Well, I guess like uh, to make uh, progress, I guess uh, we can, for example, use the uh, localization result because this pi squared also showed up in Kongao's talk. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so probably we can study some like integrated correlator or like a sphere partition function. 
Emil? But on QCD, it's unlikely to work like this in non-suppressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have mm -hmm. much comments. Okay, thank you. Martinez, please. Yeah, um, very interesting. Um, so, so in the second part of your talk, you discussed um, perturbations around um, giant gravitons. Yes. So what are the prospects of generalizing that to more general LLM type geometries? Right, so at weak coupling, um, one can use the same technology like introducing fermions. Well, you need to like introduce, introduce several fermions and then write some effective action. But um, at strong coupling, or sorry, at finite coupling or from the integrability side, uh, right now, there is no strong evidence uh, that it's that we can study it using integrability. Although, like uh, I should mention, that there are interesting works by Domelokova and others, uh, in which they kind of suggested that there might be some integrable subsectors, but even that question is not settled yet. Okay, thank you, Kazako. Uh, uh, check. Ah, sorry. Uh, uh, thanks, Shota, for, for a nice uh, review. It's a great contribution to our tomorrow's discussion with Gregory. Uh, my question is, uh, could you imagine some formula generalizing this integral over three Q functions for triple correlator for your quantities, like two determinants, one, one operator? Could you imagine how to combine it from Q4. Okay, yeah, 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 that, that's a good question. And actually, like at weak coupling uh, on the spin chain side, uh, we already have the expression. So like uh, this overlap can be expressed as a multiple integral of Q function. For example, there are expressions uh, for the SU2 spin chain. What do you do with, uh, what, what, what does correspond to determine then? Some exponentiation of Q function or? Oh, no, no, well, you just, okay. So uh, it's actually interesting. So. Uh, so I pointed out some similarity with the matrix integral and uh, which like I so saw, there is some like a fundamental like factor which is given by Sinch and uh, X, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you basically like uh, need to replace that factor uh, by something like a Sinch of X, I, Xj square minus Xk square times Xj square minus Xk square, which mm -hmm. is a bit like a going to like a G, from GUE to GOE. Mm -hmm. And okay. it's just a change of measure. Uh -huh. Thank you. Any more questions? Now that we will have tomorrow a session about integrability, so if you have more questions uh, until then, you can ask them to tomorrow. Um, Frank, maybe want to share your slides? Let's thank Shota again for the very nice overview. I mean, let's just wait a few minutes just because some people may tune on just at 2.30, so. Okay. Can I ask a question in the meantime? Yes, of course. Yeah, so I, um, so Shota, you, you, meant, you did not mention uh, Operators of of uh, with dimension or, or size n square, but there are these Wilson loops, and one can compute even correlators. Uh, so they do not fit in the integrability scheme. Or why why don't you consider them on the same footing? Well, I guess you can compute certain things, for example, from localization. Uh, but um, generally, I do not expect we can use integrability because on the string theory side. Integrability basically comes from the fact that the target space is, of the sigma model is ADS5 times S5. And if you deform it a little bit, typically you lose integrability property of the sigma model. So that's why I was saying that like, if you consider N squared operator, probably it's not integrable. Thanks.
can also ask a question if there is time. Uh, sure, sure. So you, you mentioned a little bit that for this um, uh, hexagons business, there are signs that integrability persists to non-planar corrections. So mm -hmm. what is what is known about them and what is kind of the grand view, whether it will persist to somewhere in one of N to all others? Well, I guess, um, I guess it's very likely that we can eventually compute it, uh, well, using integrability techniques. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to define like what is integrability directly at non-planar level, uh, but the, the punchline is that we can use the integrability techniques and then compute it. So right now, hexagon is not in good shape because we need to do like, a, yeah, basically like it involves infinite sum and integrals, but uh, I think there will be, we will find it in the near future. And other approaches, are they less clear how to generalize them to one of N corrections? Uh, well, one of N, no, we, we, we don't have a clue right now. So I think we should collect data points. Uh, for example, like uh, in some protected sector, you can compute things using localization and that is related to sometimes to Q functions. So then like uh, if you can compute it from localization, you, you can typically also compute, compute non-planar corrections. So then from there, you can see like how Q functions not, will know about non-planar corrections. But it's fair to say that we can see that the same elements also determines the one over n, the n square corrections. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, right. It's um, hard to compute, but... Yeah. Yeah, well, so yeah, uh, I'm just saying like we should collect more data points. Yeah, this is maybe what I also had in mind that, I mean, if you expect that n square operators are somehow non-integrable, it should fit in at some order into the, you know, light operators, right? Or at least, I don't know, naively um, that one would expect. So do, do you think yeah, but yeah, I think that that's like a considering e to minus n square correction okay, in so the light the, operators. Yeah, that will be non-perturbative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, 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 so we had a talk uh, early this afternoon uh, about uh, integrated correlation functions. So let's think about this four-point correlation function of length two operators. So mm -hmm. from point of view, mm -hmm. the hexagon is the most complicated object to consider. Mm -hmm. On the other hand side, uh, if I will go through those steps, so imagine at some point I, I will use this correlation function exactly from the hexagon. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it will require mm -hmm. taking infinite number of sums, infinite number of integrations, complete mass. Mm -hmm. But then if I will integrate with the measure, special measure, I'm expecting to get the results which match localization. Does mm -hmm. it look you like a miracle? And if it's miracle, do you have any clue how it could be explained? Yeah, well, it, it, it does sound like a miracle. Uh, well, there are like many other like uh, situations. For example, there are many cases like in which you can compute correlation functions using integrability, correlation, like correlation function on the supersymmetric Wilson loops. And in all those cases, like a final answer is simple, but well, yeah, reproducing that from hexagons looks like a miracle. Thank you. I guess she can just unmute you herself. Uh, yeah, so, so just kind of, uh, I, have a, there's a, I have a general feeling that uh, um, you know, the higher dimension operators are related to precision, you know, small corrections to spectrum low dimension operator, right? So whether well, n squared operator will have to do with e to the minus n squared corrections, say the Konishi operator. Uh, so what about e to the minus n corrections? Sounds like they could potentially be captured by integrability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that can be captured and that's, that's work in progress with e Fan and Joao Caetano. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so let's proceed to the last talk of today, where uh, Frank will tell us about 10 dimensional symmetry of n equal to top four super young virus correlators. Please, Frank. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a, a presentation on this nice conference. Uh, today, I will tell you about um, a recent paper that I put out with Simon. Um, as Shota said, uh, n equal for super young males is um, our candidate to be uh, the first solvable four dimensional gauge theory. And uh, a lot of progress has been done uh, in this pursuit uh, thanks to its special symmetries and, and dualities. Uh, in this talk, I will present uh, a new hidden symmetry that appears in the context of correlation functions. And that will also allow me to, to define a new duality between correlators uh, and massive amplitudes. Um, first, let me start by stating an, an old duality that we will later generalize. So this is a 10 year old duality between um, correlation functions of uh, the smallest protected operators and a scattering amplitude of uh, massless gluons in living in a dual space. Uh, the way to, to show this duality um, has two steps. So in the first step, we consider the um, the null limit we consider the points to be sequentially sequentially null separated, um, and in that limit, effectively, we have a, a fast particle propagating in this uh, contour, and that give give rise to to a Wilson loop. Um, on the second step, we consider a duality that maps an equal for super young mills super young mills to itself, but uh, but it changes the Wilson loop to a scattering amplitude. In terms of the of the kinematics, this is just uh, can be simply stated as relating the momenta of the massless particles uh, to be identical to the to the edges of the of the null uh, polygonal Wilson loop. Uh, now we would like to ask if uh, we can come up with a generalization of this of this duality for the case of uh, massive amplitudes. Uh, when we talk about massive amplitudes in n equal for superior mills, we we need to go to the Coulomb branch. So we turn on. Uh, some expectation values for scalar fields and some uh, fields acquire masses. So we can here consider uh, the scattering of uh, w, uh, massive W bosons. And it was found um, that this amplitude uh, satisfies a higher dimensional symmetry that, that acts on the vector composed by the momenta and the mass. So the masses are treated as extra dimensions uh, under this uh, higher dimensional symmetry. Um, of course, if we uh, are looking for some correlator um, that satisfies a duality, um, we better have uh, a candidate that uh, can give rise to a higher dimensional structure. Uh, those candidates uh, are related to these uh, uh, BBS um, operators that are dual to Kalusa Klein modes in, in ADS5 plus S5. Uh, these operators are single trace uh, operators, um, traces of uh, in this case, k products of, of fields parameterized by the uh, four-dimensional um, space-time position and uh, a six-dimensional six polarization vector that has to be null for, uh, for this operator to be protected. Um, this extra six-dimensional polarization vector is the one that en encodes, in the boundary theory, encodes the, the kinematics of uh, the S5. Um, it was found that in the regime of a strong coupling that is dual to, to supergravity, uh, when we consider uh, the sum of all the four point correlators of, this, of these VPS operators, there is a, we, we define a, um, a single object that has an emergent 10D, uh, 10D symmetry. In this talk, I will present that there is a similar 10, 10 dimensional structure, but now in a different uh, coupling regime. And this, uh, and this higher dimensional structure will also allow us to, to make a connection with the, with the massive amplitude. So let, let me be more precise. I will consider uh, a master operator that is uh, given by the infinite sum of all these protected operators. And I will consider only their, its four point function. And we found that um, this four point function of master operators has also an emergent 10 dimensional structure that combines space-time and, and our charge distances in a, in a single uh, uh, vector. Um, we further conjecture that the uh, correlator of these master operators um, in, in its tending a limit 
it's dual to, to, um, to a massive amplitude in the Coulomb branch. And now the map, a part of uh, trading the, um, this uh, position by momenta, we also now recognize that these extra uh, R charge distances map to the, to the masses in the, in the dual. Uh, we, uh, unlike the massless case, we actually don't have a proof of this duality. Uh, we, in fact, also don't have a third object to format reality. Uh, but uh, we have checked this uh, conjecture at very loop orders. And my goal in this talk is to present to you how this 10 dimensional structure arises in um, uh, a weak coupling. And, and then to show you how we can use integrability to compute this 10 dimensional null limit and uh, compute uh, a massive amplitude at finite coupling. So the, the plan uh, for the rest of the talk is um, uh, as follows. So first I will start in the weak coupling regime. And I will show you that already for the free correlators, there is a, 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 an emergent 10 dimensional structure. Uh, then I will consider loop corrections uh, by working with suitably defined uh, loop integrands. Uh, I will show you that uh, this 10 dimensional structure gets promoted now to a 10 symmetry for the case of the integrands. And after uh, having this experience, um, I will consider the tending a limit and I will uh, sharpen uh, the duality, but now I state, by now I stating that, um, that, this, that um, the massive amplitude in the Coulomb branch is equal to, to a correlator of large charge, charge operators that are um, known as octagon in the integrability literature. Uh, then I will use integrability to, to compute this uh, octagon for massive amplitude. Um, uh, at finite coupling, and I will also analyze uh, the massless limit uh, that goes back to the origin of the Coulomb branch. Uh, so let me start with the free theory. In the free theory, uh, when we compute the, cor the correlators of these uh, scalar operators, uh, we just do it by, by big contractions. Here I show you the two-point function that is given by this propagator to the power, uh, to, to the dimension of the operator. And, uh, and here, a part of the, the usual uh, um, propagator um, on the numerator, we have uh, the um, R charge uh, distance. Uh, we consider the four point function of the master operators. Uh, remember that uh, resum resumes all the BPS operators. And that can be computed as an infinite sum of big contractions. Um, each set of big contractions can be represented as a, as a graph uh, where we have uh, six bundles uh, given the six possible connections between the four operators. And each bundle contains uh, a certain amount of propagators. And that's represented here uh, in the exponent of the, of the propagator. And this uh, comes with, um, with some coefficients that account for the, the different uh, distinct ways that we have to, to draw uh, one of these graphs uh, respecting its topology. Fortunately, uh, in the planar limit that we consider, and considering this uh, normalization of our single traces, uh, these coefficients happen to be, uh, almost all of them happen to be uh, independent of the length of the operator. So for instance, we have topologies like this one where it doesn't matter uh, how many propagators we have on each of these bundles, uh, this coefficient is just one. And similarly here, it doesn't matter how many propagators there are, the coefficient is just two, the two coming from the fact that you can swap uh, these two diagonals from inside and outside. Uh, given that property, then it's a straightforward to show that uh, this series can be resumed. Is you identify it as a geometric series, and we obtain a compact expression. Um, and the emergent structure is that now, uh, in this compact expression, we have a propagator that uh, gets this correction. Uh, the the 4D space-time distance uh, has um, is extended, uh, including this six-dimensional uh, distance. Uh, we can now ask if this uh, structure also appears at weak up at uh, loop corrections. So we consider the series expansion in, in the tooth coupling in the planar limit. And one way to, to deal with these uh, loop corrections, uh, one efficient way to deal with these loop corrections is by using the Lagrangian insertion method that allows you to, to define an integrand. Uh, and this integrand, the L loop integrand corresponds to a four plus L uh, point correlator that is uh, to be evaluated just a leading order. Uh, this correlator contains the four external, uh, the original four external operators, and also uh, L Lagrangian insertions that we are supposed to integrate over um, to, to get the final result. 
Uh, furthermore, using su uh, superconformal symmetry, it's possible to show that this um, uh, correlator factorizes. And so we can strip out a complicated expression and define uh, an even simpler integrand. Uh, there are some advantages of dealing with this integrand, uh, such as uh, the fact that it's a rational function that contains only simple poles. And it also treats, uh, almost treats in the same footing, uh, external and integration points. Uh, for instance, the integrand of the simplest correlators has a, a full permutation symmetry that mixes internal and, and, and integration points. Uh, these integrands, uh, just like in the free theory case, they admit a decomposition uh, in terms of the R charge. Uh, but now, instead of the numerical coefficients that we had in the free theory, uh, these get uh, replaced by these uh, functions of uh, the 4D uh, space-time distance. Uh, in principle, there should be infinite number of these uh, structures uh, when we consider a arbitrarily large uh, R charge. Uh, however, in, in the planar limit and a weak coupling at, at each loop order, there is just a finite basis of inequal inequivalent structures. And, and this number grows with the loop order. The reason why, why is that is thanks to some phenomenon that we call saturation that states that basically on the, on the planar limit, uh, a bridge like this one uh, becomes, becomes uncrossable when the number of propagators um, uh, becomes larger than the loop order. In, in terms of these structures, that translates into this statement that there is a saturation bound uh, above which we can add any number of propagators on that same bundle without changing the structure. Um, that implies that, uh, that after the saturation bound, there is an infinite tail of coefficients that are identical. So when you try to resum these integrands, uh, there is a similar effect as in the free theory case where you can uh, just uh, take out these identical coefficients and what you are left with is just a geometric series. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, of that, at one loop, um, the saturation implies that there is only a single structure, uh, which is equal to the, to the integrand of the, of the smallest operators. And it's just given by this product of, of uh, simple poles. Um, the generic uh, integrand for arbitrary R charge also contains the same structure dressed with these uh, uh, propagators. Uh, this can be taken out of the sum, and what remains um, can be recognized just as a geometric series. And again, just like in the free theory, we have a, uh, an emergent 10 dimensional structure for, for, um, for the integrand, for the one loop integrand. Uh, there is higher loop, higher loop data for these structures that we can use to, to try to find similar patterns. It, it's more complicated because saturation allows, a higher loops allows for more and more structures. But, uh, but nevertheless, we have found that there is a, a similar pattern with an emergent uh, 10, 10 dimensional uh, structure. So we, we conjecture that uh, at each loop order, all these reduced integrands form a geometric series that can be resumed into a function, which only depends on this 10 dimensional distance that combines uh, space time and R charge. Uh, from this uh, conjecture, it immediately follows that uh, uh, one way to construct the generating function is by simply uh, uplifting the, the integrand of the simplest correlators by trading their four-dimensional dependence to now become 10-dimensional. Uh, um, following that procedure, uh, we, we obtain results for the generating functions uh, for, for various loop orders. Here I present you up to three loops. And um, it, this generating function, uh, given, giving us the uplift of this uh, seat, uh, it um, inherits all of its nice properties, such as the, its full permutation symmetry. Uh, this is yet not the end of the story because this is just the integrand and we still have to integrate. And when we integrate, uh, we actually break this 10 dimensional symmetry be be because we treat the external and internal points in different footing. So for the external points, we consider the VPS condition that uh, uh, states the, the six dimensional vector is null. And for the integration points, we just turn off its six dimensional R charge part. And then we integrate over them, uh, also putting back the, the factor, uh, the SUSI factor we strip out at the beginning. Uh, in that, uh, after following that procedure, we obtain results like here. I present examples at up to two loops. Uh, there, 
we obtain the generating function of all four point correlators given uh, in terms of a basis of conformal integrals. In this case, a two loop, we just obtain the simple one loop and two loop ladder integrals. And interestingly, the coefficients of these uh, conformal integrals still carry this part of this 10 dimensional structure uh, now with this t defined as the, the propagator. Um, these coefficients carry all the information you need to extract any individual uh, four point function. And uh, when we expanded as in a geometric series, um, uh, we can reproduce the all, all the results uh, for these correlators given in this in this table. We have performed similar checks up to up to five loops, um, and then we have predictions at, at five loops. Uh, these predictions are again just in terms of well the coefficients that have ten-dimensional structure and the and the basis of conformal integrals. However, these conformal integrals are are not are hard to evaluate. So. Uh, so it's still not a final uh, analytic answer for, for the correlators. Uh, instead of trying to deal with all this uh, uh, family of four-point functions, we can um, go to a more tractable problem that considers a, a subsector of these uh, four-point functions that corresponds to the correlators with large R chart uh, that we call octagons. Um, just as a reference in this table, uh, the last line is uh, full saturation where you just get zeros. And these simplest correlators correspond to the, to the cases where you have some partial saturation and, and you get uh, various zeros, but still the, the, um, the correlators are non-trivial. Are non yeah. um, so let me uh, tell you about these uh, simplest correlators. Uh, these simplest correlators have a large R charge such that uh, we have uh, a frame of infinite R charge and these are uncrossable, so, so you cannot uh, draw any of these uh, type of graphs. And you have just a factorization between the inside and outside, the, the in, inside square and the outside square. Um, in terms of the integrand, they just receive uh, contributions for this, from these structures where you have uh, infinities for all corresponding to all these edges. And uh, if you go back to our generating function, uh, you can immediately recognize that the only way to produce these terms are uh, comes from the terms that contain poles, because these poles are the only ones that, uh, when expanded in a geometric series, can give you arbitrarily infinite R charge. So uh, there is a simple recipe to extract these uh, these terms, which would be cor uh, corresponding to taking taking the this tending a limit where you take all these. Uh, uh, terms going to going to zero. Uh, by doing that, uh, we can show that the tending limit uh, gives you all the simplest correlator at once. So here, uh, the simplest correlators are labeled by the finite number of propagators on the diagonals, and we we sum over all of them. That gives you the result of ten, the tending limit. And as I presented to you in the introduction, uh, uh, this is also equal to a massive amplitude, where now uh, we recognize uh, these six D distances uh, equal to to the masses of this of this amplitude. Um, we have checked this uh, at the level of the integrand, uh, but this, this amplitude, because it has uh, some masses, uh, it doesn't suffer from infrared uh, divergences. So, so this duality that holds at the level of the integrand also carries on at the integrated level. So we have the equality between two uh, infrared finite observables. Um, uh, we, we don't know how to compute this uh, scattering amplitudes uh, using integrability methods, but we know how to compute these simplest correlators. And uh, well, the, it, it goes as follows. So we um, decompose this uh, octagon in, in building blocks where these building blocks are uh, have a fixed number of finite propagators in the diagonal. So there are two series uh, accounting for this diagonal or, or the other one. And uh, each of these building blocks can be computed using um, the hexagonalization um, program of this uh, gentleman. Um, so we think of, the, of this uh, octagon as a piece of, of worksheet that we tessellate into two hexagons. And then we glue back the, the two hexagons by uh, summing over a complete basis of the states that live on this two-dimensional worksheet. That gives you a, an expression for the octagon as an infinite sum of uh, multiparticle states. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, this group of people uh, were able to resum that series. 
and uh, provide a more compact answer in terms of uh, determinant of an infinite matrix. Uh, this matrix has uh, a simple way to be described in just a couple of lines, uh, where the elements are given by an integral over Bessel functions and a kernel that contains all the information about the cross ratio. Uh, this provides a finite coupling expression for, for, uh, for our amplitude, um, uh, but we haven't been able to, to yet perform this resumation. Um, still, uh, the, this, um, uh, this form of the result allows us to study various uh, properties of this octagon amplitude. Uh, so let me uh, tell, you, tell you about them. Um, so it, our octagon satisfies uh, the Steinman condition that uh, amplitudes are supposed to satisfy. So basically, if you have this amplitude and perform uh, cuts on the S and T channel that overlap, uh, you should get zero. And that, uh, in the case of the octagon, uh, translates as uh, a, dub a vanishing double discontinuity. Uh, we can also perform the weak coupling expansion, and that gives us uh, an arbitrary loop order, a result in terms of some of the determinants of well-known uh, conformal uh, ladder integrals. And, and interestingly, uh, we can also compute uh, the strong coupling limit uh, and show that uh, the result exponentiates and in the exponent, we identify we identify it as the area of a minimal surface in ABS. Uh, so here, this would be a representation of the of the octagon as the uh, as the four point function of large uh, R charge operators. Uh, and you have this minimal surface that ends on this uh, on these geodesics. Uh, we can ask if uh, by taking the Fordinal limit, which in terms of the amplitude uh, corresponds to the massless limit. Uh, we can ask whether uh, this uh, minimal surface corresponds to, a, to a, um, a regularization of the minimal surface found by um, found found for for the for the forecast uh, null Wilson loop. Uh, it, that seems to be the case, but in actually in detail uh, they don't have the same exponents. And there is a way to understand that uh, just uh, well at finite coupling. Uh, corresponding to, to the fact that we identify our uh, amplitude to be a special limit of a more generic uh, Coulomb branch amplitude. Uh, a more generic Coulomb branch amplitude uh, has two, two types of uh, masses particles uh, in the planar limit. Um, it, you have the external particles, uh, external massive particles, but also you have a, a loop uh, of um, uh, uh, yeah, this, this uh, loop in the perimeter is also um, controlled by a massive uh, by massive fields. Um, starting with this uh, type of uh, Coulomb branch amplitude, it was possible to find our, our uh, regularized version of the four gluon massless amplitude uh, by taking first the limit where the external particles uh, become massless, and then finally uh, when the internal loop uh, becomes massless. So this gives you a um, a Coulomb uh, branch uh, regularized version of the BDS on such. Um, on the other hand, our, um, our amplitude uh, corresponds to, to taking the limit in, in a di different order. Uh, the result also exponentiates. It's also controlled by a double logarithmic function, but the, but the coefficient is, uh, is different. Uh, recently, it, it, it has been, al although these two guys are, are different, it has been shown that they belong to the, to, a, to the same family of functions. They can both uh, be derived from a deformed version of the BES equation, the BES equation, the celebrated um, uh, integrability equation that computes the cast anomalous dimension. Uh, now, with a deformation um, for different values of, the, of um, the, the deformation parameter, you can obtain either uh, the cast anomalous dimension or, or our new um, uh, gamma octagon. Um, there is not, there isn't yet uh, an explanation of what is the physical interpretation of this deformation. Uh, but in light of our results, uh, we believe that uh, uh, this uh, parameter should be associated to this um, uh, difference on, on the order of limits. So possibly related to some uh, ratio of masses in the, in the Coulomb branch. Uh, yes, let me, let me finish with a summary. Uh, I, I have shown you that um, the generating function of all four point functions of protected operators have an emergent 10 dimensional structure. And further, when you take the 10 in a limit, we make connection with a massive amplitude in the Coulomb branch, which can be computed uh, using integrability.
Uh, then there are further questions that we would like to explore in the future. Um, uh, yes, so let me finish here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, any questions to Frank? Carlos? Uh, hey, Frank. Very nice talk. Uh, just a simple question. Can you explain a little bit more or expand a little the uh, uh, interpretation of alpha as some ratio of masses in the Coulomb branch amplitude? Um, well, um, actually, I don't have much more uh, to say about it, uh, just that. Um, so I don't have a, a prediction for what exactly alpha should be. Uh, I, I just, uh, as I was explaining, I just know that uh, uh, different values of alpha control uh, different limits of this generic Coulomb branch amplitude. So a, a further analysis of of this um, of this generic amplitude um, would allow would allow us to identify what exactly this uh, parameter alpha uh, is. But uh, we haven't performed that. Nathan? That was a nice talk. There's a paper about 10 years ago about writing the propagator uh, for scalar superfields in terms of you know this 10-dimensional language, which looks almost identical to your free propagators. Um, do you know the relation between them? Is it the same? So they did it in superspace, but if you just take the bosonic part, I think it's just what, exactly what you have for the free propagator. Uh, well, I'm not familiar with that result. Um, you're uh, making an analogy with uh, uh, this type of propagator. Just the first part of your the first part of your talk, where you wrote down the free propagators. I think even earlier. Yeah, that that's construction here. So just the first the first line. So that, that you can combine these y's and x's. So you get what you call emergent ten D structure. So it just comes from the conformal invariant. If you take, if you take two of these operators, then it's just from the conformal symmetry. You can take the large radius limit, and then it looks like ten dimensions. Um, yeah. So maybe you can give me the reference. Okay. Yeah. So it's called covariant propagator in ADS five times S five superspace. So if you just take the bosonic part of it, so they did the full. You just did the the lowest component of the superfield. They did the whole superfield. Maybe I can briefly comment on this because that paper also showed up in our uh, supergravity story. So, so it's true that the, the ADS5 cross S5 propagator you can rewrite in this 10D conformal form by making conformal transformation. Using that ADS5 cross S5, it comes from a flat to, to 10D flat space. Uh, this story is a bit different here because we're not at strong TF coupling, we're at the limit of weak TF coupling, where the bulk interpretation is far less clear. I understand. I'm just saying these superfields, these things you called OK. Yes. That's just dual to the to the ten dimensional to the superfields. So if you just look at the superfields in harmonic superspace, that's just the lowest component to the superfield. So so you wrote just the x and y dependence, but you can actually expand this to all the theta dependence. So that's that's what they yes. do. Yes. Yes. Do you think that could be done for uh, maybe let's attract the discussion? Other people have questions. Yeah, thanks. Ethan? Uh, hi, uh, Frank, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I just have a question about this octagon as strong coupling. So you said that uh, the as strong coupling, the exponent of the oct octagon uh, has some relation to the area of the wall sheet. Um, can you say anything about the string theory side of the story? Is uh, this something you have attempted to make more precise? Uh, the result we have only come from integrability. Uh, we don't have the counterpart on, on the string theory side. So even for some symmetric uh, configuration of the, you know, the boundary insertions, you cannot directly compare the area of the worksheet to this expression? Uh, yeah, we, we haven't performed that computation. On the I see. Uh, just, just want to make sure. So this, uh, this particular configuration on the worksheet does not preserve any supersymmetry? Uh, I believe in in principle, uh, no, because 
Oh, actually, I, I'm not. A, I'm, I don't know if it does not. Well, for example, if the insertions are correspond to the ground states, or correspond to the PVS operators. Uh, so, so one one realization of these uh, polarizations for these large R charge operators um, corresponds to to making a specific choice of um, of polarizations. Yes. And uh, well, because it it doesn't look very symmetric, it it, it seems like uh, you, you don't preserve much symmetry, but. Uh, um, yeah, but but I, I I'm I'm not aware actually if, uh, if there is some. Um, I see. So you don't expect there to be some kind of integral of this equation that will govern this minimal surface, or just something that you have not tried. I haven't explored the the, the strong coupling size from the from the string size. No, I, I mean I, I don't I cannot report uh, anything on. Okay. That. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yoshi. Yeah, so, so I don't work in this area, so my, I'm afraid my question might be totally off, but uh, I wonder whether there is something like a Merlin transform, which takes into account R charges. Uh, it seems like uh, the 10 dimensional symmetry naively look like uh, uh, a probing local structure with S5 cross S5. And uh, so 10 dimensional version of Merlin transform or something like that might be insightful. So I, I wonder whether anything known about this kind of ideas uh so in, in this work we haven't done that but i believe maybe simon in the supergravity side has worked with this melin, melin transform i don't know if Simon has something to say i think it may have been used at strong coupling in a recent paper by uh, uh Slop and collaborators uh it, you can use it when you have an object that is precisely uh that satisfies a 10 dimensional conformal symmetry here we should be clear that the uh, this uh, correlation function here does not satisfy it. It's integral satisfy it, but once you integrate, uh, it does not. We we use the we use the symmetry of the integral as an intermediate step to justify this tendinal limit. But uh, our final the correlation function that we're talking about does not enjoy the ten-dimensional conformal symmetry. Well, let, let me just mention that there is precisely the paper by Pedro Vieira and uh, Francesco April. Uh, which precisely like I did this mailing transformation, including uh, our symmetry direction. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, uh, Frank, if you start deforming uh, N equals four young mills, uh, like uh, beta deform, gamma deform, uh, would you see, say for beta def deformed version, would you see some uh, reduced symmetry like less dimensional but more than four dimensional and uh, if so if you go to the fishnet limit would you observe something like this symmetry higher dimensional symmetry of course not not 10 dimensional uh, yeah well the answer i i don't know but um it's true that at least in weak coupling uh, we coupling we see that on the structure of um uh, the expansion of the weak coupling, we actually contain uh, the fishnet type, the, the fishnet graphs that appear on the on, on your fishnet limit. Um, so uh, we, we can wonder if yeah there is a a limit that we can take that allows us to focus only on these fishnet graphs, um, and we we actually don't well, don't have a, a way to do it yet. Um, but yeah, that that would be interesting interesting to explore. I. Um, I, I would think that if you gradually uh, uh, destroy the um, the symmetry group by deformations, uh, it will be less and less of this symmetry, but still there will be some higher dimensional symmetry, yes? Yeah, it, well, uh, we, well, to begin with, we don't know why there is this uh, 10 dimensional symmetry at the level of the integrand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but uh, at least uh, when we uh, consider the correlator of these uh, master operators, uh, we know that we have a chance of maybe um, having some emergent uh, higher dimensional structure given that uh, these extra R charge uh, are supposed to, um, um, uh, well, account for the kinematics on the, 
on the internal manifold. So, uh, so in the beta deformation, probably there should be a similar effect. Um, the, but I cannot guarantee, well, even for this theory, I cannot guarantee, we, 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 I don't have an argument to tell you why the, the symmetry uh, appears. Uh, at the moment, it's just an observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, Juan is asking a question in, in the chat, which would be interesting for me as well, maybe for other people. Um, please, Leonardo. Yes, we do not understand the symmetry at any deep level. It's broken at, at finite coupling. It's there, a strong coupling, and a weak coupling. It is somehow related to the fact that the, the bulk background is conformally flat, but making that precise would be nice. So the similar symmetry has been observed, at least a strong coupling in ADS3 times S3, but it's definitely absent in M-theory background, such as ADS7 times S4 or ADS4 times S7, which, um, which are not conformally flat. So I think it's, it's an excellent open problem to explain at least a strong coupling more conceptually where this comes from. And it, it clearly has to be related with the fact that the bulk is conformally flat. Uh, okay, it seems that there are no more questions. So let's, uh, yeah. There, I guess there is this question of how does the information about the polarizations of the particles in the amplitude that appear in the correlation side, are they stripped out as in the massless case? Um, yeah, well, the short answer is yes, they, they are stripped out. Um, but, but yeah, we, we, we haven't worked out the math uh, concretely. Okay. So let's thank Frank again. And, uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you. So people can stay online if they want for a little more. Yeah, maybe Nathan, I will have a question for you. But one thing which is very unclear to us is uh, how to take these operators into the bulk. So, so we define them. Uh, it was, well, in order to define local operators on the boundary, we have to take y square equals zero. So the y is a is a point that describe yep. uh, from the S five part. Yeah, but uh, this this clearly like goes against the spirit of a ten-dimensional object. <laughs> yes. So, but if you relax y square equals zero, then you really have to talk about an object in the ball. So I don't know if 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 you have any. I I know that that's a sense. problem. Yeah, I have had I have struggled with the same thing. So so the paper I mentioned from Siegel was in the bulk. So he was working with chiral superfield. So their y squared is not zero. But I. I agree with you that um, it's, it's something that is not yet understood. Yeah, from, from, it's very weird because on, on the amplitude side of this duality, there's absolutely no reason to take y squared equals zero. The mm -hmm. y's are just x expectation values and it just, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Really. So the reason why I have struggled with it is because the superspace is very different if you go to y squared equals zero than if you don't. So. Do you have this 10D symmetry for five points at three level? Uh, at three, okay. <laughs> uh, at, at three level, at the, for the free theory, uh, yes, I think there is a 10 dimensional structure for all correlators. Mm. And what about loop level? Uh, that I don't know. Um, well, you know, for, for five points, uh, there is the one loop, uh, only, only the one loop is known, right? And there are no two loop uh, uh, results, except for uh, Basco's result of the decal. Because there uh, you don't have the obvious thing also to strip out, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Technically speaking, uh, there is this issue of uh, defining a, a reducing <laughs> the ground with nice properties. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I haven't explored much this one loop data, uh, but still maybe one loop data may not be enough. I think, uh, because of these technical difficulties of uh, uh, what you strip out, uh, maybe the symmetry is there, but it, you have to be more inventive to, 
um, to, to identify it. Uh, but, but for the free theory, I think uh, there is a 10 dimensional structure for all correlators. And what's the status of the strong coupling uh, symmetry for more than four points? By the way, Leonardo, do you still have a question? If so, I don't want to. I think Leonardo probably just forgot his hand up. No, no, no. I, I'm here. You left your hand up. Do you? Oh, I'm to... sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry. So the, yeah, my question was, uh, I don't know if uh, if Bashko is around or if Simon has a comment. Someone has a comment about uh, higher than four points. And is this symmetry there at strong coupling for five points? Uh, what was the question, Pedro? My question was, uh, so Simon had found this, observed this 10 dimensional symmetry at strong coupling, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Question was whether we see it for five points. If I understand correctly, it was seen for four points, right? At strong coupling before. Yes. Yeah, only, I'm only aware of one paper at strong coupling about five points. I would coupling there maybe more. Yeah, yeah, strong coupling, there's no data. Well, there's only uh, 20 prime. The 20 prime function. paper, yes. Okay. But can you, can you do a few Kaluza Klein modes, Vasco, and do some checks at the some percent? Isn't there something well, that? No, we can do, yeah. We are working on it. I think one issue was, a, was there was never any real prediction because there's no unique supersymmetry environment at five points. So you really have to uh, to test any prediction. You first have to figure out how to supersymmetrize the, uh, the 20 prime. Was that, is that a real issue or is that? I think, I think for, for five points, there is classification of these invariants. As you said, there's not one, there is few. But the more or less, uh, okay, we know how those invariant looks like, but uh, this is a mess, right? And the fact that there is a few of them, uh, basically you're using this predict predictive power, once you have some of the invariants, you have to control all the coefficients simultaneously. Hmm. So I'm going to oh, turn oh, off oh. the live stream, I guess. I don't know.